Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend. Let us head fanfics. Back with amazing fanfiction. This is the series of What if Deku had a supreme quirk? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Hyudai Garaki also known as Darama Yujiko was looking through the results of Izuku Midori a little kid with green hair who came just yesterday with his mother. The fact that he still needed to keep his cover as one of the highest ranking members of the League of Villains infuriated him to no end. Luckily he was a patient man. He always was. His quirk allowed him to be one. It had been many years since he stopped counting his birthdays. So he could handle a few more years as a pediatrician and the board chairman of Jaku Hospital until All for One took care of All Might and he would have all the resources he could even imagine to continue his research, just as he was promised. Today was a long day. He had at least 50 patients come visit him and an extreme amount of paperwork to take care of so it came as no surprise that it took him so long to take a look at the test results of the young green-haired kid. To say that they were interesting would be a massive understatement. His x-rays showed that his pinky toe had only a single joint. Yet the boy hasn't shown any signs of his quirk yet, so he did what any other doctor would, took some blood samples and sent them on their way. This is where it started getting weird. The lab did two DNA tests. And they were both completely different. Hudai called to the lab and forced them to do another one and again it came slightly different. So he went to the lab himself and did the tests twice on a single sample, but again they were different. Hudai couldn't believe his eyes. He has never seen anything like this before. Not even the most extreme gene therapy could cause something like this. This had to be the work of the boy's quirk. But that still didn't answer the most important question. What was this quirk's function? The doctor did every possible test he could think of, but the sample did not react in any interesting or unusual way. He decided to give up and put the blood sample back into the tray. What he didn't realize was that the test tube which held the blood sample got slick from the sweat on his hand and just as he was about to put on the table it slipped between his fingers and shattered on the ground of the lap. Hudai cursed under his breath and reached his hand to pick up the ruined vial, when suddenly he was hit by something what felt like static electricity. It was a feeling similar to one that someone gets when touching a doorknob after walking on carpet and socks. He recoiled his hand on instinct and wondered if this was the quirk purpose, to generate electricity from changes within genetic material. He picked up a dropper and took in a bit of Izuka's blood and once again repeated the test and he was once again baffled when the DNA changed even more drastically. The doctor then had the idea to compare the newest sample to his own DNA test result from a few years back. He was shocked to see how similar those two looked in just a few seconds. Hudai spent the rest of the night making calculation after calculation and computer simulation after simulation until he found out the truth. Izuku Midoriya Quirk Gene Manipulation Izuka's genome constantly transforms in order to enable his body to use quirks of other people he touches. Unfortunately this process takes about four years to finish since he touches the quirk user. The changes are however permanent. The doctor was immediately reminded of all for one for his similar quirk. But there was also a mayor difference, excluding the substantial period Izuku needed for his quirk to work. The genes of the copied person were not harmed allowing the potential victim the use of their quirk after the transformation. He couldn't even imagine the possibilities of what could happen if all for one took this quirk from the small child. There wouldn't be anyone strong enough to ever threaten him again if both quirks combine. They could create an entire army of extremely powerful villains. There was absolutely no way the League of Villains could pass the opportunity such as this one. Two days later, Izuku finally fell into a deep sleep from the exhaustion caused by his crying. His mother was sitting next to his bed watching him with sadness clearly visible on her face. I am so sorry Izuku. Those words were still resonating within her head. She felt like crying again, but she held back her tears in fear of waking Izuku up again. She felt so defeated, because she knew that her son just lived through the worst day of his life and there was absolutely nothing she could do to help him. She thought about fate and how cruel it could be to take the chance of being a hero from someone as pure-hearted and determined as her son. She slowly brushed his head with her fingers to ease his sleep while he lied there still clutching his favorite All Might action figure tightly in his arms taking in slow deep breaths. After about 20 minutes and Ko felt as her eyes began to close. So she leaned in and gave him a soft kiss on the cheek before leaving her son's bedroom. She fell asleep very quickly. But at that time it didn't occur to her that tiredness and emotional exhaustion weren't the only things which affected her, but also a tasteless and scentless gas slowly filling the house. After five more minutes two masked men entered the house quietly, snuck into Izuka's room picked him up and carried him to the black SUV outside, before driving swiftly away. Two hours later, Izuku woke up with a start. He immediately started frantically looking around himself confused by his surroundings. 
The room he was in could be best described as a cell with both the floor and the walls made of steel and the ceiling made of cement. There are no windows just a metal door on the other side of the room across from his bed which looked like it was stolen straight from a hospital there was also a toilet in the corner of the room. And mom, he said as his hands started shaking, nearly dropping his all might action figure. Just as the word left his mouth a blue light on one of the walls, which he never even noticed, turned red suddenly. Looks like the little rat's awake, you should go do something about that, said one voice from the other room. Why the hell should it be me? I had to carry him there. It's your turn. Ugh, fine. Izuku heard heavy steps slowly coming closer to the door and he was frozen with fear. They will come in here and hurt me. The steps got closer. What should I do? What would Kakan do? The steps got even closer. Izuku looked at his hero in his arms. What would All Might do? The steps stopped on the other side of door. He wouldn't give up. He never gives up. He always fights. He quickly thought about how to defend himself when he noticed toilet tank and ran with his All Might figure to it. He gently but quickly sat his hero on the toilet before lifting the cover with all his strength and nearly falling over from the heavy weight of it. But his legs refused to give up and he braced the weight with his tiny shoulder. Damn it. Where is that goddamn key card? You are holding it in our left hand, idiot. Oh right. Izuku closed his eyes and prepared for the worst. He waited for the sound of the door opening, but it never came. Instead there was a different sound. One he knew very well. Smash. The entire building shook as if it was hit by earthquake. Izuku acted on instinct, let go of toilet tank cover, dove under the hospital bed and covered his head with his tiny hands, shut his eyes, just like his mother taught him. He waited there for the room around him to collapse but that never happened, instead there came a deep voice. Well let's see what's behind door number 70. The room shook once again as the large metal doors were torn clean off by a massive figure clad in in blue, red, white and yellow spandex. All Might peered into the cell and saw a small child covering in fear under a bed as well as a miniature of himself sitting on the toilet in the corner. Wait, what's that about? The uh, All Might. He was pulled from his confusion when he heard the shaky voice and hurried closer before leaning under the bed to only to see two green orbs filled to the brim with tears staring straight back at him. He felt his heart swell up with anger as he saw the kid. Yet he didn't let the negative emotion ruin his wide brave smile. So you are kidnapping children now, all for one. Ha <laughs> ha. Have no fear, because I am here. He said cheerfully as he flexed his muscles on one of his arms, while using the other to lift up the bed. The small green-haired child just continued to stare at him with both his eyes and his mouth wide open. Huh, him kid are you alright? He said as he began waving his hand in front of the kid's face to snap him out of his shock. Kid, can you hear? HMPH he was stopped as the green-haired boy suddenly jumped and grabbed him around the neck in a crushing hug, or at least what he assumed was the child's version of a crushing hug. So cute. Toshinori slowly and carefully closed his own giant arms around the little boy ignoring the light tingle of electricity he felt as he did so. Yeah this feeling never got old no matter how many times he lived through it. The feeling of pure adoration, respect and maybe even some kind of love he felt when helping people in dangerous situations. It was the one thing that kept him going even his master's death. It gave him courage, kept him determined, kept him all might. Of course, young man, but first we have to get you out of here. The giant of a man slowly stood up while keeping one of his massive hands on Izuku's back to keep him from falling. He then walked to the toilet and pointed with his free hand at the toy still sitting on the toilet bowl. Is this yours? Izuku followed Toshinori's gaze and turned bright red when he realized that he left the little hero in such an embarrassing position. Sorry all might. The big hero just gave him one of his signature laughs before grabbing the toy with his free hand and heading out of the cell and into mostly empty dimly lit hallways of all for one's complex hideout. Meanwhile Gran Torino was flying from wall to wall searching for his former student, followed closely by Recovery Girl and Sir Nida. Where did that big oaf run off to? Said Recovery Girl as she was barely able to keep up with the two heroes, while both of them were surprised that she was so vital even in her old age. She was slowly getting more and more angry. First they show up at her office unannounced in the middle of the night and start banging on her door, waking all of her patients in the process, only to tell her that Toshinari has gone after all for one all by himself and that if they didn't find him, he would get injured so badly that he wouldn't be able to continue working as a pro. We have to keep looking. If what I saw becomes true, he will surely need our help. Night I responded. His grim vision was still fresh on his mind. He just couldn't get the image of All Might lying in the pool of his own blood from his head. Yeah, listen to the fanboy, Chio. All for one is more than prepared for him, said Gran Torino as he knocked out two small-time villains the moment they came into the hallway. Toshinori, please don't do anything stupid. One minute and fourteen seconds later. Where is that exit? 
I am sure it was this way. I have to get that kid to safety before I run into someone too dangerous. Now All Might was by no means coward, but fighting while holding a kid that couldn't be more than five years old in one hand and the kid's toy in the other one seemed like something so dangerous and stupid he cringed at what his teacher would do to him before he even reached the afterlife. Did you get lost All Might? Oh crap. Before he even had time to respond a dozen long spears made of pure energy were sent flying straight at him. Thanks to quick thinking he was able to dodge them save for the All Might doll which got impaled through the head and stuck to the nearby wall. Oh, would you look at that. You broke the toy of a child that you are trying to protect. Maybe you should save yourself the trouble and die already. All for one said as he fired a brand new set of spears straight at All Might. Toshinori didn't waste any time as he shot a Texas smash with his free hand at Shigaraki and jumped backwards before ducking behind the corner with energy spears flying straight past him. That new quirk of his will be hard to deal with I need to close the distance, but first, okay kid time to get off. He said as he leaned over and tried to let go of the kid that was still hugging him, but the little boy didn't even budge. Come on kid, I can't fight with you hanging around. That's when he noticed that the boy was shivering like crazy, blinking rapidly and burning up. A seizure. All Might then forcefully tried to remove the boy in order to lay him down, but simply couldn't pry the child off. What are you? A spider monkey. Just then he heard a step from behind and felt an extreme pain shoot up his left arm. He grunted and found one of All for One's spears sticking out of his left elbow. All Might turned around and delivered a punch with his right fist to Shigaraki's chest, which sent the white-haired man flying straight through the wall. For a second Toshinori thought about going after him but ultimately decided against it. The child needed some medical care and that had much bigger priority than revenge. And so the symbol of peace and justice did something he has never done before. He retreated after smashing a hole in the ceiling and jumping through it to the higher floor of the basement. It didn't take more than just 10 seconds of running. Until a sole of a white shoe made contact with his face Grand Torino looked absolutely furious. So scary. What the hell were you thinking you big newbie? You could have been killed. One for all would be lost forever and... Is that a child? Recovery girl interrupted the old hero veteran and rushed over to All Might. I found him in a room downstairs. I think he's having a seizure also he is sort of strangling me. Toshinori said and began to wheeze a bit from the boy's strong grip. Recovery girl gave All Might a kiss on his arm and then one to the back of Izuku's head and quickly recoiled from the feeling of static electricity rushing to her lips. Izuku immediately let go of Toshinori and fell into the awaiting arms of Sir Nidai only for him to also feel a jolt travel up his right arm. Yet he chose to ignore it. I'm going back, said All Might suddenly to the surprise of everyone present. Please All Might listen. This is not a fight you can win on your own. You will die if you fight him today. Yelled Nightai. I cannot allow him to escape again. Not after what he did to Nana. Toshinori responded determined without any hint of fear in his voice. The group was taken over by silence. They stood there looking at each other for what felt like eternity. Until finally Grand Torino sighed and spoke up. He's right. You cannot do this on your own. I will go with you. Can't you see that this is maddening? But before he could finish his sentence, Sir Nidai was interrupted by a loud rumble which sent the entire building shaking. He lost his balance and let go of Izuku who was still unconscious just as the entire floor raptured beneath swallowing them all into complete darkness. When Nidai came back to consciousness he slowly opened his yellow eyes hidden beneath a pair of broken glasses. There were a few fires around him on the ground illuminating the entire cavern-like area they were in. His head was throbbing painfully and when he reached for it he found drops of blood on his fingers which quickly brought him from his delirious state. The hero in grey business suit slowly and painfully got back on his feet and looked himself to see Gran Torino lying a few feet from him with some debris on his back. Night I walked over to him and began digging him out with his bare hands which by the end were also bloody and shaking from exhaustion. But the little old man was still breathing and had a strong heartbeat. He looked around for recovery girl but couldn't find her anywhere. The wall on the other side of the room suddenly shattered as All Might's bloodied and battered body was thrown into a nearby pile of rubble. But he got up quickly and ran back through the hole that his body just created. In that room he saw Shigaraki getting closer to the green-haired boy with his hand raised and little red flames dancing on his palm. The white-haired man was just dead set on taking the little boy's quirk. Oh no you don't. Toshinori yelled with fury and readied another smash only for the villain to swiftly disappear in what could only be described as black liquid just before the punch could make an impact. All Might was caught off guard when All for One reappeared a moment later with what could only be described as extremely long sharp bones protruding from where his right arm used to be. All Might failed to react in time as the bones buried deep in his left side only to be then swiftly pulled back leaving him with a big bloody empty hole where his guts used to be. Toshinori promptly fell on the ground clutching his side in absolute agony. You heroes are all the same. Idiotic dreamers with way too much power in their disposal. But with this child's quirk I will change that and when I finish extracting what I need from him, 
I will tear him apart to bloody pieces in front of your very eyes just to show you how little of a value one's life has in this world. All for one yelled as he made his way to Izuku. Izuku's eyes were still closed when he heard slow steps approaching. He wasn't sure why but he was filled with immeasurable dread. Then the memories came rushing back to him. He remembered waking up in the small cell, scared and alone. He remembered the horror he felt when those two men slowly got closer to the door. But he also remembered the relief and amazement he felt when he saw All Might's big smile. The steps stopped. All Might. He quickly opened his eyes only to see a white-haired man with his hand, which glowed with dark red fire, reaching for his forehead. Go away. He weakly shouted as he grabbed the man's wrist once again shutting his own eyes. Then came a flash of green light and probably the most disgusting sound Izuku has ever heard in his entire life. It was something between a squelch and a crack with equally disgusting noise of something wet and soft falling on the ground, which followed soon after. He opened his eyes only to see the man's hand reduced to a bloody mess, which also covered the fingers on Izuku's own hand. Not yet. It's not your time yet. There is still more you need to do. Don't give up. You can't give up now. Breathe, move, get up, fight, protect him, be a hero. All Might slowly got back up on his knees then on his feet ignoring the agonizing pain which came with his every movement. All for one's face twisted in both pain and anger as he raised his arm made of sharp bones ready to bring it down on the little boy before him. Yet he was interrupted by a furious roar coming from behind. Just as he turned around, he witnessed All Might charging at him at full speed roaring with some of his bloody entrails left behind him. It was an image he would always remember as the last one he ever saw with his own eyes. United States of Smash. Toshinori yelled with anger as his fist made contact with Shigaraki's skull, destroying his face and the bones beneath it, driving his head into the ground. After a few shallow breaths All Might could feel his energy rapidly running out until he lost his balance and fell on his back right next to his arch nemesis. He didn't even notice it when All for One's body became enveloped in black mist and disappeared. Izuku swiftly stood up and rushed over to All Might lying in a pool of his own blood. I did this. This is all my fault. He fell onto his knees and wrapped his tiny arms around Tashinori's massive bicep. I am so sorry, All Might. Please get up. The big hero's breathing stopped. No, no, no. Please All Might, you can't die here. Izuku said as tears once again filled his eyes. Tashinori's heart stopped beating. P please. As someone dot 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 anyone dot 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 help dot 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 him dot 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 he's dying. Izuku said weakly and began to sob as he buried his head into his hero's shoulder. Oh my goodness, what happened to him? Yelled recovery girl as she ran over to where she heard the small boy crying his eyes out. P please dot 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 help dot 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 said Izuku covered from head to toe in his hero's blood in between his sobs. She gently picked him up and sat him down a few feet away to get a closer look at Toshinori's condition. Once she saw the huge hole in All Might's belly and sternum, she immediately knew that there was absolutely nothing that could be done. Even if she used her quirk it would only make his death faster. At that moment Recovery Girl felt completely useless. She stood up and decided to go check on the boy. For all she knew some of that blood on him could have been his own and she wasn't going to lose two people due to her incompetence. But then it she saw it. Movement. The wound began to slowly close itself. She was completely flabbergasted to see as the wound got smaller and smaller and fresh pink skin began to appear on the uncovered flesh leaving a huge scar. She turned her attention back on the boy who was still crying just next to her. What did you do? Izuku Midoriya. Quirk. Gene manipulation plus ultra. When Izuku's own quirk combined with one for all it further strengthened his own ability. Izuku's genome can now instantly transform which allows him to use the quirk of anyone he touches in just a few seconds. Furthermore newly gained quirk is also further enhanced by one for all bringing it past its natural limits. Izuku was just quietly sitting on a front seat of a police car. Officers were everywhere searching the entire area around Shigaraki's hideout and arresting minor villains with help of heroes that had arrived with them. The small green-haired boy caught a glimpse of paramedics loading All Might into an ambulance but quickly averted his eyes in shame before also being driven to the hospital. After being led to a shower by few kind nurses and getting clean clothes that someone donated to the hospital, he was feeling much better, even though he couldn't get the image of his hero bloody and hurt from his head. A nice tall pediatrician checked his body and concluded that the boy was completely fine save for a few scratches, which he promptly treated. It's all my fault. He looked at the hands resting in his lap as he sat. They were still trembling and he couldn't stop them no matter what he did. He could still feel the blood on his hands. How could I hurt someone like that? Even though he was probably a villain no one deserves to. I see you you. The small boy was quickly enveloped in a tight hug by his mother. Oh my god baby, are you okay? No one hurt you, did they? She asked in horror as Izuku started sobbing in her embrace. You must be the boy's mother. I am Detective Tsukachi. We talked over the phone, said a smiling young tall man wearing a beige trench coat and a hat as he approached them calmly. Yes, thank you so much for finding my son. 
I couldn't live with myself if anything were to happen to him. And Ko said with tears in corners of her green eyes, You don't need to worry. The doctor has already informed me that your son is perfectly healthy. Oh thank God. So you must be the Izuku that I've heard so much about. The young detective said as he crouched in front of the little boy while still smiling. The child didn't react in any way, just stared blankly at the man before him. Is All Might going to be okay? Izuku asked sadly, to which the man's smile broadened. Well, he regained consciousness half an hour ago and has been asking everyone the same thing. Only about you and since now I have some good news for him, why don't you come with me so you can tell him yourself? Both Izuku and his mother looked shocked. He isn't mad at me. The young boy asked shyly while clutching the fabric of his new shorts which were two sizes too big. The detective's face showed a look of surprise for a minute, before he leaned in a bit closer to Izuku making the boy a bit uncomfortable. Mad, it's possible you might have saved his life with your quirk. I saved all might. Wait I have a quirk. E but I don't have a quirk. The detective looked a little taken aback by Izuku's answer. It was pretty common for someone to have their quirk wrongly diagnosed or misunderstood. But it has been several since he has last heard about someone being wrongly diagnosed as quirkless. Also, why would all for one kidnap someone without a quirk he could steal? It simply didn't add up at all. Tell me Miss Midoriya, when did Izuku have his quirk examined? It was three days ago, but we've got his results just yesterday. Why do you ask? Inko asked troubled. The detective's smile quickly returned as he shook his head a bit. Oh, no real reason, I was just curious. Well then, Izuku, would you like to see All Might? Izuku quickly nodded his head as an innocent excited smile appeared on his face. Nayamasa quickly waved over a fellow officer with feline head, who was just walking through the hallway with a cup of coffee in his hand. Please take them to the VIP. The officer understood and led the small family to the nearest elevator, while Tsukachi pulled out his phone through which he quickly accessed the quirk registration database and downloaded file on Izuku Midori. When he read it and discovered that Izuku Midoriya was indeed documented as quirkless, so Tsukachi took a look at the person who filled the report and dialed the office. Hi, it's me. What information do you have about Dr. Darumi Yujiko? All Might's hospital room a minute later. Suo dot 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 am I fine? Tashinori asked while sitting on his hospital bed which was straining from his enormous weight. Recovery girl was walking from one end of the room to the other still looking at the images from his CT scan. I am not sure that fine best describes you state. Take a look at this, she said as she pushed two pictures into his hands. Here is your big intestine before the incident yesterday and here after the incident. I don't see the difference. All might began before being slapped upside the head with rolled up papers by the angry doctor. Off course you don't, you big oaf. Your appendix is back. Oh hey, you're right. But I had it removed when I was 12. Tashinori could still remember the horrible pain that he felt when his parents drove him to hospital that day. And do you remember that time, when you broke your rib during your combat training? Now it's like it never even happened. Recovery girl said as she showed him another black and white picture. But, what does this mean? I am not sure myself. The only thing I can tell you for certain is that your entire body shows the same improvements. You have a perfect cholesterol level and blood sugar. You have lost a few pounds. Your teeth are all healthy and without a single filling and you have the cleanest lungs and the healthiest liver that I have ever seen in someone of your age. I would even go as far as to bet my doctor's license that you are the healthiest person in this entire building including the newborns. The little energetic old lady took a deep breath as she finished talking. Guess that kid's quirk is pretty powerful said Tashinori as he began to scratch at his side. Doesn't that hurt at all? She asked looking worried. No it just started itching like crazy. Let me take a look. Recovery girl said as she hurried over to him as All Might lifted up his hospital gown a bit to allow her a better access to his tingly area. The youthful heroine took one look and took a step back in surprise. Even the scar is gone now. This was biologically impossible. The injury All Might suffered might cripple even most of the people who were born with super regeneration since most of them could never even hope to regrow more than a couple of fingers, much less important organs. Just as she was about to launch into an entirely new speech about why this should be completely impossible there was a knock on the door. You can come in, said Tashinori as he jumped from the bed, which creaked menacingly, back to his feet so fast he nearly slipped on the polished floor. The door opened and a green-haired child he saved before and a who he could only assume was the child's mother slowly and carefully walked in. Izuku gasped a little when he saw All Might standing in the room dressed in white hospital gown and light pink pants but tears quickly filled his eyes as he let go of his mother's hand and gave All Might's muscular leg a tight hug. Tashinori's heart fluttered a little as if it was failing to comprehend this much cuteness. Izuku, you can't do that to strangers. Inko said as she rushed over to her son with intention to pull him off the number one hero. But before she could do anything All Might stopped her. It's no big deal madam, I am used to it. He said with his ever-present smile. He carefully bent down and picked the child up. But quickly discovered tears in Izuku's eyes and fear swiftly overtook him. Crap, I hope I didn't hurt him. 
Hey um young man, what's wrong? He asked in worry, his eyes scanning the child for any injury he might have touched. I am so sorry. The boy forced out in between his sobs. Sorry, what could you possibly sorry for, young Midoriya? Tashinori asked as he softly placed the child back on the ground and took a knee before him. The emotion of pure excitement from the thought, All Might knows my name, was quickly smashed to the dirt by the wagon of guilt still parked in the forest of shame which was still growing inside of Izuku's head. It's my fault that you got injured. If those villains didn't take me, you wouldn't get hurt and... Toot toot, stop their little one. All Might interrupted suddenly as he gently pushed the boy's nose two times imitating a klaxon on a steering wheel. The effect was instant. Izuku was so taken back he stopped crying and started blushing a bit. Listen to me, young man. If it weren't for you, there is a good chance I wouldn't be here now talking to you. Believe it or not, today you and your quirk saved my life and if that is not something to be proud about, I don't know what is, said Toshinori as he carefully patted the child's head. Thank you All Might, whispered Izuku as a small innocent smile found its way back on his way. Now, I believe I owe you an autograph. The big man exclaimed as he grabbed a pen and a few pages of paper. To Izuku Midori, the boy who single-handedly saved my life and one of the greatest heroes of the future generation, signed All Might. Izuku looked shocked at his hero, with his mouth slightly gaping and his eyes filled with adoration. I can be a hero. He took a wobbly step forward and with his shaky tiny hands grasped the piece paper offered to him and gave All Might one big last hug. Inko gently took her son's hand into her own. She was so proud of her little boy. Just to be acknowledged by All Might was impressive on its own, but to save said hero was simply incredible. At that moment she swore to herself that she would do anything to help her son achieve his dream, whatever it was. Just as they were about to leave the room, Izuku stopped in his tracks and turned around. All Might, um, my friend Kachin has his birthday in two weeks, could you write another autograph for him? Smiling Toshinori didn't even respond, he just reached for his pen and paper again. Izuku couldn't sleep but really, could anyone blame him? After everything that happened yesterday, he was simply too excited to close his eyes for more than just a few seconds before quickly opening them again and gazing at every single one of the All Mights displayed in his room. The hospital decided to keep him under observation until the evening. While there, both him and his mother were visited by the nice detective who asked them to not talk about what happened in the early morning to anyone just yet, to make sure that the investigation goes smoothly. Izuku felt as if he just came back from a top-secret assignment which only added to his excitement. Dot 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 one of the greatest heroes of the future generation. Those words still resonated in his mind, filling him with energy and determination. If he believes in me, I can do it. But it will be super hard. At the hospital, are you sure about this Nidai? Tashinori asked with a bit of regret in his voice. Nidai has been his sidekick for many years so it came as a shock when he was handed a resignation letter with a new costume. The man in formal clothing pushed up his glasses with one of his bandaged hands before nodding his head firmly. I am sorry, All Might, but I just can't continue being your sidekick after what happened yesterday. Your poor judgment nearly cost us all our lives, he said sadly. Please understand it was a hot lead on the guy and he could have gotten away again if I. I know all that. I know how important that mission was for you. But on that day I saw you lying on the ground in the pool of your own blood and that's an image I just can't get out of my head. Night I all but shouted at his idol. Tashinori was shocked when he saw the younger man display so many emotions. But it's not your fault. I know, but I saw you lying there, dying, and I was unable to prevent it from happening. Night I locked eyes with the tall muscular man in the hospital gown with small tears threatening to fall from his eyes. He took a deep breath to compose himself. Even if that it never happens again I wouldn't be able to live through that feeling again. Not as a hero, not as your fan and definitely not as your friend. I am so sorry All Might, he said as he hung his head. Then the shorter man felt a weight on his shoulder. He looked up to see his hero standing closer to him holding his shoulder. I understand what you mean and I accept your resignation. All Might said reassuringly before offering Nidai his hand and a smile. After a quick hesitation he accepted his friend's hand and gave it a firm shake. It has been an honor working with you All Might. And it has also been a great honor working with you, Murai Sasaki. Tashinori responded before letting go. Nidai gave his favorite hero a small smile before turning around and leaving the hospital room. Tashinori sighed and took a seat on his bed putting the costume on the ground in front of himself. He looked at the red, blue, white and yellow spandex in silence thinking about what he had to go through to reach his current status. Now he probably lost one of his closest friends and there was absolutely nothing he could do to get him back. But it was all worth it, right? His thoughts were interrupted with a knock on the door. When they opened he was met by the friendly face of Naomasa Tsukachi. Good morning, Tashinori, said the detective as he took off his hat and took a seat in front of the large man. Oh hello Naomasa, any news? Of course, and all of them are bad said the man in trench coat which made All Might flinch a bit. For one, we searched all throughout the complex but didn't find Shigaraki's body anywhere. 
We also discovered that the boy you saved had his quirk examined two days just before he got kidnapped. I sent some officers to bring in the doctor who did the tests for questioning but his apartment was completely abandoned when they got there. This gives us two versions of the story. Either Dharma Yujiko has been kidnapped and replaced by an imposter or he was actively supporting All for One and went into hiding when he found out what happened yesterday. Which means that All for One is probably not only still alive but that he has someone who specialized on studying quirks his entire life and had access to the quirk registry. Toshinori frowned as he was dealt another supply of bad news by another of his few friends. I've already started preparations to add both Shigaraki and Dharma on the Interpol Most Wanted list. But it will take a few days for that to go through, said the detective regretfully. He knew just how much trouble these people could bring but there was nothing more. That could be done at the moment. What about the boy and his family? Asked All Might with a hint of worry in his voice. They should both be fine as long as this doesn't reach the public and I've sent two of my officers to watch their apartment building for a few days just to be sure. Responded Naamasa calmly which made All Might sigh in relief. After they discussed some minor details the detective left the hospital and Toshinori did the same but instead of using the main entrance he chose to jump off the roof into the night sky. The next day, Izuku was full of energy despite getting only a few hours of sleep during the night. He was happily jumping around the house dressed in his small All Might costume. At one point he even ran into the kitchen where his mother was cutting the vegetables for lunch while yelling ha ha ha, I am here for a free samp, which Inko quickly interrupted by showing a baby carrot into his open mouth with a smile. F-A-N-K-U-F-I-T-I-F-E-N. He quickly responded before running outside with a full mouth and a wide smile. He still couldn't believe that he finally had a quirk and a great one. What could be better than helping to save lives? Lunch came and went. Then came the moment for computer time. Izuku watched his favorite hero video. And then some recent hero footage only to see dot 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 his own face next to a headline. He quickly jumped off the chair ran to his mom and led her to the computer to show her with sparkles in his big green eyes. But the excitement that he expected to see on her mother's face never came. Her smile vanished and her eyes opened wide with shock and horror as she read the headline. Izuku Midoriya, the boy who saved the number one hero. Unbeknownst to them the number one hero was also reading the same tabloid article whilst frowning. Vultures, this is really bad. When the villains get a hold of this the boy is as good as dead. It had little to no information except for the people involved. But the real question was, how did the reporters even get their hands on this info and how the hell is it in the magazines already? All Might crushed the angering magazine into a tight ball and threw it into a blue trash can nearby before leaping back into the air again with a new destination in mind. Back in the apartment there was constant knocking on the door and ringing of the doorbell after multiple news vans and other vehicles with bright logos of news companies painted on them parked in front of the building. Inko wasn't very sure about what she should do. Is it okay to call the police? How did they even get our address? Then it all suddenly stopped and as the silence overtook the room she felt a small hand on her leg. Mom, mom, look, all might's outside. She followed her son to a window he was so furiously pointing at. The young woman looked outside and there he was. The number one hero was standing in the street as more and more reporters surrounded him and was he slowly moving away. Her phone rang out of nowhere and the picked it up. He hello, Miss Midoriya. This is Detective Tsukachi. We've met at the hospital. I need you to pack a bag for yourself and for your... Wait a minute. What do you mean pack a bag? We can't just... Please listen to me. I can't guarantee your safety if you stay where you are and I don't know how much time All Might can buy you. There are two officers in a gray car just down the road. Pack you bags and get into that car. They will take you to a safe destination. I promise it's only temporary. I I understand. She said a bit shaken by. What she heard but ended the call, grabbed a big suitcase and started hastily filling it up with Izuku's help. Outside, dot 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 and so honor is something everyone should strive to achieve, said smiling Toshinori as he took another step back and everyone moved with him. All might, that doesn't answer my question at all. Were you really saved by Izuku Midoriya yesterday? The reporter asked again with clear irritation in her voice. It was almost as if all the number one hero said was either complete nonsense or random catchphrases. Oh and have I ever told you about the time when I saved those seniors from that burning building? I always flamed to please. Ha ha ha. Everyone groaned audibly at the bad pun and completely missed the car behind them as it quickly drove off. Well that's my quay. You have all been great but heroing waits for no one. He said and quickly sprinted away in a blur leaving all of the reporters both angry and disappointed but when they resumed their tries to interview the small family they found their apartment empty. Fifteen minutes later, they drove them to the police station where Naamasa was already waiting in his office. Izuku was left in care of a few young policewomen, who were all resisting the urge to pinch his cheeks due to his cuteness while his mother spoke to the detective. After a few minutes of explaining that no one had any idea about the source of the information leak and that there was no way to tell how long this investigation could take he came with a proposition. 
The young detective pointed at a computer screen so after this article went viral, our witness protection program became pretty much useless in your case. Simply put, there isn't a place in this country where we could successfully hide you or your son. And Ko was so devastated and scared. For the second time in her life she was completely clueless about what she should do. Now her son was in serious danger and it was all her fault. If only she stopped those villains from kidnapping her little Izuku, if only she could have known. But thankfully there isn't another option available. Now this option would grant both you and your son a chance to live your lives in relative comfort and complete safety. But it would be pretty hard to get used to. I accept. She said as her hands began to shake a little but she was determined to go through anything at this point. Namasa smiled a bit and stood up from his chair and grabbed a folder on a nearby file cabinet. As you may know, the Hero Association launched a custom program for people just like you. The media call it the Move-In Protection Program, where a family in danger lives with a professional hero. Only a handful of families have gone into this program, but so far it's had a success rate of 100%. So, we would move in with a hero until the investigation gets concluded? That's right, the said hero has a perfect record and they will be compensated for any added expenses during your stay. Inko was surprised to say the least. Not only would they be kept safe by a pro but they wouldn't even have to be worried about paying the rent. I am and would it be okay if you told me which hero would be protecting us? She asked nervously not wanting to inconvenience the kind man standing in front of her. The detective's smile just grew wider as he gave handed her the folder. Inko audibly gasped when she saw the photo of the large blonde hero with a brave smile looking at her from the photo attached to the first page. So how can I help you, Tasha Nori? Asked Recovery Girl when she arrived to All Might's giant penthouse. Miss Shuzenji. I am so glad you are here, you see, some people will be moving in with me and I need someone to check if there are any healthcare hazards. He said with his usual ear-to-ear -ear smile as he came to meet the doctor dressed in his bright red t-shirt with just a hero in disguise, written on it with big bright yellow letters. Recovery girl frowned at him and almost decided to leave. She was worried that this urgent business meant that his condition has worsened. She sighed and furrowed her brow. Just dot 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 show me the kitchen. She said exasperatedly as she stepped inside just hoping it wouldn't take too much of her time. Right this way, young lady. He responded cheerily as she entered his apartment before discreetly picking up a clipboard and holding behind his back just from her sight. Ten minutes later outside. Officer, are you sure this is the right place? And Co asked nervously when the police car stopped in front of an entrance to a massive skyscraper. It's what the order said, ma'am. Do you want any help with your luggage? Asked the bearded policeman. Yes, that would be very nice of you. She told him with a slight smile to which the officer gently nodded, got out of the car and easily pulled two heavy stroller cases out of the car trunk, while Inko gently freed her son from his seatbelt and opened the door for him and for herself. There was no mistaking it, this building was luxurious. It was a kind of place where even if you were to rent the cheapest room for a week it would still cost you about as much as you make in a year. Izuku was still holding his mother's skirt as they walked to the elevator, after being told by a friendly receptionist that they should go to the second highest floor. Once in the moving metal box she noticed just how incredibly nervous her son was. The young boy stood there shivering, unblinking and sweating profusely. Izuku, are you feeling okay? She asked gently when she softly placed her hands on his shoulders and got down on his eye level. Her son stopped shaking and silently averted his eyes. Are you sure he won't be angry with us? He asked weakly in response while looking at the ground. His mother smiled reassuringly at him. Sweetie, I am sure it will be fine. Remember what the nice policeman said. All Might has volunteered himself. Her son gave her a small unsure smile in return just as the door opened and they got out of the elevator into a small hallway with only one door on the side across from them. Inko was reaching for the handle when the door opened on its own and a tiny old lady burst out nearly bumping into her. Oh you must be the boy's mother. She exclaimed as she looked up at her and then at the child standing beside her and then something in her clicked. Wait a moment. Come here Sonny. She said as she gently grasped Izuku's tiny hand and spun him around before standing back to back with the small boy and comparing their height. While the boy was so taken aback he didn't even try to question it. Just as she thought. The child was just half an inch shorter. Twenty minutes earlier. The old lady came into kitchen and immediately saw a foot-sized ketchup stain on the floor. It looked fresh and sticky. When she asked where he keeps his cleaning chemicals he pointed to the nearest set of drawers and when she opened one of them, but the bottle was just out of her reach. Same thing happened when she tried to return a knife. She found just randomly sitting on a chair to its former place, dot 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 in the detergent. And each time something like that happened she caught Tashinori moving from the corner of her eye very quickly. But before she could take a good look he was already standing perfectly still with his dumb smile. Was he testing? A small pulsating vein suddenly appeared on Chiyo's forehead and started angrily pulsating as she turned around and walked with quick steps filled with determination back into the penthouse coming face to face with the number one hero. Oh sorry, all might. It seems that I forgot my. 
Oh my god there is huge spider on your shoulder. Where? He exclaimed and quickly turned around exposing the hidden item, which she snatched from him at blinding speed. Tashinori just stared at her with a pale face as she read the paper attached to it. Plus ultra child reachability safety test. Cleaning supplies check. Knives and other sharp objects check. Uncovered electricity sockets check. Laundry detergent check. Toaster check. Coffee check. Spices check. Medicine check. Adult stuff check. Oh no, she knows. Yagi. But before she could finish talking All Might quickly ran out of the door at near sonic speed, jumping over the stunned family and dashing down the stairs next to the elevator with recovery girl hot on his heels. You can run, but you can't hide. I am your doctor and I know where you live. She yelled in pursuit. The green-haired boy gently pulled at his mother's skirt. What is going on, mommy? Is All Might scared? His mother didn't have any time to respond as a window in the hallway opened. Both of her suitcases were suddenly yanked away and carried inside by a red blur. I think I lost her at the 16th floor. Quickly get in before she realizes I jumped outside. He said with panic in his voice as he ushered the small family into his home. Before swiftly shutting the door behind them and locking it. When All Might saw the looks of his new flatmates. He took a deep calming breath, put back on his fearless smile before talking again. I believe we should all introduce ourselves. You can call me Tashinori. All Might exclaimed as he energetically pointed at himself with his thumb. What a quick recovery. Went through in Ko's head. She quickly washed the bewilderment off her face and with a slight blush answered, My name is Inko Midoriya, but please call me Inko, everyone does. Tashinori made an eye contact with the young woman for a second and nearly got lost in her pretty green eyes before giving her a slight nod. Both of them then looked at Izuku, who was suddenly once again extremely nervous, holding the hem of his t-shirt for dear life, shaking and looking at the carpet as if it should come alive and swallow him whole at any second. All Might saw the young child's embarrassment and he knew that he had to listen to the playful part of his mind and have some fun. Don't worry, I already know your name, Ishmaku. Izuku twitched a bit and quickly looked up. And no my name is I Izuku. I am sorry. It's so hard to hear you from down there in my old age. Please could you repeat that, Rizmuku? The tall hero responded and got on one knee and put his hand next to his ear in a playful fashion. My name is Izuku. The green-haired boy said louder right into the hero's ear and Tashinori comically fell on his back clutching both of his ears. Oh my goodness, I think I have gone deaf. What tragedy to befall a hero. My career is most certainly over. I will have to star in commercials dressed as a giant dancing burger. Oh Nuo. He shouted in an exaggerated sad voice rolling around on the ground to Izuku's horror. The woman couldn't help herself but quietly chuckle at such a sight. After everything calmed down and the hero magically regained his hearing, he showed the family around the penthouse. It was just perfect, glistening hardwood flooring, many pretty carpets, and enough room for eight people. There were four bathrooms in total, a large kitchen with latest cooking utensils, large living room, three guest rooms, a balcony, and even an indoor sauna. The list just went. But that was just one side of the situation. The entire place seemed so lifeless and empty. It was as if no one lived here. Not that there was dust and cobwebs or anything like that. It just didn't have that homey feel at least to Inko. Hem Ms. Midoriya, you look worried, is there anything wrong? Tashinori asked when he noticed her expression. She immediately smiled up at him. No it's just, do you live here alone? Well, you see, live is a strong word. I mostly just sleep here. Justicing and villains don't really have a regular schedule. All Might said as he nervously rubbed his head. Inko felt a bit sorry for the older man. It's not that he wasn't doing well for himself, he clearly was, but she couldn't imagine living such a lonely life. Her thoughts were interrupted when she heard Izuku from the other room. Mommy, come look at this. Both she and the hero rushed to see what was going on only to find Izuku on the floor in pure ecstasy in a room, which Tashinori only described as storage area without even going in. Oh no he found it. There are all might memorabilia everywhere, from rolled up posters, masks and life-sized copies of the hero made from paper to more obscure things like shampoos with all Mig's head as a dispenser and a whole box of candy bars called Mighty. Izuku was sitting on the carpet with boxes of small figurines all around him with little stars in his eyes. Oh I am so sorry. This collection must be worth a fortune. The green-haired woman said as she gently picked up her son under the shoulders from the mess he made. No, it's fine. My sponsors always send this stuff to me every time I do a promotion. I would throw it out if I could but then people would start going through the garbage again. He admitted with defeated expression on his face. So why don't you try donating it? I would. But then I would just become a giant walking commercial for myself. He exclaimed with desperation nearly chasing off his smile. In that moment he remembered just how excited and nervous he was when he was making his first commercial for a small clothing brand, which ended in everyone wearing a yellow t-shirt with Plus Ultra written on them, which made him feel like a cult leader every time he stepped outside. Can I take them? Izuku said unsurely. Tashinori looked at the small boy, which made the boy a bit nervous again. I I mean not all of them, just some for the room. 
I will return them afterwards, I promise. He said quietly and pointed at the door to the room he was staying in. So pure, why not? You know what they say. One man's trash is another man's treasure. The hero energetically responded. He was about to continue his tour but was suddenly interrupted with his own voice. A phone call is here. A phone call is here. All Might quickly fished the phone out of his pants and brought it to his ear. I'll be right there. He said after the voice from the other end stopped. His attention returned back to the family. I am afraid that's all the time we have. Some villain with control over asphalt is terrorizing a nearby road construction. The fridge is quite full and I am sure you can finish the exploration on your own. Good luck. He yelled as hastily entered his bedroom and came out a second later fully dressed in his attire, before jumping from the balcony into the loud city bellow. Izuku quickly ran to the balcony to watch the hero flying through the air and gave him an energetic wave. Hey Izuku, do you want any help decorating your room? Inko asked after the child's frantic movement stopped. They spent the rest of the day decorating, had a late lunch and after that a dinner. At first they both wanted to wait for their new roommate but after a while the boy's stomach started rumbling from hunger. At 2 a.m., Tashinori softly landed on the balcony happy he managed to keep the family from waking up, though he was also pretty angry. He had lost more than a half of day chasing after that villain and doing ungodly amount of paperwork. How did Night Eye get it done so fast anyway? He often relied on takeout but since most shops were already closed he knew he would have to put his acceptable cooking skills to a test. I just hope it doesn't catch fire again. His stomach angrily growled as he entered the kitchen only for a heavenly smell to tickle his nose. There were two pot wrapped in dry blue dishcloth with a note attached to it. He snatched it and began reading. All might, I can't ever express how very grateful we both are for your help. We tried waiting for you, but we both got pretty hungry had dinner, but I cooked a bit more in case you got hungry and got here late. Please help yourself. In co, he uncovered both pots, one half full of rice, the other half full of curry and some steam hit him in the face. How is it still warm? That woman is magical. He pulled out a plate and took a serving, then second, and then finished both pots. It was just so good. It had the exactly right amounts of salt and other spices, weight be damned. After eating, the chair he was sitting on quickly became the most comfortable place in the world and so he fell asleep. At 3 a.m., Fizuku's bladder woke the sleeping boy up and he stumbled into the hallway in search of the toilet and after relieving himself he made a mistake when walking back to bed and ended up inside the hero's personal training room. The walls of the room were reinforced by strong metal. There were five punching bags of various sizes, a giant treadmill, an exercise bike and a humongous weight rack. This is where he trains. The green-haired boy was mesmerized by everything he looked at as he wandered through the room. Every dent and every scratch. They were all products of Hero's rigorous training. He became so enthralled by his environment that he didn't notice a jump rope lying on the floor, which made him trip. He made a few quick steps to stabilize himself until he ran into something soft he immediately grabbed. He couldn't believe his eyes. There were not five punching bags, there were six. This one was just so big he just saw it as a part of a wall. It was a huge four feet wide and eight feet tall object made from black artificial leather and held up by a massive metal chain. I bet he uses it practice smashes, Izuku said in excitement. It must be so amazing to throw a smash. The boy looked at his hands and then at the back. No, I can't do that. But he wouldn't mind if I tried, would he? The small boy looked around the room to make sure no one was watching and then took his fighting stance. Smash, he whisper shouted and attempted a punch only for his leg to slip and him to fall right on his butt. He blushed a little hoping there were no secret cameras in the room as he got back up on his feet. He prepared again and lunged another punch with his whole body weight, and this time he even made contact before the recoil from the bag forced him back down on his butt. He stood up again but this time with a small smile. For his third try he imagined the meanest looking villain in the place of the back. He had eight red eyes, seven arms with claws sharp as knives four legs purple skin and razor sharp teeth. He took his this time improved stance, where his legs weren't so twisted around each other held out his arm and took a running start. Smash! He shouted as his tiny fist made contact again and this time the villain punching bag actually moved. It in fact moved so much that it made contact with the ceiling with enough force to dislodge it from its hook and fall on the metal ground with a loud crash, which woke up everyone in the penthouse. Izuku heard a knock on his door which immediately grabbed his attention before the door opened and the giant hero entered his new room. All Might stopped for a moment to take in his surroundings. From every side there have been smaller versions of himself staring at him, which was more than unnerving. Hello there young man, how did the hospital treat you? He asked ignoring the rest of the room and concentrating on its sole occupant. The doctor was very nice, he even gave me a lollipop. Izuku said happily and a wide smile appeared on his face. All Might's smile however wavered as he sat down on the ground to better face the boy and the green-haired child noticed this immediately. 
Are you mad that I broke your back? Izuku asked and lowered his head, which caught Toshinori completely by surprise and he quickly patted the boy's head reassuringly. No it's okay it was easy to put it back. He answered honestly which calmed the boy a lot. But we need to talk about your quirk, young Midoriya. My quirk. Yes young man. It seems that you now have the same power as me cursing through you. All Might said as he gently poked Izuku's tiny chest with his index finger before his face turned very serious in a second. Listen Izuku, I need you to promise me something. Promise to All Might. I need you to promise me that you will never abuse this power to harm others. That you will only use it to help and save those smaller and weaker. Can you do that for me? All Might said before offering his hand to the boy. At that moment the young boy's mind went into overdrive. Even at four years of age he already knew that this was the moment that would determine the rest of his life. Tiny tears appeared in his eyes as he stood up and gave few of Toshinori's fingers a firm squeeze and affirmation. Yes, I will be a hero just like you and I will save everyone. I promise. With that All Might's expression softened and a mischievous smile returned to his face as he quickly moved his hand into Izuku's armpit and started tickling him furiously. I wish you the best of luck, young Midoriya. 5 p.m. at the meeting of Hero Public Safety Commission members. Dot 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 and that concludes this month's financial report. Finished the always extremely tired beige-haired Yokimer when everyone else in the conference room sighed in relief and about half of the even started to rise from their seats only to be abruptly stopped by the president. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that every one of you can't wait to get back home, but before we all go to our families there is still one thing we need to discuss. She said calmly and nodded to someone behind her and the projector was turned back on showing a picture of a green-haired boy. This is Izuku Midori, a four-year-old boy, who was recently rescued by the number one hero All Might. There was some murmuring among the other members which immediately stopped when the president gave them an irritated look. Since the child's name and photo was leaked into the press, the boy and his mother were placed under protection, but today All Might, with whom the family is currently staying, notified the commission about a small incident which took place during early morning hours of today. The child was apparently able to muster enough power to rival even some of the hero's strongest attacks. A four-year-old is strong as All Might. This can't be real. To say that everyone in the room was shocked would be an understatement. They kept frantically looking at people sitting next to them. But if anything was clearly evident on them it was fear. Most of the accidents involving quirks didn't involve professional heroes or villains. Both groups were almost always trying to end every conflict as quickly and cleanly as possible. Instead these accidents were mostly caused by young children who had just discovered their quirks. These cases ranged from things not too serious like shoplifting and minor property damage to deadly like blackouts, arson and sometimes even deaths. Workers of this commission were no strangers to this, yet they couldn't even imagine the complete chaos and destruction that could ensue from a child with the power to demolish an entire city block with a single movement of his hand. He was taken earlier today to get his quirk analyzed and Dr. Fujiwara is here to share the results. An elderly man with square grey haircut and deep wrinkles took the stage with a piece of paper. What came next was a 10-minute lecture of how exactly Izuku's quirk functions, which only made the entire room more nervous. When the elderly scientists stopped talking there was once again energetic murmuring between the members. Everyone please calm down. This situation will be handled accordingly. But for the time being all we can do is to observe. Observe. Have you gone mad? Yelled a bearded man from the back of the room. What if the boy absorbs more dangerous quirks? There is no way a child could ever be trusted with that power. Shouted another one of the listeners as she jumped from her seat. Those angry and panic-filled voices were immediately stopped when the president slapped her hand on her desk, which once again got the attention of everyone. We have already took some safety precautions, but the boy will be constantly observed either by our agents or by the number one hero, which should minimize the possibility of any dangerous situation. Minus seven hours later at the penthouse balcony. Izuku put down the phone he borrowed from his mother's handbag against the windowsill and pointed the camera at himself. The jumpsuit, which he was wearing right now was weird. It was hand-delivered earlier just a few hours ago to his new home along with a pair of gloves by two men, who both looked like secret agents but both his mother and Tashinori implored him to wear this new suit whenever he went outside under his normal clothes. Even though it was skin tight, it didn't feel at all uncomfortable. It had been made from a very comfortable and thin green material and it soon felt like a second skin to young Izuku but more importantly for him it looked like a real hero costume. He checked his appearance before pulling up a sign made of cardboard. He tore from one of the boxes containing All Might's merchandise and painted a large blue and yellow one over with his crayons. This is a quirk test number one. He whispered excitedly and then put the sign down. Luckily for him All Might left just two hours ago and his mother was fast asleep in her room. He would have asked for permission to practice using his quirk but after what happened earlier today he wasn't sure if it was safe for his mother. Earlier that day. Hey mom, look what I can do. 
Izuku said as many bones suddenly burst out of the skin on his arm, creating an ominous jagged spear and then reverted back to normal. Tada! He exclaimed happily. That's dot 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 very nice Izuku. She said slowly with wide eyes before promptly fainting. Mom, no. Izuku yelled in horror while jumping towards her and bracing her before she could hit the floor. Her weight was too much for the boy though and so they both crashed down with her son pinned under her belly. When All Might saw this he quickly hurried over and picked up Inko which allowed the boy to crawl away. What happened? Are you okay? Asked All Might with worry in his voice while carefully putting down the mother on a nearby sofa. I I don't know, I just showed her my quirk. Izuku responded unsurely. He outstretched his arm and gave the number one hero the same demonstration. So disturbing. Back in present. Okay so first up sharp boner. He said as his arm transformed into a bone blade. Izuku let out a happy giggle as the sharp bone made the tiniest reflection of moonlight. Wow, it's so cool. He silently gushed over it with little sparks in his eyes while gently and slowly waving it through the air and adding whoosh sounds with his mouth. After a while he walked away from the camera's watchful eye and came back a moment later with a plain piece of paper and attempted to perform the sharpness test he once saw in a TV commercial. But before he could the paper was taken from him by a random gust of wind and drifted down to the street's bellow. Similar mostly unsuccessful tests continued for a while until he got tired and returned his arm back to its normal form. He began to sneak his way back to bed when he thought about what All Might was doing right now with envy. Probably catching criminals, saving civilians dot 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 or maybe just flying. Then a sudden realization struck him. Does it mean that I can fly now too? He ditched his bedtime for a while and turned the camera back on. He always does this weird squat thingy whenever in the air. The young boy tried to copy the hero squad as he coined it but quickly lost his balance and fell on his back. Maybe he does it when he's already flying. He got back on his feet and tried to copy an old flying pose he saw some weird cleft-chinned American hero do a while back, but nothing happened. Oh I know, I must already be in air. And with this idea Izuku started jumping around like a broken mechanical frog, but still ended without results. Yet his determination wouldn't let the boy just fail, so he took a running start flexed every muscle in his tiny body and the next thing he felt was intense wind pressure ruffling his face. At the Todoroki abode, Shoto Todoroki was sitting in the garden alone looking at the fish in the koi pond slowly swimming in circle. Ever since he had his bandages removed, the boy with heterochromia had trouble falling asleep. The nightmares which came after the whole kettle incident never really stopped. He could still see his mother with a scary look in her eyes only to buy blinded by indescribable pain. He slowly and carefully brought his right hand to his new scar and let his quirk slowly cool his mostly healed but still sensitive wound. Right now, he had no one to talk to. His mom was probably the only pillar of support he ever had. Even though he liked his siblings very much his father never let him get very close to them or even play with them. Then there was the man himself and he would have a better chance if he tried talking to a rock. Shoto cautiously waved his hand through the air creating small soft snowflakes and watched them drift in the wind. Mom, I hope that whenever you are, you are okay. This moment of peace was however immediately interrupted by a shower of sand. When something, which could only be described as green thunder, landed in the sandpit, the boy immediately jumped from the bench he was sitting on and dove for cover. What is this? A villain attack. His panicked thoughts were broken up when a voice came from the sandpit. I, I am alive. I am alive. Izuku said with relief while stepping out of the sand. Todoroki peeked from behind the bench he hid behind only to see a smaller boy in a green jumpsuit dusting himself off. Wow, this suit is really something, it doesn't have a scratch on it. Um, are you okay? Asked shyly Todoroki as approached the younger boy. The green-haired boy looked at the unknown person and immediately tears rushed into his eyes. It's fine, it's not your fault. E but your hair's full of blood. That's my normal hair color. Todoroki deadpanned while pointing at his hair and watched as the face of sadness quickly transformed into one of excitement. Wait, you have two colors. That's so awesome. It is. Yeah. Are other parts of you also too colored, like your teeth or your toenails? No, just my hair and my eyes. Your eyes. Oh wait, you are right. How did I not notice that? That's so cool. Even though Shoto was feeling sad, angry and cluelessly lost just a moment ago, Izuku's enthusiasm and positivity were so incredibly potent and infectious it brought a small smile back on the scarred boy's face. And so the two boys talked about anything that came to mind and Izuku's interest only skyrocketed when Shoto agreed to show him his own quirk by creating two ice popsicles from twigs lying on the ground around the nearby tree which were quickly abandoned due to their horrid taste. How did you end up in here anyway? Asked Todoroki suddenly, which quickly flipped the boy's smile upside down. Oh no, I have to get back home quickly before he returns. He couldn't even imagine the chaos that would follow if All Might came back home and didn't find him there. He took a quick look and found a few skyscrapers in the distance. I am so sorry, but I have to go. Let's talk later, said Izuku and quickly bowed an apology before he prepared for jumping again. Wait, what's your name? 
Todoroki asked abruptly scared of losing a new friend. It's Izuku, he said quickly and jumped with all his strength into the night sky. The wind whipped his entire body as he flew towards the large building and very soon he realized the fact that he completely overshot his target. He wanted to scream but it was nearly impossible to even breath and so he was reduced to watch in terror as the ground got slowly closer. Then a massive object collided with him snatching him from air before they both landed on a roof of a supermarket. You are under arrest for resisting arrest and other charges, exclaimed Tashinori sternly before taking another leap towards the skyscraper with Izuku safe in his arms. Later in the living room. So, what exactly were you thinking, young man? All Might asked seriously. Right after they returned All Might sat the boy down on an armchair and began questioning him. Luckily the green-haired boy was uninjured and Nko was still asleep when they returned. He couldn't even imagine how the mother would react if she learned about what happened. I am sorry I I just wanted to be like you. If if I want to become a hero like you I have to train super hard, right? And in so I thought I would start early. Was all he managed to say before sobbing and heavy tears overtook him and honestly Tashinori didn't know how to react. Six months, he said suddenly and Izuku turned his red and swollen eyes towards him. It took me six months to master that jump. During that time I have hardly slept and felt as if anything I did wasn't enough. Look, you don't need to rush anything. Just keep your target in your sight and I am sure you will reach it. All Might took a knee in front of the little boy as he finished and then pulled out a handkerchief and smothered the boy's face with it wiping away all of his tears. You don't need to copy me. Just be who you want to be and I promise that I will help you. The big man said and smiled at the young boy who just stared at him in awe. I I will try to, all might. I was worried, but now I see that I couldn't ask for a better person to inherit this power. Now go back to bed. You have kindergarten tomorrow right? And soon the boy slept soundly with a small smile of relief back on his face. Izuku's shyness was pushed into an overdrive after he discovered that the kindergarten he would be brought to was not the one he usually visited but an entirely new one. It calmed a bit him when his mother told him that this was only a temporary change, until things got back to normal. But it was still hard for him to imagine that he wouldn't see his friends but instead some new people he has never seen before. Izuku's mother wasn't very pleased about the fact either but after a talk with All Might and a short phone call with the friendly detective she understood that it was just a temporary safety measure both for her son and for the other children. He would be moved into the daycare service established by the Safety Commission for Young Children or other relatives of well-known heroes to ensure their well-being and protection. It was much larger than the green-haired boy expected and there weren't just toys and jumping ropes like in the old one. Here they had a trampoline, two ball pits and even a small slide. Oh, you must be the new resident of ours, said a young lady as she walked towards Izuku and gave him a pat on the head. I am Michiko and what do I call you? She asked enthusiastically and looked at the boy with a soft smile. I Izuku ma'am. Oh, what a fine young gentleman. Well Izuku if you need anything just come and ask M. Naoko stop that right now. She exclaimed suddenly and ran off to two boys wrestling on the carpet nearby to break up the fight. He felt like a celebrity since he and his mom had been escorted there in a police car but things soon turned sour when he noticed that all the kids were already in groups playing wide variety of games and the shy little green-haired boy didn't have an idea how he should approach them and ask if he could join them. Tag players just rushed past him before he even managed to get a word out. Children in ball pits simply dug themselves deeper as soon as he approached them like earthworms and the kids playing with blocks have built a huge tower with their quirks and didn't even notice him. Come on Tenya, don't you want to go play with others? He heard nearby and turned his attention towards another caretaker currently reasoning with a slightly taller boy with glasses. I am doing research, I can't right now, Miss Takara. He exclaimed and wildly gestured with his hands towards the pile of papers on the table before him. It was as if a tiny robot went rogue and then caught an error in processing, which prompted Izuku to take a closer look. Just as he came near the taller boy, young Tenya suddenly jumped from his seat and thrust his arm nearly hitting the green-haired child in the process. Oh, you must be new here, I am Tenya Ida, said the spectacled kid energetically without changing his serious expression even a little. Izuku slowly accepted the hand and gently shook it and introduced himself again. After the quick social interaction, the boy immediately turned around grabbed a small light blue scope with stars and planets painted on it and looked through a window behind himself. Izuku took a step forward and looked through the window himself but didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. There was just a small park outside and a few dark clouds outside. But the taller boy seemed completely focused on what was happening outside. Wa well, what are you watching, Tenya? But the green-haired boy didn't get an answer. Ida just turned back around started and quickly drawing a tree with something small and roundish hanging of it on a piece of paper before putting it neatly on an organized stack of papers all displaying the similar picture. He made sure the papers didn't stick out at all before turning his attention back on the green-haired kid. Can you keep a secret? He asked with an incredibly serious expression after he took a quick look around the room to make sure no one was listening. Izuku hesitated for a few seconds before nodding repeatedly. 
I am trying to uncover the most important secret in the world. Edda said excitedly with an incredibly serious face and his arms gesticulating furiously. What is the secret? Izuku asked after holding his breath for a few moments without even realizing it. That secret is, where do babies come from? What do you mean? Izuku asked confused this idea didn't ever even cross his mind. Think about it. My mom always tells me and my brother that we were cute babies. I can't even remember being a baby, let alone anything before that, can you? The blue-haired boy asked and the shorter boy couldn't help but agree. There was no way anyone could ever hope to remember something like that. But what are you looking at? The taller boy quickly handed him the small toy scope and pointed at one of the large trees outside. Izuku tried to observe the tree, but it was just a regular plant. I don't get it. No, not the tree, the beehive on the tree. Izuku looked again and this time he saw it. There was a little natural apiary hanging from one of the branches. Oh yeah, you are right, that's so cool. But what does it have to do with babies? Small Itter readjusted his glasses before looking at the shorter child with determination of a seasoned conspiracy theorist. Everything. When I asked my mom, she said that it was a secret and then I overheard both of my parents talking about me. And what did they say? Little Izuku asked as he quickly gained more and more interest. That I shouldn't know about the birds and the bees. Are they working together? With that Ada put on a smug smile and pulled a paper seemingly at random from the small stack. Here's what I think. The beehive isn't actually the home of the bees, but a human egg. Tenya exclaimed and pointed at the drawing, which showed a small figure cramped into the small space. Whoa. And then, when the baby gets big enough the hive falls down, breaks and a bird takes the baby to the new family. That's so cool. But why do girls get so big when they are waiting for the baby? Suddenly Ada's eyes went wide open in shock. Oh no, another hole in my theory. He exclaimed as he picked up the pile and swiftly threw it into a nearby trash bin. Soon his shocked expression changed into a defeated one. When he saw the older boy's disappointment, Izuku began panicking. I am sorry. It's okay, I just thought I finally had it. And maybe I could help you. But before he had time to finish, Tenya tightly grasped his shoulders. Really, you would do that for me? Ida asked as if his energy magically recharged in an instant. Sure, but what do we do? We have to get more clues from someone trustworthy but they can't be from a parent. And so the boys started planning the next step on their journey for enlightenment and after that started playing. Five hours later, the small green-haired boy entered his new home with his mother after she picked him up at the daycare. So, what would you like for lunch today, Izuku? Fried chicken, he exclaimed and raised both of his hands triumphantly. Okay, but you have to eat your greens, she said warmly and petted his head. And with that Inko started preparing food in the kitchen while the boy sat down on the carpet in living room and turned on the television just as one of his favorite cartoons started. After a while the chicken was calmly sizzling on the stove and Inko joined her son and just watched him get excited about the silly story on the screen. The sun slowly disappeared behind dark clouds and soft rain was soon softly drumming on the windows filling the apartment with calm atmosphere and the heavenly smell flowed from the kitchen. Just as the mother got up from the couch to boil some potatoes, the glass door to the balcony opened and Sok Tashinori quickly rushed inside. Guess who has the rest of the day off? He exclaimed. Wow, heroes have vacations. Izuku asked. Oh not really. But when the weather gets bad, it interferes with most quirks, so most of the villains stay home. All Might informed them with a beaming smile and made his way into the bathroom to get a nice warm shower as the weather began to worsen once again. While he showered and put on some clean civilian clothes and co-prepared the table and another plate for the hero and after 10 minutes all residents met around the dining table. There was little to no conversation, they were all just quietly enjoying their meal in peace. Tashinori repeatedly tried to thank the green-haired woman for the food but she just brushed it off by telling him just how grateful she is that he had let them stay. After they finished and Ko's phone rang and the large hero immediately volunteered to take care of the dishes, which left him alone with Izuku in the kitchen and the young boy quickly grasped the opportunity. Mr. All Might, can you help me with something? He asked nervously failing to meet the blonde man's eyes. Tashinori looked at the boy with a bright smile with his hands still concentrated on the dirty plate. Anything you need young man, he said cheerfully. I need to ask you something. All Might's smile faltered a bit, but he kept scrubbing. Well, then ask away. Please don't ask about my quirk. I can't trust a child with that information. Where do babies come from? And just like that Tashinori's hand involuntarily twitched from the shock and sent the plate soaring straight through the window. Oh, well another thing to replace. What was that question? Um, where do babies come from? Oh no, I heard him right. Even though the tall man kept a calm smile his inner voice was suddenly sounding like teenage girl screeching while watching a rather gruesome horror movie. Why would you ask me that? Because we need to understand the secret of the birds and the bees. Birds and the bees. But wait, who is we? My new friend wants to know. Izuku quickly answered and continued to expectantly stare at the hero who was starting to sweat. All Might was frantically thinking about an escape from this situation. 
Should he jump out of the window and search for the discarded plate? Should he fake a phone call? Yet after a look at the boy he knew that no matter what he did, Izuku would simply ask again later. And so he pulled his hands out of the kitchen sink, wiped them on his pants and focused his attention completely at the boy. Listen young man, this isn't something you should discuss with me. Why don't you ask your dad? The little boy looked down for a moment and sadness flashed over his face and the tall man immediately regretted his question. I've never met my dad. H. He moved from Japan when I was super small and I don't even remember how he looks. He said sadly while averting his eyes from his favorite hero. Well then, why don't you ask your mother? No, if I ask her it won't be a secret anymore. Toshinori side rubbed his forehead when an idea struck him. Okay, I will tell you later today. Okay. Really, thank you so much. Izuku said as he embraced one of his legs before running off. At evening, Inko tucked her son in bed and soon after she left. Then just a few minutes later All Might slipped in with a very thick and old-looking book without her noticing. Are you ready to learn the secret, young man? Yeah. The small green-haired boy answered excitedly. And just like that Tashinori pulled up a chair next to the boy's bed and opened his book. It was a very old biology textbook from his days at the high school, which meant that there were no pictures and everything was written in long and boring paragraphs. Human reproduction is achieved through sexual intercourse. Sexual what? Izuku interrupted already confused. All Might's smile just widened as he flipped a few pages forward and started reading again. Sexual intercourse or copulation is a reproductive act in which the male reproductive organ. What is an organ? So far Izuku couldn't understand a single thing and these new words didn't help at all. But All Might just kept his smile and flipped what looked like at least a hundred pages back, slowly and checking twice if he was going to the correct page. Organs are the body's recognizable structures. And so this little talk continued and the boy's eyes started getting more and more tired. His eyelids heavier and heavier as All Might spoke and spoke ever so slowly, until the boy finally fell asleep, at which point the hero carefully closed his book and silently exited the room. It didn't solve the problem completely. But it gave him or to anybody else, who would have to explain it to the boy at least two years of time, since he knew that a four-year-old boy wouldn't ask about something so boring any time soon. I hope you keep that innocence for as long as possible, young man. Feeling a bit thirsty from all that reading he made his way into the kitchen only to see Inko brewing herself some tea. Do you have enough hot water for one more cup, Miss Midoriya? The tall man asked happily as he sat down at the table. Of course, and you can call me Inko. Only if you call me Tashinori. He reminded her playfully. After a minute she also took a seat and the two started chatting a bit. It was a nice change for the hero to have someone he could talk to. It was a pleasant feeling which he lost when his training ended and the mother seemed very interested by the hero, mainly by his ability to always remain cheerful. This conversation quickly changed though when All Might suddenly changed the subject. So where is Izuku's father anyway? He asked only to see her kind smile turn into a sad one. Oh, I'm so sorry I didn't mean to pry. No, it's nothing, my ex-husband he. Left us before Izuku was even born. Said that he wasn't ready to be someone's father and then moved abroad. Did you get a divorce? Yes, but he still sends us money and he even used to call and check on us but not anymore. I am sorry to hear that. It must be very hard to look after Izuku on your own. Said the large hero but Inko immediately cheered up. Not at all actually. He has always been such a good boy. Please give me a moment. She said, quickly stood up and swiftly walked to her room only to return just a few seconds later with a photo album which she laid on the table nearly spilling her tea in the process. The spent nearly half an hour looking at old pictures of Izuku and other children while Inko described the situations during which they were taken. Then he saw what had to be the sweetest thing he had ever seen in his entire life. In this picture Izuku was sleeping in his All Might onesie clutching a plushy version of the number one hero close to his chest whilst covered in blanket. He couldn't quite understand why, but something made his heart feel just a little more comfortable in its place when he looked at the picture. I gave him that once he on his third birthday and he absolutely refused to take it off for two days. He even started crying when was supposed to take a bath. And what did you do? And Ko giggled before giving him an answer. Well I told him that only villains wear smelly clothes and he nearly tore it in half trying to take it off. To which Tashinori burst out laughing heartily. They spent a few more minutes telling each other funny stories like this until they reached the end of the photo album and Inko put it back in her room. But after a while both of them finished their tea and went their separate ways. Yet Tashinori couldn't get something out of his mind. Every time he made Inko smile with some dumb villain story he just wanted to tell her another, just so he could watch her smile for a bit longer. It was a weird urge but not an unpleasant one. A week has gone by and everything just slowly shifted into a routine. Every day Izuku woke up brushed his teeth, ate breakfast and was taken to the daycare by a police car. Even his new weird suit and gloves became pretty much normal. Ever since he met him, 
Izuku's impression of Ida changed from malfunctioning robot into friendly robot and after he managed to persuade him about the fact that this whole baby business contained mostly boredom and long, difficult words the two actually started having a pretty good time together. One day they would construct an extremely impressive structure from building blocks and the next they would play a game of hide and seek so complicated it perplexed even their supervisors, which only led to further delight for the boys. In a slightly different way, friendship also slowly grew between Tashinori and Inko. Both soon noticed that whenever alone, they always had something interesting to talk about and overall, just enjoyed the company of each other. All Might sometimes found his head invaded by thoughts about the nice green-haired woman, just like the one right now. Does she like flowers? Would that be weird? Currently the number one hero was patrolling a busy street from a rooftop when he noticed a flower shop on the other side. What he failed to notice though was a villain who snuck silently behind him, whilst holding a rather well-worn crowbar. He took a wide swing and hit All Might's shoulder with all of his power and this action produced a rather nasty sounding crunch. The tall man turned around and saw the guy in a ridiculous looking red costume with a green skull badly painted on his chest, who just attacked him on the ground holding his clearly dislocated wrist screeching in pain like a mad person. Sometimes you people just make it too easy, Tashinori said as he picked up the injured criminal by the collar quickly determining from the villain's eyes that he was under the influence of something. He carefully jumped from the roof and called over a policeman who quickly arrested the wanted felon. After that people quickly surrounded the hero. He was just writing an autograph for a couple of kids when his hand froze, his mind once again invaded by a thought, when his eyes met a small bakery just a few buildings away. Maybe something sweet would be better. Inko was meanwhile being pestered with questions by her friends about 20 blocks away in a small cafe. She at first wanted to refuse their invitation thinking that it would make it harder for police to protect her family but Tashinori managed to convince her to meet her friends even though this required two officers dressed in civilian clothing observing the whole group from a nearby table. So dot 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 did you see him naked? Asked her bespectacled short purple haired friend from work suddenly which instantly made Inko choke on her coffee and then gasp for air. Takara, stop it, ordered the other friend throwing an angry look her way. Come on Kichai, they live together and accidents happen said Takara unapologetically, which made Inko blush even harder. No, I it's nothing like that. The green-haired woman forced out a rather quickly. Come on Inko, I work at HR and I can spot a liar from hundred yards away. Did anything happen? Asked Takara again not even bothering to hide her excitement. Well, the young mother started with scarlet still on her cheeks. Three days ago, she woke up with her book on her stomach after a short nap. The green-haired woman stood up, stretched and decided to go for a shower. It was so nice to have everyday access to nearly endless supply of hot water that was always available. She chose the closest bathroom and opened the door only to see Toshinori in his fluffy pink bathrobe and a matching shower cap brushing his teeth next to the mirror with a happy smile still present on his face. Normally this wouldn't be a problem but due to the massive size of his body and his musculature, the bathrobe was just a few sizes too short, leaving his limbs mostly uncovered. Inko let out an involuntary squeak and after blurting out I'm so sorry swiftly closed the door, while All Might just shrugged and continued his brushing. In the present, so close and yet so far, muttered the short woman in glasses. How do you still work in HR, you little perv? Kichai remarked. And so, her two friends began to bicker like they always used to, which gave Inko a feeling of normalcy. And that was something she hasn't felt for a whole week. Meanwhile her son was playing a new game with his friend when they were suddenly approached by a new face in the daycare. It was only her second day here and on the first one, she just felt too shy to talk to anybody especially since she never had any friends at all. At that time this little girl only knew five people and none of them were children. But today was different. Just a minute ago she saw the taller of the two boys standing on one leg with his arms in a weird position next to his head and so the shy girl fueled by curiosity walked a bit closer to observe them. A tree, guessed the green-haired boy again only to be met by silence. They were playing charades for a while, but now it seemed like Ida had finally won. Izuku has already tried to guess a fork, a tree, an antenna and a lamp. Now he had only one guess left, before Ida could declare his ultimate victory. Maybe I'm just looking at him wrong. Izuku thought and took a few quick steps back only to bump into someone with his shoulder. Sorry, are you okay? He quickly said as he turned around and saw girl slightly taller than him, who had the look of a deer caught in the headlights. I am okay. What are you doing? She forced out while dodging eye contact. We are playing charades. Wanna join? Join. She quickly averted her eyes to the ground as a slight blush flashed across her cheeks. As sure. Awesome. Come on. The boy said excitedly and grasped her hand and led her closer to his friend. The black-haired girl was surprised by his gloves but didn't ask about them due to her shy nature. What do you think? About what? We need to guess what Tenya is. Haven't you ever played this game? Izuku asked with visible confusion but the taller girl just shook her head. The green-haired boy then tried to explain the basic rules of the game to her. 
Luckily, she grasped the concept quickly. Ada was meanwhile utterly determined to win this match and so he stood completely still, despite the cramp he felt in his leg to avoid giving his opponents any hints. The victory is so close I can taste it. A candle holder. The girl suddenly blurted out, crushing his dream of victory. The tall boy lowered his head in defeat and took a step forward to shake hands with the victor, only to realize that his other leg fell asleep. His knee gave up on him. He lost his balance and fell straight on his face. The shorter boy had to suppress a chuckle as he helped his friend back on his feet. After a quick congratulation to the girl it was Izuku's turn to pretend. He decided to make it easier for the new player. The green-haired boy spread his legs a little, put his hands on his hip, straightened his back and flashed a toothy smile, perfectly mimicking his favorite hero. Ada immediately knew what he was doing and chose to let her have the first guess, which was a decision he would soon regret. Momo looked for a while at the shorter boy unsure and confused, but before long her eyes flashed, she smiled in recognition and exclaimed her answer, B-R-O-C-O-L-I. As soon as Izuku heard her utter that word, his smile dropped. That was so mean, he said sadly. Such savagery, commented Tenya in support. He couldn't believe that someone could compare his new friend to such a disgusting vegetable. But after he took a look at the shorter boy, he saw a resemblance, which he now couldn't unsee. I'm sorry, the girl said, when she noticed the effect of her words. She didn't actually know how she managed to offend him. But after being nice to her, it just felt wrong to hurt him in any way and she knew that she somehow did just that. You weren't making fun of me. Izuku asked surprised as sadness vanished. And no it's just dot 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 your hair looks like dot 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 you know. Broccoli. The green-haired boy finished for her. Yeah. But don't worry that's not a bad thing. Mom says that broccoli is super healthy and everything. Thanks, I guess. But that isn't what I was trying to do. Then what? All Might. Ada exclaimed before anyone else had the chance as he rose his hands in victory. What's an All Might? The girl asked sincerely, which made Izuku experience a feeling, which is reserved for missionaries, when they discover that someone has never heard about their lord and savior. He's the coolest hero in the universe, he said energetically as his mood once again changed, this time into blinding excitement. Izuku then swiftly ran off before returning with a comic book and an action figure in a few seconds. The duo spent next few hours introducing the new girl to the number one hero and watched her become more and more interested. They also learned her name and she told them that her family recently moved into a giant house with an even bigger garden. Did he really save hundred people in ten minutes? Yeah and he caught the villain who started the fire. He sounds so nice. The girl remarked with a wide smile. She was having such a blast right now that she didn't even notice it when one of the caretakers walked over to them. Momo, your mommy's here to pick you up so say goodbye to your friends and let's go. She said with a gentle voice and a patient smile on her face. The woman hated to pull the black-haired girl away from the two boys. She cared deeply for every single child in her daycare and it was so nice to see that the shy girl who looked scared of her own shadow just yesterday was already talking with other children. Can I stay for a few more minutes? She asked as her smile turned into a disappointed frown. I'm not sure dear, your mother said that she's in a hurry. Momo sighed and turned sadly back to the boys. Goodbye she weakly muttered. See you next time, Momo. They both said as she quickly left. Her mother, who was waiting outside, led the girl into an expensive car. But just as their driver put the car into gear a smile once again made its home on the young girl's face when she saw her new friends furiously waving at her from the window of the daycare. Two hours later, All Might entered the penthouse, carrying a shoe-sized pink box and was immediately met by a heavenly smell of yudon. Hi Tashinori, how was your day? The green-haired woman asked as she stirred the soup in the pot. Successful, six criminals and two villains arrested. He responded joyfully and rose his thumb on his free hand. What's in the box? Inko inquired as she finally noticed the package Tashinori held in his hand. The tall hero didn't respond, just set the box down on the table and opened it revealing twelve neatly stacked cupcakes of different bright colors. Each one resembled a beautiful flower and every single one generated a fascinating smell of fruit and vanilla. The beauty of this entire bouquet stunned Inko and she didn't know what to say. The look of surprise mixing with fascination, which appeared on her face somehow made All Might feel very happy inside. Hey Izuku, come take a look. Her son quickly came into the kitchen waving at the tall hero as he did so and when he took a glance at the contents of the box, his eyes widened in astonishment. So pretty. Tashinori playfully ruffled the boy's hair as he walked past him to his room, so he could get some normal clothing. Can I have one? Asked Izuku with little sparkles in his eyes and it took all of Inko's determination to deny him the sweet treat before they had lunch. The lunch went as usual, with All Might relentlessly complimenting the green-haired woman on the quality of the food and her telling him again and again that it was no big deal at all slowly becoming flustered. Yet the big man still couldn't quite get used to home-cooked meals every day. Izuku was meanwhile trying to finish his own food as soon as possible with the image of the promised cupcake still fresh on his mind. Will it be sweet or sour? Will it taste like strawberries or raspberries? Is it filled with cream or fruit? 
His thoughts were however suddenly interrupted as something wet and red landed right on his face as a loud splat was heard in the room. Izuku looked up from his udon, which was also colored red now, only to see All Might with his head lowered and his long blonde hair drenched in red liquid. There were also red and whitish chunks covering the entire table. Both son and his mother looked at All Might in horror, until he suddenly shifted his head back into its natural position and reached into his hair pulled out a rather large pink chunk, smelled it and then put it in his mouth. Hum, cherry. He looked around and saw the pink box open with one cupcake missing. The number one hero quickly put two and two together. It was clear that he was just attacked by a wild pastry, yet one question remained. How? Yet that question had to wait, when he saw the green-haired woman slowly slump in her chair. Luckily, he was fast enough to catch her before her head hit the floor, but the chair fell over in the process. Hey young man, can you give me a hand here? He said and watched as the little boy quickly ran over to him trying to help, but the chair suddenly moved by itself. At first it started violently shaking, then stood back on its four legs and then quickly slid towards the boy. As soon as he saw it, Izuku turned around and started running for his life as the beautiful wooden chair gave chase. A villain, Tashinori thought as he carefully put Inko on a couch in the living room before joining the race himself. He caught up to them pretty quickly, fast enough to see Izuku shut the door to his room and the chair banging on it with all its weight the next second. The hero quickly closed the distance to what he presumed was an angry object and grabbed it by one of its legs and tried to pull it back from the door only for it to snap off like a twig. So not a villain. He tried again this time grabbing it by the seat. Yet the mysterious power pushing the chair into the room was so great, he could hardly move the annoying piece of furniture with normal strength alone. But thankfully using one for all he succeeded and dragged the three-legged chair to the balcony and with a grunt he lobbed the possibly haunted item into the air. The object nearly broke through the sound barrier as it whizzed through the air, but then it slowly stopped and started quickly heading back. Oh, so you want more? Fine by me. All Might's smile grew wider as he pulled back his arm waiting for his target to close the distance between them. Smash. The chair was instantly reduced into thousands of splinters and the cloud slowly dispersed. At least that's what it looked like. Toshinori soon noticed that a small cloud stayed up in the air and was slowly approaching the penthouse. Before he could even react, it flew right past him at blinding speed. He watched the small swarm powerlessly as it flew through the living room right at Izuku who must have left his room when the commotion died down. The little boy hid his face behind his hands and waited for a pain to come which it never did. The whole cloud of sharp wood stopped just a foot away from him softly and calmly floating around his tiny body. Another quirk. Izuku gasped when he saw these little wooden spears passively levitating and reached out to pick one from the air only to see it softly glide into his open hand. He stared at it in wonder before letting it go, so it could join its brothers and sisters in their quiet aerial ballet. All might carefully but quickly approach the green-haired boy looking him over for any injuries only to find none. To say that the large man was relieved would be an understatement. All Might, what do I do? He asked in uncertainty and a few insignificant drops of nervous sweat appeared on his forehead. Um, um maybe try to calm down. It's probably just your quirk acting up. How how do I do that? I'm scared. He squeaked out nervously as the little pieces started slowly gaining speed and rotating around his body which forced the boy to gasp again in fear. Hey, it's gonna be okay. I am here. All Might said as he carefully reached through the flying fragments, ignoring the sting on his arm and placed his hand on the trembling boy's shoulder. Just breathe slowly. In and out. Izuku did just that and one after the other the pieces fell to the ground, creating a small circle-shaped even pile around the green-haired boy's feet. When the child noticed this, he fell on the ground and began softly sobbing. When Tashinori saw this, the big man went down to his knees and pulled the boy into a warm and surprisingly soft embrace. After about a minute, the boy's sobbing stopped and All Might released his gentle grip before taking a small step back. And in this heartfelt moment rather large chunks still present in the hero's blonde hair decided to fall and splat on the ground. The sight was so absurd, it made Izuku start quietly giggle and soon the muscular hero completed the scene with his hearty laugh. After they woke up Inko and explained what happened, she too was relieved to see that the number one hero was still alive and kicking and shocked to discover how her own quirk changed inside her son. And so they cleaned up the mess ate some more yudon and finished their meal with some truly delectable cupcakes and even though it was a beautiful break from all the chaos of the hero life, All Might soon realized what time it was. He hastily put on his suit, said goodbye to the family and went back on his patrol. The League of Villains hideout, 2 a.m. Nishioka Toga entered the bar which never seemed to appear as open, with a revolver strapped to his waist. He was a minor villain who specialized in frauds, which was extremely easy for him since could change his appearance into that of any person he chose. The only downside of his ability was the inability to change his body again for approximately one month. He had done this so many times he completely forgot how his original face and body even looked like. 
not that he cared much. Earlier today he was contacted by the league with a job offer, so he sat down and waited for the people he was supposed to meet while nursing a drink provided by the figure made of thick black smoke. About half an hour passed as two people entered the bar. One of them was a rather short-looking fellow with a mustache dressed in a grey business suit and pants, while the other had a muscular figure in black pants and hoodie. They both took a seat next to him and each one ordered a large glass of beer as they began to discuss the job. He would need to change into someone with white hair and a horrible facial deformity to posse as someone named Shigaraki for a few months before disappearing. He was happy with this offer especially. When he learned that his payment would be 10 million yen now and another 20 million after he returned, though his happiness faltered when they showed him the picture of the person he would be mimicking. How's this guy even still alive? That's none of your concern, said the shorter man, dismissing his question. They discussed some fine details, gave him another set of clothing and watched as he fine-tuned his body and face. Satisfied with the result handed Nishioka a black suitcase filled to the brim with money. He picked it up and got ready to head out, when the shorter man stopped him. Good luck, he said as he offered his right hand for a handshake which the man eagerly accepted. He hadn't realized however when the mustached man tightly clasped his other hand from the other side preventing Nishioka from reaching for his pistol. He had no way to defend himself when the guy in a hoodie pulled out a large knife, which he then buried between the shapeshifter's ribs. The dim lights of the city morgue had strange effects on people who weren't used to them. Many became nervous at the first sight of them and some would even swear that they saw ghosts immediately after entering. All Might was luckily unaffected by these feelings as he walked calmly through the building with Naomasa by his side leading him through the maze of hallways. The detective wasn't so lucky though, even if the place itself didn't have such effect. The absence of the iconic smile on the hero's face sure did. After a minute of walking they reached their goal. It was a plain room with two doors a glass wall and a metal table covered with a piece of white fabric in the middle of it. It was used for identifying bodies, since it felt much friendlier and cleaner than the morgue itself and it was only rarely used, most of the times all. That the detectives needed to confirm the body's identity was a face photo of the deceased person. This was different though. All might needed to be absolutely sure about if the man who was fished out of a small river earlier today was the same man who murdered his teacher and previous owner of one for all and so he asked to see the body with his own two eyes after being presented with the photo. There was a man in his late thirties with long curly jet black hair waiting for them. He introduced himself as the head medical examiner who performed the autopsy and led them over to the table. All Might waited with serious frown on his face as the white fabric was revealed and then he came face to face with the man he felt nothing but hatred for. All for one, is that really him? Naomasa asked Tashinori firmly, though he could already tell what the answer was from the hero's look. Yes, it's Shigaraki. He responded yet his face remained unreadable. What killed him doctor? I found two stab wounds. The first caused one of his lungs to collapse. He said before showing the wounds to the detective. Dot 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 and the second one went right through the aorta killing him instantly. I also noticed some minor bruising on his right hand. So there was a struggle. Namasa said as he wrote the information into his small notepad. It's possible. But I have not found from injuries from self-defense. Normally when someone's attacked with a knife they try to grab it or put their hands between them and the attacker, but as you can see there are no cuts. It was then, when both men noticed the intensity, with which all might watch the corpse. It was like he was waiting for the villain to come back from death and attack them in a second. All might, are you okay? Asked the detective worried for his friend. When he touched the hero's shoulder the large man flinched as if he came back from a trance. Yeah, I'm fine. It's just, what's wrong? Could you and Doc give me a few minutes alone with him? Namasa and the detective exchanged a brief look before they nodded. Take your time said the man who dissected his enemy as he and the detective made their way out of the room and headed to the closest coffee machine. It was not a normal request and a one which would normally be denied. But they both knew that if there was a person they could put their trust into it was the number one hero. A few seconds after the door closed after them, All Might let out a sigh and a small smile appeared on his face. You wanna know something? He asked silently and after being met by nothing but more silence he continued. I really thought that it was my end. He locked his bright blue eyes with Shigaraki's lifeless ones. When I was bleeding out on the floor, I thought that this is how I die. This is how one for all dies. His right hand slowly formed into a hard fist. That the life of my master and the lives of every previous holder. That they would be all for nothing. He took a step towards the glass on the wall and looked at the empty room behind it. You know, it was two or maybe three years ago when they called me. I was standing just behind this glass and they showed me a young dead hero. His face was beaten beyond recognition. He had no family, no close friends. It was just him and his team. He was the only one of them that we found. He took a calming breath before continuing. All Might remembered the boy well. 
He had scars all over his body. They were the side effect of his quirk. Yet he didn't mind them too much. He went into a hero program and worked through his pain, just so he could do an incredibly hard and dangerous job. People like that made even the number one hero feel small in comparison. Tashinori met the younger hero just four days before some police officer found his lifeless body under a large pine tree in a park. At that time the number one hero was the only one who could identify the core. It's so hard to believe that you are here laying on the same table he did all those years ago with pretty much the same face and maybe even killed by the same people. All Might could see something poetic in what he just stated. It had really shown how fickle a life of a villain was. But the funny thing is, that somewhere very deep inside, there is a very small part of me, which almost wants to thank you. Toshinori admitted as he pulled up a chair next to the table. Before you almost killed me, I only had one thing and that was my mission to find you and to make sure that you don't hurt anyone ever again. But since I woke up in just a week I no longer feel lonely and now for the first time there are two people with one for all and I strongly believe that the boy will one day become a much better and stronger hero than me. He said as his smile disappeared. During your entire life, all you did was hurt and manipulate people just to achieve your goals, but don't think your death changes anything. We will hunt down every single villain and criminal and we won't stop until everyone on this world has the ability to smile. And I hope that you take that to your grave. All Might declared angrily and roughly covered the dead man's face before leaving the room. It didn't take long for him to find the two men and after some small amount of paperwork he was ready to leave. When the medical examiner approached him, I hope you don't mind, but could I get an autograph for my son? He's a big fan of pro heroes. Sure. What's his name? All Might responded with his bright smile once again present on his face as he took the offered pen and paper. It's Fumikage. Dear Fumikage, always try your best and you will be sure to succeed. Signed All Might. He swiftly wrote before he handed the short message back to the boy's father and left the grim building, ready to begin a new part of his life. After the death of All for One the case was quickly concluded and even though the missing doctor was still at large he was classified as a low-level threat without his boss. As you might have guessed this meant that the Midorias were taken out of the protection program after the week it took for the paperwork to go through. This week has been different, especially for Inko. Sometimes when she met Tashinori in the penthouse, he gave her this weird nervous look and after a short awkward conversation he quickly left. Everything reached the peak when there was only one day remaining. By that point All Might was doing pretty much anything just to avoid the green-haired woman, which is why Inko was so surprised when she heard someone knock on her door when she was filling her large suitcase with clothes. Come in, the woman said with a feeling of uncertainty manifesting itself in her voice. The door then opened and revealed Tashinori with a strange twitching smile. It was a sight which unnerved her even more. Oh my, Tashinori are you feeling okay? You look so tense. Is there something wrong? She asked nervously as she took a step forward. The number one hero was taken aback for a second, but quickly recovered. Even though before he had the chance to answer her question his hand shot up to his head and started furiously rubbing an itch, which wasn't there to begin with. Yes dot 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 and oh wait no I I mean yes ugh. And I practiced this so many times. Wait let me start over. All Might sighed tiredly. A faint smile briefly appeared on Inko's face before disappearing as she looked at the floor sadly. Maybe I know what you are trying to say. You do. Yes, I think so. After all you have been so patient with us. Wait, patient. I mean, you have to hate it. That those people from the government forced you to let us live here, don't you? I am sorry. She said with an expression that could be only replicated by a kicked puppy before lowering her head. All Might was so surprised by her words that his own just couldn't make their way out of his mind into his mouth. So, he just stared at her silently for a few seconds. No. When she heard that one word she looked back at the blonde man questioningly. It's not like that. The number one hero said and closed the distance between them. But why were you acting so weird? I hardly even saw you this week. I had to tell you something and didn't want to mess it up. But every time I tried to bring it up, the words just scrambled every time I tried to speak with you. Just then Inko noticed how close the tall man was to her and her face slightly reddened. I wanted to tell you that even after all this blows over and even if there is zero chance of danger for you or for your son, you are both more than welcome to stay here. We can stay. A loud voice exclaimed from behind the door. It squeaked open and Izuku stuck his head through. I see you K.U. It's very impolite to eavesdrop on other people. She reprimanded her son angrily. Even though the green-haired boy seemed completely unaffected by her words as he ran over to his mom, grasped her pant leg and started jumping up and down with joy. Does it mean I can play Tenya and Momo again? Izuku asked hopefully. Both adults noticed just how bummed he looked when Inko told him that he would have to return back to his old kindergarten soon. But don't you miss Katsuki, I thought you two were friends. Izuku frowned for a second before answering. But Kaken has many friends and he's always angry at me. The little green-haired boy sadly admitted. His mother first looked at the boy's sad yet somehow still hopeful expression and then at All Might's face adorned by an honest smile. 
In Ko sighed, she knew that Tashinori was everything but dishonest. But to move in with someone just like that, it was true that the big guy was one of the nicest people she had ever met, and her son absolutely adored him. It was also very nice to have someone at home she could talk to and trust, but living with the number one hero, it just seemed like too much to take in. Hey, Izuku could you bring me mommy her phone? It's in my bag. Sure, mom. The green-haired boy yelled hurriedly and ran to the living room. Once he left her room and co-focused her attention back on Tashinori. Look, you are a really nice guy and I appreciate your offer, but we can't stay here. She quietly said. After those words left her mouth, she saw something which was very rare. The hero's smile slowly left his face and was promptly replaced by a disappointed frown. I, I see. But may I ask why? The tall man couldn't help himself. He needed to know what was wrong before he could even fathom losing his new roommates. Why? Just think about it. An unmarried woman and her child living with an unmarried man who has the same quirk as her son. How do you think people will react to that? Is she worried about me? I, I don't want to cause you more trouble. The absurdity of this entire situation finally hit All Might, and he wanted to keep it down, but the entire penthouse was soon filled with his hearty laughter which shocked Inko. Oh ha ha, I am sorry, it's just that you are such a wonderful person. After a few more chuckles, the hero got his laughter under control. Her answer made him feel miserable. Tashinori feared that she found his energetic nature or maybe their conversations annoying, or that maybe she blamed him for sudden presence of the government in both hers her son's lives. Yet it was this simple reason which only showed her selflessness more. Please take this seriously. The green-haired mother pleaded, clearly flustered by the hero's strange response. I do. But I am a hero because I love to make people feel safe. Not for a good press and PR. So if that is your only concern then there is nothing to worry about. All Might declared happily as his trademark smile returned to his face. Inko searched his face for any sign of dishonesty or nervousness. But there was nothing. The number one hero was completely frank with her. She looked around herself as she again noticed the fanciness and luxury of the place around her. She always wanted her son to be brought up in a place like this with a strong role model he could look up to. But her meager salary and the absence of her ex-husband was something she always saw as a gigantic impassable barrier to that goal. But now, that barrier was shattered by this single offer. But how can you be so nice? You barely even know me or my son and yet, you would welcome us to live with you. She asked after she sat down on her bed and tried to wrap her head around the situation which she was currently facing. I know it's a lot to take in, but I don't need your answer right now. Sleep on it and tell me when you make your decision, just please remember this. The time the three of us spent here, no matter how brief is something I will treasure forever. And with that he left her room and carefully closed the door behind himself after that he made his way back to his own bedroom and collapsed on his bed and hid his blushing face in his arms from the feeling of embarrassment caused by the cheesiness of his own words. That night Inko hardly slept. She was busy thinking about the offer, but more importantly about her own thoughts. Why can't I just say yes? She knew that this was a serious offer, but there are also no strings attached. Yet there was still something, which held her back from accepting a better and easier life for her and for Izuku, yet she couldn't put her finger on it. The man was the manifestation of niceness, but he also made her feel a bit nervous whenever she tried talking to him and he always looked so funny and cute while reasoning with Izuku. Ugh, come on, get yourself together. You are a single mother with a dead-end office job and he's the number one hero. It would never work. She said quietly to herself and flipped over facing away from the window. But he wants us to stay. Reminded her another thought. No, he doesn't. Tashinori is just very polite. After a while and many similar thoughts, she was finally able to reach a dreamless slumber. Unbeknownst to her all might, was just following a train of thoughts thematically very similar to her own as he chased after a flying villain with biology comparable to a parrot through the night. Maybe I came on too strong. If only the damn geezer was any help at all. He took another leap from a random rooftop as his mind drifted to. What a short, bearded master told him three days ago. If you really like her, just put a baby in her and the rest will resolve itself on its own. Those words still made All Might feel uncomfortable. The villain took a sharp turn into an alleyway, nearly losing the large plastic bag with stolen jewelry. This hoverer didn't slow the hero at all. He just turned around in the air, waited for the right moment, until his back was aimed straight at the other flying figure before. New Hampshire smash. He yelled as he punched the air, which propelled him straight at the winged villain. Maybe I should just tell her that I like her. But his mind quickly rejected that thought. When he grabbed the brightly colored criminal by the wing as he sailed past him and sent them both tumbling from the midair straight into a tall hedgerow which stood around rather small hotel, just past the alleyway. Before the birdman could make another escape attempt, Tashinori seized his feet with large sharp black talons, flipped him upside down and began carrying him and the stolen property to the nearest police station whilst ignoring the man's protests and his attempts to assault the number one hero with his beak. With the dangerous situation already over his mind drifted back to the green-haired woman, 
It was not that he was afraid to tell her, just that he had no idea how to tell her. Being a number one hero was great and all, but it hardly left him with any time for relationships. To be honest, the last time he dated someone was back in the middle school before Nana scouted him. Now trying to flirt was like trying to start a car with no wheels and covered in rust which has been also standing in the driveway for 10 years. With the angry parrot delivered to a cage at the police station, All Might adjusted his blue cape and resumed his patrol. The next day, when the hero returned, he spotted a good sign the moment he entered through the balcony. There are no bags or suitcases prepared. Though his optimism was quickly put to the test, when he saw Inko in the living room nursing a cup of tea. She looked very tired and nervous but as soon as she saw him the woman quickly put down her cup and stood up. Hello Tashinori, want some tea? She asked awkwardly and made her way towards the kettle. No, it's okay I am not thirsty. He replied in similar fashion, once again lacking the knowledge what to do with his hands. Come on, pull yourself together. Today you dealt with a man parrot robber, woman with knives in place of her fingers holding a hostage and some weird pervert trying to hypnotize young men women with his pheromones. She's not gonna bite. So, um I have given it some thought and, she started as she put the kettle back down leaving All Might nervous like a teenager on his first ever date. Here comes the rejection. I thought dot 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 well maybe we should try it and see how it goes. I I mean we can always leave whenever we want to write. She swiftly half said half whispered perfectly emulating her inner schoolgirl perfectly and finished the performance with a nervous chuckle. The tall man was happy, relieved and overjoyed by the news, but also panicky because now he didn't know how to respond. So his brain did the weird bad thing only tired brains do. Funny you should say that. Tonight I found a wanted kidnapper who said exactly that to her victims before. Then mid-word he noticed the look she was now giving him and made himself stop. And not that I'm saying that you look like a suspected felon. I just lose my mind because you are so pretty. If before he stepped on a rake, now he put his foot on an active landmine. Both adults froze once the word pretty left Tashinori's mouth and silence enveloped the room. Both just looked at each other awkwardly for a few seconds, until All Might decided to put an end to this weird interaction as quickly as possible. W well that was enough action for one day, I need to get some rest, he announced and quickly made his way into his room. And so Inko was left in the kitchen with a single thought, did that just happen? The situation between the two was awkward for next few days, but luckily Izuku was always somehow able to diffuse the weird atmosphere and soon the two adults started acting normal around each other again. Yet there was something that weighed heavily on the mind of the four-year-old. He still remembered what he said to the scarred boy that night. Let's talk later. It was almost like a promise and he felt bad about the possibility of not being able to keep it, which is why he was now staring at a tourist map, which he had smuggled under his protective suit into the daycare with Ida and Momo. It was useless though, since none of them knew how to read. After this failure his mood even worsened. He couldn't ask his mother for help, because Izuku knew that if she found out about this, she would be very angry and probably even sad and he didn't want to bother All Might either since the hero was very overworked since several big villains started fighting among each other. But then one day, there was a breakthrough in his search. Your grandma's birthday, asked Ida after hearing the news. Yes, we are having a party and dad said, that I can invite you too. She said excitedly which made both boys smile after they exchanged a look and a nod. Sure of course we'll come, Izuku affirmed. The event took place after a few days and it was as snobby and majestic as you can imagine. The three friends still had fun though. Momo's grandmother was a very gentle but energetic old lady and when she met the two boys, each of them ended up with a pinch on the cheek and a piece of very expensive Belgian chocolate. There was even a large trampoline set up behind the house for the children, which they immediately fell in love with. And that's how they spent most of the party, jumping up and down and giggling like there was no tomorrow. That was until Izuku activated his quirk by mistake and made a jump so high, it led him to see over the mansion's hedge and the entire garden. It allowed him to catch a glimpse of the house. He was searching for it just a few blocks away. The next second he fell back down from the sky with a loud crash and a creak from the trampoline. Are you okay? Asked Ada nervously as both him and Momo rushed over to him, but Izuku quickly stood back up, looking perfectly fine. I saw the house, it's this way, the green-haired boy said and excitedly pointed in the direction of the house. His friends were at first skeptical, but when they saw the boy's excitement, they knew that he wasn't making it up. I have to see him, announced Izuku with determination. Ada and Momo exchanged a worried look before turning their attention back at the green-haired boy. Izuku, you can't do that, you would get in so much trouble. Tanya tried to reason with him with little to no success. The shorter boy just flinched for a fraction of a second and then steeled himself. But I really have to, I gave him a promise, declared the boy. But before he could anything stupid the girl spoke up. But if you do that, everyone will look for you and it will ruin grandma's birthday, she pleaded. But this time the boy's determination slowly drained from his face. He suddenly looked extremely disappointed and it almost seemed like he would start crying out of frustration. 
But then an idea appeared in his mind. What if what if I bring him here? He tried again and this time. His friends didn't look so concerned yet the boy with glasses was already preparing to reason with Izuku yet before he could utter a single word. That could work, said Momo. Impossible. You're with him, Hida exclaimed and started accusingly pointing his arms at both of them. Come on, Tenya. It will be fine. Izuku tried to calm his panicking bespectacled friend. No, it won't. They will find out about what we did and then we will end up in the prison for juveniles, where there is no candy. Ada exclaimed, his panic from potentially breaking the rules reaching an entirely different level. So dot 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 will you help us? Asked Izuku as both him and Momo deployed their strongest puppy dog eyes. Ida stared at them defiantly but inside he was slowly beginning to melt. He knew that these two were his only real friends and his brother once said to him that a real hero must never turn his back on a true friend. His firm expression slowly broke down. Fine but if we get grounded, I am holding both how you responsible. He announced pointing his hands at them, which only made both of his friends smile. And so, the group started planning. First, they found an empty paper plate and started drawing on it with crayons from Momo's room. The plan was simple, they would create a fake Izuku, using Momo's quirk and then use the doppelganger to make everyone believe that the boy was still present whilst Midoriya would somehow sneak out and bring back the boy with him so they could hang out like promised. The figurine created out of the upper half of an armless mannequin they found in the attic was hardly convincing. But when armed with a green wig provided by Momo, Izuku's t-shirt and shorts and his face masterfully drawn on it by Ida it could be mistaken for the boy from the right distance. And so they took the abomination into a secluded part of the garden and hid it behind a bush where it was hardly visible while the two actual children made it look as if they were playing hide and seek failing to find the green-haired boy. Said boy was meanwhile furiously trying to find a way to sneak out. The gate of the manor, which belonged to Yeyorazis was currently closed and under surveillance from a single guard. The fence was too high to climb over. This meant that to be successful, he would need to use his quirk somehow. But he had no idea how to jump there and get back with the red and white-haired boy. But his dilemma was answered when he found a big old red rusted wheelbarrow without any wheels and remembered the chair accident. With that thought in mind, he sat into the broken piece of gardening equipment. Now, fly, he shouted and at the same time slapped the rusty metal, yet it remained stationary. Come on, how do I do this? Maybe that breathing. No weight that was supposed to make it stop. Izuku then had an idea to get out of the piece of junk and check if it wasn't stuck to the ground or something and just when he did reach over the edge and touch the soft ground for support, the old piece of trash suddenly flipped right under him and trapped him in a metal cocoon. Feeling scared of the dark he panicked and tried to push the thing up, but the moment his fingertip made contact with the wheelbarrow it took off upside down, straight into the sky without him. He watched in terror as the red shape quickly disappeared in clouds. No, no, no. Get back here. He shouted and made a step back trying to get a better look only to trip over a branch and fall to the ground. Then right when he felt his hand touch the soft grass, the flying object appeared again and this time it was actually coming straight at him with blinding speed and yellowish red trail of fire behind it. Izuku tried to crawl back, but the thing just adjusted its trajectory a remained aimed straight at him and quickly closed the distance. The green-haired boy screamed and put his hands up, trying to protect himself, but the pain didn't come. Instead the still red-hot piece of metal stopped just a foot away from the boy's face and sent a gust of warm air at him. Izuku stared at the object, his green eyes filled with distrust, yet the hovering object was looking just as innocent as when he found it. The boy took a step back and the thing followed. He took a step towards it and it flew away from him. Okay, how do I make this work? He thought as he put his hand on his chin, and the thing slowly rose with his hand. After obtaining this new knowledge, he tried moving his hand down and the wheelbarrow softly touched down. That is so awesome. And then he felt it. It was almost like an invisible thread from his hand connected to the object. Whenever he spun his hand the thing turned to one side or the other whenever he moved his hand forward the thing moved away and so on. He spent about a few minutes experimenting like this until he found out that when he closed his hand into a fist the wheelbarrow stopped responding and when he opened it just a little the piece of metal moved much slower. He knew it was ready for a test drive. Meanwhile at the Todoroki abode, Shoto was recovering from his brutal training by the window. Ever since his eye fully recovered, his dad was pushing him harder than ever. His entire body was screaming at him from exhaustion and he felt the need to lie down and rest. But the boy resisted the urge. He would not let his father defeat him like this ever again. The man in question left just half an hour ago to go on his patrol. The boy with dual quirk closed his eyes for a minute to give them some rest only to open them in shock just a few seconds later as something gently nudged his shoulder. His eyes swiftly focused at the hand and then at the boy connected to it. He nearly fell over when he saw the face framed by green hair looking at him. Izuku, he asked surprised when he came back to his senses. He also noticed the great amount of leaves and small pieces of branches stuck in the short boy's hair. Hello, come outside. 
urged the green-haired boy happily with a small wave as he touched down in the front yard. Shoto rushed outside to see the other boy cough up a few small leaves into his hand, which he quickly threw over his shoulder and focused his attention back on him. Young Todoroki looked the green-haired boy from head to toe, then at the red wheelbarrow and a question appeared in his mind, one which he didn't wait long to share. Are you an alien? He blurted out and earned himself a surprised look. No, I am not, he said defensively, then stopped himself and started muttering something about being an alien and not knowing about it, which quickly made the other boy smile, even though he had a feeling that if he didn't stop him a much more important question would remain unaddressed. Why are you here anyway? If dad finds you here, he will get really mad. Todoroki said as he quickly looked around worried that someone was watching them, even though his older siblings would probably not rat him out the same couldn't be said for the caretaker. I'm here for you, do you want to come play out with us? The green-haired boy asked with a friendly smile on his face. What do you mean? I can't just leave like that. Shoto protested. He felt stunned that the other boy even said something like that. There is a birthday party not far away and I came to invite you. Izuku explained as he shyly offered his hand to help the taller boy into his makeshift airplane. It was not that Shoto didn't celebrate birthdays. They did but it could hardly be called a party. There were a few presents exchanged and each one of his siblings as well as his mom wished him a happy birthday. But that was about it. Hey, don't worry, I will get you back home, I promise. Izuku happily encouraged when he saw his hesitation. Todoroki gave the boy a doubtful look. He was experiencing an extremely weird feeling. Even though he barely even knew the boy, the scarred boy felt as if he could somehow trust him. There was just no malicious intent in his green eyes, just an unnatural amount of excitement. And so, he took the offered hand and stepped in the strange vehicle. Okay, just hold on tight. I don't know how this works. Wait, what do you mean though the question died on his lips when the wheelbarrow swiftly took off? Shoto was holding on for dear life as the object zigzagged through the air. Luckily his quirk allowed him to create a handlebar of ice. A few moments later, Shoto opened his eyes, which he closed when they came face to face with a large tree just a few seconds ago and luckily, they were on the ground, even though that didn't stop his hands from shaking. Why you are crazy? He forced out still shaking like a chihuahua as he left the previously flying object. He then took a look at his pilot which nearly made him laugh, since Izuku was now sporting a large green beard from all the leaves that got stuck to his face during landing. The boys reduced the mess on their clothes and hair as much as possible and began to make their way back to the birthday party. They didn't get very far. Izuku shouted Ida when he saw his friend approaching. He and Momo quickly hurried over to him only come face to face with a boy they had never seen before. Hi guys. Tenya nearly missed his friend's greetings as his eyes narrowed when he saw the boy with a scar. Izuku, you are kidding right? We can bring this guy with us, look at him. The highest of them exclaimed as he swiftly closed the distance between. What's your problem? Asked Shoto clearly affected by what the bespectacled boy said. Yet the boy with blue hair ignored this and walked right up to him. Well if you are not gonna do it, then I have to, said Ita and even though Todoroki wasn't sure about what Tenya was talking, he understood that this guy was looking for a fight and he also knew that after today's training he had no real way to protect himself. It surprised him greatly when the tall boy dropped on his knee and swiftly retied his shoelaces before pulling a hairbrush out of his pocket and fixing his two-colored hair. Okay, all better, Tenya announced, turned around and began walking to the party. He just does that sometimes, Izuku informed Todoroki when he noticed his confusion. Why doesn't he brush your hair? Asked Shoto as they also began walking again. Because his bed hair is unfixable, declared Ida clearly frustrated by the fact. Luckily there were enough children on the party. That no one noticed it when one more was added into the mix and so right after Shoto introduced himself the newly formed quartet was free to play as many games and eat as many sweets as they wanted. This was all completely new for the young Todoroki, but he soon understood that people chasing after him in the game of tag were not trying to attack him or that hide and seek was no secret ploy to get rid of him. For the first time in his short life, he felt truly happy. It was so much fun hanging out with this group of other kids that the entire afternoon passed in the blink of an eye. Izuku honored his promise and just as the guests began to leave, he managed to sneak Shoto back home, this time slightly more skillfully. It was hard to say goodbye to his new friends, but thanks to another promise from the green-haired boy, he was absolutely sure he would meet them again. The situation didn't change too much at the penthouse and the Midoriya family decided to stay for another week. And Ko returned back to her office job since she didn't want to be just a freeloader and after a month both her and Tashinori found enough courage to share their feelings for each other which only grew over time then after another week they began openly dating. Even though there was some media coverage of this, the public soon accepted the fact that the number one hero was no longer single. After half a year Inko even sold her old apartment and after a year the group of roommates began living like a proper family. 
Okay, it's ready everyone say cheese. Announced All Might as he set the camera on the table and hurried at nearly sonic speed to take his place behind the boy and his mother. Cheese. They all said simultaneously as the flash of the camera blinded them. Today was a very special day. One that deserved to be documented as such. It was Izuku's first ever school day. Both his mom and the number one hero spent a lot of time. When they were trying to choose the best possible school for the boy out of the options available to them. It was a school which was not very far. It had many clubs to choose from, a brand new gym, great overall ratings and if that was not enough, the school was in an area where villain activity was nearly non-existent for three years and counting. Past two years were surprisingly uneventful after All Might and the other top heroes stopped the infighting between powerful villains which started after the death of All for One and now the crime rate was at the all-time low. Heroes had much more time for their own lives. The economy was blossoming and people felt much safer. All Might soon found himself with a lot of free time and spent most of it either with Izuku and Inko or making commercials. It especially entertained him when he watched Izuku whilst the little boy got excited over cartoons on the TV. The big man even began to transport the boy into the daycare, which caused major unrest in the facility. The little green-haired boy was under constant fire of questions once the hero left. His friends were shocked that he managed to hold this secret from them, but after an endless chain of teary apologies and a promise to get them both autographs, they forgave him. Shoto was flabbergasted by this news and had no idea how to react to it. Just imagine that one day you find out that the friend with whom you have been spending time for a month lives not only with one of the most famous people on the planet but also your father's rival. Though before Todoroki had any real chance to feel anger, he was presented with an apology and a peace offering in a form of a firecracker popsicle. It wasn't anything unusual for the green-haired boy to bring candy with him when he visited his scarred friend. It took some time, but they perfected the process of sneaking into the house of the number two hero. Once every week Izuku and Ida would visit Momo to play and once there, they would make some sort of distraction, which allowed the shorter of them to pick up Shoto and bring him back with him. It wasn't just an example of perfect planning on Ida's part, but it also allowed Midoriya to train his flight skills. Before, he had a serious problem trying to control even a single flying object, but now he was able to shuffle cards in the air, even if it was still very difficult. The four of them quickly became great friends and the main trio celebrated every birthday together. Tenya soon felt as if he gained two younger brothers and a sister, which he needed to protect from any and all dumb ideas. Momo finally gained test subjects for the makeup products she had appropriated from her mother's stash and Shoto was always so happy to be included in some way no matter what they were doing. For the first time in his life, Izuku knew what it meant to have real friends, which is also why it came as such a shock when he discovered that they wouldn't spend much time together in the future. Like it or not, his friends lived very far apart and if it wasn't for the special daycare they would have never even met each other. Yet there was something that would always keep them together, something stronger than any villain they could ever meet. They all had the same dream to become heroes. So, when their last day together in the daycare finally came to its end they all promised to become the best heroes the world has ever seen. Inko felt like crying for what seemed like the eighth time today as she looked at her son who was all nice and dressed up for the first real big step in his life. Do you have your snacks? She asked worriedly as she checked him over again. Yes mom, let's go. He exclaimed happily as he reached out for her. To take her hand and when he felt her fingers gently wrapped around his tiny ones, he began pulling her to the exit. So cute, thought Tashinori as he took one last picture before putting down his camera. Izuku was so excited to finally go to a school, but not just because he would meet new people, but also due to the fact that the number one hero gave him a special promise. Minus eight months ago. Uncle Tashinori, Uncle Tashinori, can we start today? The green-haired boy shouted for the third time this week dressed in his All Might pajamas as he latched onto the big man's leg the moment. He left his bedroom. Maybe it was the cute nickname or the determination, which was basically radiating off the boy. But the number one hero had a hard time rejecting the boy's advances lately. No, Izuku dot 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 it's too early, he said with a sigh. B but I will try very hard. I want to be as strong as you. Izuku argued enthusiastically. All Might gave the boy a long look contemplating the pros and the cons. But no matter how he looked at it, the boy in front of him was not ready yet. Tell you what, we will start after you start going to school. How does that sound? Pinky promise. Pinky promise. The hero agreed and poked the boy's nose with his pinky. Present. And Co led her son through the buzzing city slowly, teaching him how to safely cross the road. What he should do if a stranger tries to talk to him, how traffic lights work and so on. She did everything to ensure that her Izuku not only gets safely to his school but also that he will soon be able to make his way there without her. It didn't take long for her to find his classroom since there were many other parents here and soon, she found herself standing in front of their goal hand in hand with her son. Are you ready? She asked Izuku as she looked down on him with a warm smile and he in return gave her a small nod and a brave smile before letting go of her hand and entering the classroom. 
This was a very interesting day for little Izuku. His teacher, Miss Taka explained to them how school works, what is recess and what they would learn. The green-haired boy was excited that he would finally be able to read about his favorite heroes in magazines he always stared at when his mom took him to the store for ice cream. On the first day, their teacher took them all outside the classroom, showed them the entire building and after they came back from their tour, each one of them was encouraged to introduce themselves in front of the class and soon, the time for their first recess came. Izuku was happy to get up from the provided tiny chair since he was not used to sitting for so long. There were many new faces all around him and once again he had no idea how to start a conversation with his new classmate. Then he noticed two girls sitting just two seats behind him one of them had hair with green rectangular spots and the other looked rather plain except for the yellow gemstones replacing her eyes. Both of them looked frustrated and hopeless as they wrestled with something small on their desk. Izuku walked over to see what was wrong and in a few seconds he understood that the girls were futilely trying to open two yogurts both of which appeared to be stuck. Once he saw it, Izuku had a brilliant idea how to solve their problem. Hi, want some help? He asked awkwardly as he raised his hand in greetings. Can you open it? The yellow-eyed asked hopefully gesturing to the cup. I, I think so, he said before removing his glove. Izuku focused on his index finger and watched as it elongated and flesh on it transformed into a sharp blade made from bone covered in hard enamel. He swiftly cut a large hole in the top of the cup before setting it back on their desk. His mother sometimes let him help her, when she was cutting vegetables after she got over the initial shock, which she experienced when she first witnessed his ability. He was just about to reach for the second cup but noticed that both girls took a step back and that their faces adopted a completely terrified expression. When he saw this, Izuku himself felt shocked. This emotion only grew when tears of fear appeared in their eyes. Wait, it's okay. He tried to say as he outstretched his glowed hand towards the girl with white hair only to be quickly stopped. Get away from me, monster. One of the girls shouted as they both ran away from the class, trying to find a teacher whilst Izuku just stood there frozen, scared and sad. Soon enough his own eyes filled with tears and the green-haired boy began sobbing. The whole incident was quickly resolved and Miss Taka calmly explained to him that sharp objects shouldn't be used in school without supervision. Yet even though he didn't get into any sort of trouble, Izuku's fate was pretty much sealed. Now everyone in class feared him. Whenever he tried talking to someone, they would either ignore him or avoid him like the plague. For all they knew, he could have it, underneath his bodysuit. Later that day, when Izuku came home with his mother, he already lost all of his excitement over the promised training. All Might quickly noticed this and when he discovered what had happened, he tried to cheer the boy up a bit, yet the hero's words didn't help much. Unfortunately for the boy, this situation only got worse. Words traveled quickly and soon everyone heard about the crying demon of their school. It didn't take long and Izuku became something akin to an attraction. No one really messed with him, yet he felt as if he was always being watched. An entire week went like this, but luckily he was able to meet with friends during the weekend. This improved his mood a bit, but after he returned to school nothing changed. After a few more days Izuku sort of accepted that he wouldn't make any more friends in school. And so he stopped trying. Then Thursday came around. The boy was walking home, it was a beautiful afternoon. The birds were singing, and a few rays of warm sunlight forced themselves through the clouds and so he decided to enjoy the weather for a while longer and chose to walk through a small park, which was relatively close to the penthouse. Today a curious thing happened. His school bag somehow got displaced after the boy left to use the toilet and he only found it after nearly 30 minutes with a help from the janitor on top of a large file cabinet. Come on, show us. Angry words carried by an angry voice suddenly came from the nearby playground. Izuku immediately tensed when he heard that voice. Izuku walked a bit closer to see what was going on. There were three boys in total and he knew only one of them. Two tall boys were standing around one of his classmates not allowing him to leave. He remembered the boy. He was sitting in the back corner of the classroom. He was always very quiet. And no one paid much attention to him. He had purple hair and eyes that always seemed to be tired. Which were right now open wide in panic, trying to find a way to escape. I can't use it, Shinso exclaimed but the boys were undeterred. The bigger one took a step towards the purple-haired boy and threw a punch to his shoulder so strong that the purple-haired boy lost his balance and tripped into a sandpit. Everyone knows you've got a villain's quirk, so show us. The taller of the two ordered angrily as he made a cloud of steam shoot up in the air out of his palm. Why can't you just leave me alone? Shinso thought. Ever since his quirk first manifested in kindergarten everyone was always afraid to speak to him since sometimes people would just freeze randomly when he was talking to them and came into their senses only when he ordered them to. Itoshi was trying his best to avoid talking to everyone, but he slipped when he asked an upperclassman where to find the light switch. There was that weird twitch and in an instant all emotion vanished from the girl's face. Once he woke her up, she ran away scared and told her friends. Shinso was pulled out of his thoughts when he heard in familiar voice yelling. 
Leave him alone. Izuku shouted as he hurried over to them, which grabbed the attention of everyone. Hey Ryuji, look at that, it's the other creep, one of the upperclassmen said. When the green-haired boy stopped in front of them, looks like a kitchai. Now we have the demon and the weirdo, said smiling Ryuji with steam still coming out of his palm in short bursts. Izuku just now noticed that the other one had only one eye with two pupils, which was slightly larger than normal, positioned in the center of his forehead. Both of the upperclassmen had to be at least two years older and taller by more than a head. The green-haired boy was however not affected by these facts as he pushed through them and blocked them from getting into the sandpit. Get out of my way, ordered Ryuji angrily, but the boy didn't move. Don't hurt him or I will stop you. Izuku stuttered and rose his shaking little fists under his chin as a warning, which had little effect. Kichai tried to push the green-haired boy into the sandpit but froze when the solid ground vanished from under his feet and he found himself floating a foot in the air. Once Ryuji saw this, he panicked. Let him go you monster. He yelled and sprayed a cloud of boiling hot water straight at Izuku. The green-haired boy tried to dodge the small blast, even though he knew that there was no chance he would be able to move fast enough. But then, something strange happened. Oh you monster. The words seemingly repeated themselves as the hot blast flew harmlessly past him and softly dispersed in the air. Ryuji prepared another blast and when the younger boy noticed, he acted on instinct. Kichai suddenly fell from the air right on top of his best friend, which made them both end up on the ground. After seeing just how easily Izuku dodged their attacks without moving more than a few inches made them very nervous. But fear really set in when they looked at him and saw the soft purple glow in his eyes. Both quickly scrambled to their feet and ran away like scared little rabbits without another word. Shinso watched the green-haired boy as he quickly turned towards him once the bullies were gone. His eyes were still shining ominously as he reached out his hand. Hitoshi recoiled a bit. He felt scared after seeing the other in a fight, yet there was something gentle, which shone even brighter out of the demon's face. Are you okay? A green-haired boy asked nervously, as he took Shinzo's hand softly into his own gloved one and carefully pulled him up with surprising strength. Yeah, I'm fine. How how did you do that? I thought your quirk was for cutting things. Hitoshi asked still scared a bit of the other boy. Such feelings quickly vanished though, when Izuku's face adopted a small smile. I'm not sure, admitted Izuku after a few seconds of silence. Once the words left his mouth, Shinso couldn't hold back an amused chuckle. Maybe it was the honesty in the demon's voice or the cluelessness on his face, but the situation immediately lost its seriousness. The two of them quickly became friends after this event. It was clear immediately that Izuku didn't ever judge anyone by their quirk. Soon the two of them spent every recess and every meal together. Bullies never dared to mess with the either again and it didn't take long until Izuku invited Hitoshi to hang out with his other three friends. Despite his insomniac appearance Shinso fit right into the group. A few days later Izuku began his training with All Might and it was not an easy task. Tashinori always seemed like a gentle soul, but he was one hell of a trainer. 20 more burpees. The green boy gasped for breath as he was given another order by the number one hero. Do I hear a quitter? All Might asked playfully as he took a sip from his sports bottle, while running at a calm pace on the treadmill. And no, Izuku answered as he quickly dropped to the floor, did a push-up only to jump back up only a second later. Exercise was just a small part of this training though. Tashinori also asked his mother to prepare him meals that were bigger than normal, which was no hard task since she also didn't want her son to remain skinny forever. But a few weeks into the training, his small body began to feel different. He had more stamina than ever and his baby noodle arms began to slowly harden, yet he was still banned from using All Might's quirk, which was a bit frustrating. Over time he adapted to this routine. He was faster, stronger and just a bit more confident, going from his normal I don't know if I can. Attitude into a better I will try. Attitude. To say that Tashinori was proud would be an understatement. Instead of walking, he would run home from school without getting winded or sweaty. It was only Wednesday, and he was running home from school when he saw it. An adorable puff of white and black fur peering at him from an alleyway with big bright blue eyes. He stopped to take a closer look, but the puff immediately turned around and sprinted away on its four legs. Hey, wait up. Izuku yelled and quickly followed the small animal into the alleyway. But it vanished in seconds and he reached a dead end. A ghost. After looking around for a while he became confused and disappointed. But as he got ready to leave, he heard a growl from behind. There just a few feet away from him was a small puppy that looked quite angry. Its coat was white with a large streak of black across its back. It looked like a husky, but much wider, it was not fat per se, just heavy built. Its shining blue eyes were completely focused on the boy. It couldn't be older than three months. The growls were soon accompanied by surprisingly loud barks, which made Izuku take a step back. What do you want, little guy? He asked. But the puppy just wouldn't stop barking and showing its baby teeth. Is this a holdup? Are you hungry, little guy? Izuku asked as he took off his bag and reached for a mostly empty bento box. His mom prepared for him. Even his school lunch portions were increased. 
and he often found himself bringing some of it back home. There were three baby sausages left so he took one and threw it to the small dog, who simply leapt up and caught the piece of meat in the midair, which made the boy smile excitedly. The other two sausages soon had the same fate. After filling its belly, the puppy completely lost all of its aggression, quickly wagged its tail in happiness and Izuku was incited to give the dog a friendly pet. This attempt was happily accepted. After getting its tea and see the dog hurried away, yet the boy somehow knew it wouldn't be the last time he saw this little menace. And lo behold two days later, when Izuku was once again making his way home, the dog appeared yet again and this time it obediently waited for the boy's approach and led him back into the alleyway. This time Izuku was prepared to pay his tribute, but this time the puppy swiftly crawled under a small trash container only to emerge again, just 30 seconds later with something grey in its mouth. Izuku felt very nauseous when he understood just what it was. It was a half-eaten medium-sized rat. The boy felt his stomach twist once he saw the thing and it only worsened once the dog put its prey down and pushed it towards the boy with its nose before sitting down and looking up expectantly. Oh um um, you didn't have to. No, really that's pretty gross. The boy commented nervously once he was faced with this strange offering. Once again out came the bento box with some ham rolls still in it. When the dog understood just how much better they tasted than the mouse, it completely forgot about the dead critter and paid it no mind. When the small creature ended up in the trash, this sort of thing repeated a few more times until one day, the dog didn't stay behind. It walked side by side with the green-haired boy straight into the penthouse and after a bit of pleading from Izuku and a lot of puppy eyes from the little mutt, there was no way that the newly named Hiro was going to stay outside. Good job, team. Ada shouted once the last one of the villains hit the floor defeated. It has been 13 hours since the Valor Squad arrived to the train station, which was completely overrun by villains of all shapes and sizes. They still had no chance though once the elite hero agency showed up. There was their captain, a speedster who can dodge every single attack and deliver a crushing counter before the attacker even knew what happened. The Neo Ingenium. Tanya Ida, the amazingly perfect and perfectly amazing support hero able to provide every possible weapon to any one of her teammates and perfectly skilled in their use herself. The hero of creation, the beautiful, creating, Momo Yerazu. Then there was the absolute powerhouse, the hero able to stop any villain with a single move of his hand. The scarred spirit of frost, which never gives up. The absolute zero, Shoto Todoroki, the always mysterious master of mischief, who can turn his opponents against one another with just a single order with his power to control minds. The hero who won't rest until his target is under his control. The mind bender, Itoshi Shinzo. And lastly there is the secret weapon of the group, the hero, who probably single-handedly keeps the hero memorabilia market in the green numbers. The hero, who can do everything just as his hero name sort of implies. Deku, Izuku Midoriya, perfect job as always, hero squad, said one of the officers as he shook the hand of every member. Let's go for a pizza, Izuku suggested happily, his suit torn to shreds from the furious battle exposing his hard musculature. Lunch was two hours ago, it's not healthy to eat so soon. You will just end up as a fat slob. Ada reacted like a concerned mother, making the entire group laugh. Then he felt it, a cold touch on his neck. Izuku's throat wouldn't move. He wanted to ask for their help, but he couldn't move. He reached for his neck and couldn't find any source of the cold, but it was quickly spreading down to his collarbone and then to his breast. He saw his team talking, yet he was unable to hear what they were saying. He felt like screaming but his voice wouldn't leave his lips even when the cold feeling spread to his belly. Izuku tried to wave his hands, kick and run, just to get rid of that feeling but they were as heavy as Lee. Suddenly he woke up. He was in his room surrounded from all sides by countless hero posters. Over the last two years, his room went through some serious changes. Walls, which were previously occupied only by All Might now housed posters and figures of many different heroes. It was a change, which Tashinori greatly appreciated even though the life-sized paper replica of himself in the corner still creeped him out a bit and he more than once proposed that they should use it as an impromptu obstacle when Izuku was learning to ride a bicycle since all such obstacles quickly ended as trash. But it made the boy happy and so he chose to tolerate the fomite. Izuku quickly looked around, trying to find the reason why his dream was ruined and soon he realized that his blanket was gone and it didn't take him long to notice, that his precious Hiro held it in his mouth with a pleased smug look on his face. In these two years which they have spent together the mutt has grown at least four times its original size and now it was heavier than Izuku. When they took Hiro to the vet, to get him every vaccine he needed, the doctor told them that from the looks of it Hiro was some kind of a special mix of at least three different breeds. He had the fur and color of a Siberian husky and the body type of the Alaskai Malamut but his size was still way too massive for either of those breeds. The vet even told them on one of their visits, that at first it looked like someone had taken a very fuzzy wolf and painted him black and white. 
Yet neither the dog's large paws nor teeth were enough for the family to see him as anything else than a big warm fuzzy marshmallow. He accepted his role as the boy's bodyguard very quickly, sleeping and eating with Izuku as well as following him around wherever he went. It also became very clear that Hiro was extremely smart. For example, he would do any trick you wanted, but only if you had a treat in your hand, because if not he would play dead for up to half an hour until you left him alone. But he could be also energetic, just like right now. Why do you have to do this whenever I'm having a nice dream? The boy asked and threw his pillow at the fuzzy giant, who was still holding his blanket just out of his reach and the dog's smile only got wider. It was time for their morning run. The husky blood in Hiro's body was boiling and he absolutely loved going for a run around the neighborhood. They would go three times a day, right after Izuku woke up and had a breakfast. When he came home from school and right before dinner, Toshinori was very supportive, since he knew that boy of Izuku's age would not put on any serious musculature until his puberty started. But if he improved his stamina, it would be much easier once he was ready for it and his mom was okay with it as long as he brought his phone with him. It was a nice calm morning and some of the brighter stars were still visible on the sky next to the rising sun. It must have rained the night before, because the grass was covered with silver little droplets of water, which moistened Izuku's shoes and Hiro's paws as they ran at full speed. They must have already reached their 5km mark, because the boy was having trouble catching his breath. There were already people on the streets, some of them commuting to work, some of them shopping and then there were few jogging just like the boy. Izuku gave in to his fatigue and stopped for a few seconds to calm his lungs and heart. That's when someone gently touched his shoulder. This surprised the boy so much, he swiftly turned around and shrugged the hand in the process. When Hiro saw this reaction, he gave the stranger a threatening growl. Izuku didn't recognize the boy, but from his height, he judged that he had to be at least a year older than him. The boy had medium-sized messy indigo hair which nearly covered his most prominent feature. His ears reminded the younger boy of a movie he saw with All Might and his mom a few weeks ago about some fantasy world with blonde tall people called elves running through the trees. The stranger looked both scared and nervous at the same time, but he stood still on his wobbly legs before looking at his feet and muttering something under his breath. Can you dot 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 help me? Unbeknownst to either of the two runners, this boy was moping around this street and trying to find enough courage to talk to an adult for nearly 10 minutes already. But his unbelievable shyness and critically low self-esteem prevented him from speaking to anyone. He felt like such a failure but then he saw this boy and summoned just enough courage to talk to him. What do you need? Izuku asked quickly. When he saw the panicked expression on the other's face, which apparently surprised the boy with purple hair a lot as he snapped his head back up to face both of them yet again. Why my friend he's, I'll show you, the boy with elven ears said and then bolted into a nearby alleyway. Now it was Izuku's turn to feel surprised, but after a quick look at his dog, they both hurried after him. It didn't take long for them to catch up to him. He was standing next to a pile of clothes on the ground and breathing heavily. Izuku was about to ask, what was wrong? But the boy was swiftly interrupted by a cheerful voice. Hey, is anyone out there? Tamaki, the energetic voice asked, scaring the younger boy who quickly looked around trying to find its source, without any success, but the other boy quickly dropped down on all fours next to a storm drain manhole. It's okay Mirio, I bring some help. The shy boy answered trying to calm his friend. Whoever you are, run away before you end up in here too. We don't have time for your jokes Mirio, we will be late for school, answered Tamaki angrily. There was a giggle from the storm drain. Izuku was dumbfounded by seeing someone make such a bad joke when they are in such a bad situation. Are you okay? The green-haired boy asked in panic as he too got closer to the manhole cover. Oh, I'm just dandy, a bit wet, but I'll manage. Could you maybe get that cover off so I can get out? The voice requested hopefully without a hint of sarcasm. Sure, just stay back. Izuku took a step back before he outstretched his arm and slowly began to rise it toward the sky, while concentrating completely at the heavy piece of metal that began peacefully ascending. He nearly lost his concentration when he saw the guy's nude body emerge from the hole. Tamaki blushed a bit before quickly turning away from his blonde friend and facing a wall. Mirio, he said with a clearly embarrassed tone. Oh yeah, right. Sorry Tamaki. Mirio quickly apologized as he pulled a pair of boxers from the pile and put them back on. You don't need to be so weird about it though. We are all dudes here after all. He added with a relaxed smile on his face. Right after that, his gaze shifted to Izuku who carefully set the cover back into place with his power. Hi, you must be the one who saved me. Tagata said happily and took a few steps to shake the boy's hand only to be stopped by a very angry-looking dog. Hiro was blocking Tagata's path with his fangs on full display and loudly growling. Hiro stop it, Izuku ordered, but the mutt didn't back down one bit. There wasn't a hint of fear on the blonde boy's face or in his weird eyes. Mirio only got on the eye level with the almost wolf and extended his hand slowly to him. Well, aren't you just the cutest doggo? 
Tagata praised, then petted the creature's head and gave it a quick scratch. With that Hiro turned back into a marshmallow and allowed the stranger to proceed to his master. Well anyway, name's Mirio Tagata and that bag of nerves over there is Tamaki. Hey, the boy with elfish ears protested. Izuku Midoriya. The boy said with a smile as he accepted Tagata's hand and gave it a shake. Then a thought crossed his mind. The manhole was covered when he came here. How did you get stuck in there anyway? He asked and took a confused look at the hole in the ground. Well you see, minus 15 minutes ago. Hey Tamaki, watch this. Mirio said excitedly as his hand passed through his textbook. He has been practicing this for more than a week now but seeing the look of amazement on his friend's face was always worth it. Isn't that totally awesome? You are so cool, Mirio. His friend praised him before his smile fell when a random gust wind carried away Tagata's shirt. Apparently Mirio used his quirk on his entire torso and the poor piece of clothing had nothing to hold on. Hey, Mirio shouted and both him and Tamaki ran after the escaping garment. They both watched as the shirt flapped around in the wind wildly and quickly gave chase. Phew, that was close. I mean, what are the chances right? Said Tagata once he snatched the fleeing shirt out of the air just as it was about to land in an open dumpster in an alleyway. He hastily began to put it back on, while his friend patiently waited. Hurry up Mirio, someone might come here and... But he was interrupted, when he heard the worst noise you can possibly hear, when you are around the blonde boy. A sneeze. The scientists around the world called this the IQA effect or involuntary quirk activation effect. It was something discovered by a renowned quirk specialist in the US by the name Michael Wagner. Basically, certain quirks had the potential to be activated by reflex actions such as yawning, choking or like in Mirio's case, sneezing. However, this time there was no sound of Tagata's bare feet hitting the ground or a gasp of someone witnessing this. This time there was only a loud splash and when Tamaki turned around, he found only a pile of clothes next to a manhole. He quickly put two and two together and after he checked if his friend was okay, he ran away in attempt to find some help because he knew that there was no way he would be able to free his friend by himself. Right now, pretty unlucky, right? Mirio said as he finished his story, which he told while dressing himself. Tamaki was meanwhile getting nervous and kept glancing on his watch and when his now fully clothed friend noticed this, he took one look on his phone and his eyes widened in horror. Oh crap, we have to hurry. Sorry little guy. I know I owe you one and I hate to cut this short, but we need to go. Tagata exclaimed in panic and after he grabbed his friend's arm, he ran as fast as his legs carried him dragging Tamaki behind him. Izuku was a bit confused by them, but it also reminded him that he should probably head home before his mother got scared and so both he and his dog also hurried back to the penthouse. He didn't realize it then, but this small incident lit a small spark within his very soul, a spark which would slowly grow into an enormous flame. Both his mom and the number one hero were very proud of him when he told them about what had transpired. They had no reason not to trust the boy since neither of them could even remember the last time the boy told a lie and so they celebrated this event with a pizza for dinner. And that night Izuku went to bed with an unhealthily full stomach and exciting story for his friends. A few days later, Smash, All Might said firmly as he threw a weak punch into the large sandbag making it shake. Smash, Izuku yelled and copied Toshinori's action as best as he could. No, no, no. First you need to use your leg. The big man demonstrated by taking a heavy step forward. Dot 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 then transfer that power through your hip. He twisted his hip with the step. Dot 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 and finally send that power to your fist through your shoulder. The hero finished as he slowly drove his fist into the back. Izuku nodded and tried again. Foot dot 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 hip dot 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 shoulder dot 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 fist. The boy said to remind himself as he threw the newly improved punch. He could already feel the positive difference in strength. Great, now let's try. But before the hero could finish his sentence there was a huge crash, which was followed by a low rumble. The room shook a little and lights flickered. All might first assume that it was an earthquake, but then the sirens in the streets came on. The tension calling all nearby heroes and emergency services. This is not a practice. Izuku heard this once before, when his school was doing a fire drill. But it was mostly fun, since all of them got a chance to use a real gas mask and one of the firemen teaching them even filled some parts of the building with harmless white smoke. This however was completely different. There were no laughing and yelling children, happy that their lessons have ended earlier. It was as if the entire world came to a stop. All Might hurried out of the small exercise area followed closely by the boy and when he entered the living room, he quickly noticed that the television and co was watching just a moment ago was now showing only emergency broadcast. This is something big and bad. Toshinori didn't need to think about it for too long. All he had to do was to look out the window. There, just six blocks away a giant wall of fire and flame was slowly growing from the ground and challenging the night sky. Oh my god. Inko gasped when she saw the immense destruction so close and slowly getting closer. Once All Might noticed this look of fear on her face, 
He gave her an encouraging smile before gently putting his hand on her shoulder. Hey, don't worry, I will take care of it. He announced confidently before he opened the large window and leapt through it towards the chaos and destruction before him. Inko watched him until his form disappeared in the grey smoke, but now her face was also adorned by a soft smile. Yeah, everything will be fine. She thought to herself before she pulled up a chair next to the window and watched the flames dance for a while. Minus two days later. We still have no evidence which would suggest whether the gas explosion was caused by an accident or intentionally. The damage costs caused by the fire exceeded 600 million yen by some estimations, but luckily thanks to heroes who showed at the scene, almost all people were quickly evacuated, some of which suffered minor injuries and problems caused by smoke inhalation. In other news, the University of Tokyo Hospital was ransacked by a gang of the voice of the reporter stopped when the TV suddenly shut down, making its sole watcher sigh. That was very rude. Those simpletons could at least let me finish watching that, the man said with frustration in his voice as he got up from his small, ugly yet surprisingly comfortable sofa. He walked past a small table with a mountain of papers on it. They were mostly just unpaid bills and angry letters. The man didn't pay the heap any mind and instead walked straight into the kitchen where he grabbed his thermos and his wallet with only a few of wrinkled bills still inside. He left the apartment just a few minutes later after he checked his silver mustache in the mirror and headed for a place, which he has been observing for three days already. It was a small jewelry store on a street that had a small football field opposing it which meant that there was a great opportunity for a quick getaway if he used his quirk to his full advantage. It was also the end of the month, which pretty much meant that the cash register would be full. The plan was simple, go in there, take the money and maybe some jewelry, get out and run away across the grassy field before turning it into a giant trampoline, which would guarantee that no one would be able to follow him. Hardly a spectacular start to his criminal career, but everyone has to start somewhere right. Danjuro watched as customers left the store one by one. There was actually a reason why he chose this shop. A few years back he visited this very establishment himself wanting to buy a ring to improve his appearance, but the store's prices were so ludicrous he had to rethink his decision. However just a few days later he found the same products being offered at third the price in a large mall. Therefore, he saw the shop owner as a cheating scoundrel in need of some financial punishment. He took a seat on a nearby bench, opened his thermos, but stopped just as he was about to pour himself a cup of Earl Grey. Suddenly an image flashed in his head. He remembered one very enjoyable chapter of a book, which he had recently read. The chapter depicted fictional villains in vaudevillian era and their often bizarre theatrics. At that moment Danjuro felt an abrupt surge of inspiration, stood up and began to pour his tea from incredible height into the cup in his hand. Blast, gotta work on that. His mad grin swiftly disappeared once the scalding tea mixture made contact with a rather sensitive part of his wrist. He brought his hand up to inspect the damage, but luckily neither his skin nor the fairly expensive black coat he used most of his last money on were relatively unscathed. He was never really good at managing money if the angry note from his landlord currently hanging on his door was any proof, yet it wasn't all his fault. Just three weeks ago he landed a job a cleaner at the newly created branch of some company that produced chemicals only for the entire thing to blow up and the company to declare bankruptcy just a few days ago, which left him and many others without a paycheck. Tabida took one last look at the store and his smile returned once he saw that there was only one customer left. And so, the white-haired man took a sip of his drink, fastened his thermos and headed towards his target. Bam! Next thing he knew there were some distorted voices talking somewhere nearby to him and they all had one thing in common, panic. He then felt a hand on his neck. He's dead, Shinso announced calmly as he looked at Ida. Stop joking Hitoshi, you will give Tenya a heart attack. Momo warned as she looked at her bespectacled friend, who was watching the scene in horror and whispering something to himself about going to jail. Izuku was meanwhile trying to remember the what he was supposed to do when you find an injured person and Shoto was wordlessly creating a makeshift ice pack from his own ice and a handkerchief. Danjuro opened his eyes and blinked a few times trying to get the fuzziness out of them. Very soon his vision slowly gained focus and he saw about 15 dot 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 and oh wait 10 people around. That number then shifted to 5 in a few seconds with the figures gradually merging. Sir are you okay? Asked Tenya when he saw the tall man sit up. The boy was feeling extremely guilty. They were playing soccer on a nearby field with Shinso as the referee. They were lucky today since Endeavor had to make a last minute appearance at some court hearing as a witness. So Shoto had the entire day for himself. The teams were him and Izuku against Momo and Tenya. It was a tight battle with a score of 3 to 3. Seriously, who knew that the black-haired girl would be this good at defending the goal net? Well, either way, the things were getting more and more heated, until suddenly the bespectacled boy stole the ball from Todoroki and ran with it towards Izuku who was doing his best as the goalie. Just as he got close to the shorter defender, he made a feint, which worked like a charm and Ida watched the green-haired boy leap forward to catch the ball only to be sidestepped. 
When Tenya saw the free net in front of him and heard Yeyarazu shout in support he felt the energy surge through his body dot 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 and he accidentally activated his engine. When he kicked the ball at maximum speed and power it didn't just stop in the net, instead it broke straight through and continued into a nearby street. They went to go search for it only to find it resting next to an elderly man's limp body. The man in question didn't answer, he just looked at each of them with confusion. Tabaida's ears were ringing and every noise sounded like he was underwater. Izuku, call an ambulance I think he has a concussion. Momo said before she started waving her hand in front of Denjiro's face. Yeah, you're right. The boy pulled out his phone only to adopt a look of dismay. Oh no, my battery's done. He announced in panic. That's because you have to download every All Might app, even though you have the real one at home. Shinzo said with frustration in his voice as he also took out his phone. Hey, it's not my fault. You know that villain smash is a thing of beauty. Izuku argued just as Shouto put the ice back on Tabaida's forehead. Ugh dot 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 my head dot 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 what happened? The mouse-dashed man asked as he carefully touched his temple. Everything was still a bit fuzzy, but it was slowly getting better. What is going on here? Asked a new voice and the group looked in its direction only to find a petite older man with grey spots in his hair. I it's my fault, sir. I kicked the ball too hard and it hit him. He had said while avoiding eye contact with the person. The old man just smiled a bit, before giving the boy with glasses a pat on the head and walking over to the disoriented man. The stranger gently tilted Tabida's head upwards. Okay lad, just follow my finger with your eyes. He said as he slowly moved his hand through the air and after a while let out a relieved sight. He's okay, it ain't even a concussion, he just got popped a bit. Let's get you up, mate. The old man said as he pulled the taller man to his feet. Shouldn't I call the ambulance? It was a hard hit. Shinzo asked with phone still in his hand, but the stranger just smiled. Don't you worry sonny. I was a boxer for a few years after high school and I know when someone's just a bit punch drunk. He said before throwing a few sharp jabs into the air for demonstration. Danjuro was still a bit confused, but after a few seconds with the ice back the fuzziness completely disappeared and was replaced by complete clarity. He's right, I already feel fine. Though be a bit more careful with your entertainment, lad. Kabaita said as he snook a glance at his previous target, only to find that the store was still open with only the owner still inside. Yes, sir, Ada said energetically but his words were nearly unregistered as the man stumbled towards the street. Don't worry, I will keep an eye on him. The lot of you should probably head home before your parents start to get worried. The old man told the children when he saw their worried looks, before he followed the mustached man leaving the scene. Tom Eider repeated his plan a few times in his head as he approached the store. Get in, get the money, get out, field, trampoline. Get in, get the money, get out, field, trampoline. Get in, get the money, get out. But his thoughts were interrupted by the old man's voice. Oh, are you planning on buying something from all Kyoshi's shop? He will be happy to hear that, since those bootlegs of his work appeared, he's been struggling. Yeah, I just thought. Wait a second, bootlegs. Yep, some bootleggers started copying and selling cheap knockoffs of his work a few years back. The poor guy almost had to close his business. A sudden wave of guilt gripped Denjiro's heart. This was not a justified crime in any way shape or form and besides robbing a victim of a crime, would never bring him fame only infamy. Well, it's quite late. Maybe I will wait till tomorrow before I visit this fine establishment. Could you perhaps point me towards the closest station? It was an improvisation, but he wanted to get rid of this old man without offending him too much. Oh, that's just around the corner that away. Want me to show you? The stranger asked after pointing towards the end of the street. No, that will be okay, thank you. Tabaita said and gave the man a small elegant bow before turning around and walking away. The old guy was a bit surprised by the dramatic gesture but wrote it of as being a result of that small head injury. After he gained some distance and made sure that he was not being followed Denjiro relaxed a bit. Well, back to the drawing board. He thought, the soon-to-be villain spent a few days on this plan and it was hard to let it go just like that. But there was no way he would be able to go through with it now, his consciousness was screaming at him. Then he heard those gunshots. A few days later, Hey Izuku, the purple-haired boy began. Hi, what's up Shinzo? Midori asked with a smile when he saw his friend's weird look. Look at this. Doesn't this remind you of someone? Shinzo said as he passed his phone to Izuku. There was an arrow icon, which indicated a video. And so the boy hit play. The shaky footage showed someone running after a large man with quick heavy breaths. Stop, you rascal. The man holding the camera yelled. Suddenly the footage shifted and turned into a darkness as the phone was put into a pocket. There were a few gunshots and weird noises before a scream came. The footage shifted yet again and this time it showed the big man on the ground, presumably unconscious in a back street. Ha ha ha, I got you. The camera was turned around, until it showed a familiar mustached face with a toothy smile. Then there was the weird sound again somewhere off screen and the man made eye contact with the camera. Worry not viewers, this scoundrel will give no more trouble, for I have captured him. And who am I? 
I am a man inspired by the legendary noble vigilantes of the past, not unlike the heroic outlaw Robin Hood himself, neither a villain nor a hero. You may call me gentle criminal and I bid you adieu. The man finished his cheerful and energetic introduction and after a short pause, where he was likely trying to find out how to turn of the camera, the recording ended. Isn't that? Yeah it's the guy Ida knocked out. Meanwhile Gentle was sitting at home, enjoying a cup of green tea and watching as his video slowly went more and more viral. It was even deleted a few times, since vigilantism was illegal. But there was always someone who would reload it on Yap. Tube. Who would have guessed that there was someone planning to do the exact same thing at the exact same day as him. Luckily the elderly owner wasn't hurt during the robbery and Tabida managed to trap the criminal under a few layers of elasticized air after knocking him out. The criminal's gun had little effect on his air shield. He even scored a bit of cash out of the villain's take, which he promptly used to pay off most of his debts and paid rent. He felt bad about taking some of the money, but tea leaves sadly don't grow on trees. With that, gentle criminal relaxed a bit and watched as both his celebrity career and a brand new nightmare for police precincts began. One month later, all right, you can do this, All Might said to himself for what felt like the hundredth time this day. He has been postponing this for a month now. It's surprisingly easy to find a reason for not doing something. Two weeks ago, he was forced to chicken out because of a black cat crossed his road. When he was out on patrol, Tashinori was never superstitious. However, if there was even a small chance that this wouldn't go just as planned, he would not take it. But today, today was simply perfect. The sun was slowly beginning to hide behind the horizon and its dying rays were setting the sky on fire with a beautiful shade of orange. His today score was seven villains and seven criminals, a lucky number for him. Both were good signs, yet he still felt nervous. Then an idea struck him out of nowhere. But that he quickly got rid of his civilian clothes and put on his new hero costume, which just came from development. Even though it felt weird to wear a costume without a cape, he had no problem seeing the practicality of it. Just a few months back his cape got stuck in the door to an elevator, which led to a rather embarrassing situation and Tashinori knew that it was time for a change. This new uniform made from mostly blue fabric gave him the bonus confidence, which he so desperately needed. And so after taking a calming breath, he opened the door of his room and headed for the living room. Inko was a bit surprised to see him in his hero suit at home, since she knew that he usually got rid of it as soon as he returned from work. Is that the new costume? Oh my, is there an emergency? She asked as she closed the book. She was reading just a minute ago and set it down on the coffee table before standing up from an armchair. Her confusion only deepened when Tashinori, instead of heading for the balcony window like he usually did, stopped in front of her. Well, you could say that. All Might softly responded as he slowly took the knee. If the green-haired woman's expression was anything to go by, she wasn't expecting this at all. Neither was she expecting him to pull out a white card out of his shoe and begin reading it. Inko, ever since I first met you, you and Izuku have been a blessing for me. I never truly felt the things I feel now whenever you two are around me and now it's not something I can even imagine living without. There are times when I feel that I don't deserve any of this, but one thing I know for sure is that I love you both unconditionally and totally. Which is why I am here right now with the need to ask you this one seemingly simple question. He spoke slowly with a soft voice which seemed almost unnatural for someone of his massive stature. Inko covered her mouth with both of her hands and small silvery tears of happiness slowly filled her eyes when she saw the giant man drop the card on the floor and reach into his pocket only to bring out a small dark red velvet box a second later. Inko Midoriya dot 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 will you marry me and become my hero for life? When those few words left his mouth, Tashinori opened the box revealing a simple golden ring. In all of his years of being a pro hero which were filled with suspense, danger and fear, there were several moments during which the number one hero felt as if the time slowed to a crawl. Yet this one moment, where there was no danger around to be found somehow felt even longer than all of them combined. Inko was overwhelmed by emotions but she also somehow managed to stay calm enough to shakily lower one of her hands and give the blonde man an answer that would surely influence the rest of both their lives. Why yes, of course, I will. All Might's wedding surprisingly wasn't a big televised event as some might have expected. In fact, it was a very small private ceremony with only a few friends present as witnesses. Yet somehow, mysteriously a few photos of All Might in his black classy tuxedo found themselves on the internet which led to a wave of classy All Might memes. Some of the popular captions included, My name is Might, All Might, and when mom gives you your grape juice in a wine glass. For Inko it was probably one of the best days in her life second only to the day when her son was born. That day, she even received a very special gift in a form of a wedding dress, which was handcrafted by All Might's former psychic David Shield, who made absolutely sure that it would not only be nigh indestructible but also elegant and beautiful. Luckily the whole thing went without a hitch and to top it off the cooks prepared an absolutely perfect feast for everyone. 
Toshinori had a chance to mingle with some of Inko's friends from work and she and Izuku both had a chance to meet some of the most famous heroes Japan had to offer. After the wedding Izuku had a difficult time calling Toshinori dad or stepdad since he never really got used to using that word and so he settled for All Might, which the hero had no problem with. All Might saw the wedding as the best moment of his life. He finally officially had a loving family of his own, a beautiful wife and a bright young boy who was becoming braver and braver with each passing day. The significance of that event was however dwarfed just two months later when he found out that Inko was pregnant. Let me just say soon-to-be fathers can get a little crazy and that it's completely normal. But even considering that, Tashinori went a bit overboard. For one, he forbade Inko from lifting anything heavier than four pounds and even employed Izuku to keep an eye on her. During the event only known as the Great Sandpaper Incident he smoothened every potentially dangerous sharp edge in the penthouse and then ordered a cleaning service to clean up every single particle of sawdust he created in the process. He bought and installed three safety gates when Inko was in her second trimester as if afraid that the baby would just suddenly jump out of her and head for the balcony. This action annoyed Hiro so much he nearly bit the hero when the big man tried to install a fourth one in the hallway leading to Izuku's room. The amount of diapers and toys he bought in advance led some people to believe that he already had at least five secret children all over Japan and nearly earned him a record of money spent on baby products. But by far, the funniest was his effort to educate himself on anything and everything he could about child raising and baby diseases after which he reached the belief that the baby would come out with a very rare and horrific organ deformity that only appeared twice in Japan's history after he noticed that his wife's hands were a bit sweaty after she came home from an aerobic session. At this point his books were confiscated and then burned by Gran Torino, when he came for a visit and found his former student on a phone trying to find a doctor willing to perform an examination for this exact type of a disease. Yet, when the big day finally came, he was somehow still extremely unprepared. I am here to serve justice, the number one hero announced as he kicked down the door to an old warehouse. There were more than eight villains present and each one of them was clearly terrified at the sight of the giant man. The building is surrounded by police officers. This is over. Surrender. All Might said with a brave smile as he took a step inside. A dense silence filled the building and its occupants quickly armed themselves, trying to prepare for a fight that would soon follow. But they were quickly interrupted by an unexpected noise. A phone call is here. A phone call is here. Tashinori's voice suddenly proclaimed and the hero swiftly reached into his pocket to pull out a cell phone. Hello? Oh hi Izuku. What? Hey don't ignore me. One of the villains with appearance similar to a gorilla yelled and jumped forward to deliver a massive blow into the hero's midsection. Normally his punch was strong enough to rip through concrete with ease. But All Might didn't even flinch, he just erected a single finger to his lips in a shush gesture. After seeing this take place, the other villains stared at the number one hero in horror and none of them dared to make a move to attack or escape. The towering man was however completely focused on the phone call at times even nodding to what was said to him. Oh okay I will be there as soon as possible. He promised after a few minutes and ended the call. He carefully put his phone away and turned to the people in the warehouse. Listen up, my wife is giving birth and I don't have time for this, so I will give you a choice. He paused for a second to make sure that everyone was paying attention. You can either drop any and all weapons you have and walk outside, where you will be arrested by the police or you can attack me right now and see what happens when I don't pull any of my punches. You have 10 seconds to decide, use them wisely, All Might said with an intimidating voice. That brought fear to their very hearts and left them with a single thought. How did he get so terrifying? That day Tashinori set the new record for most peaceful villain arrests performed in one day and spent the rest of the day pacing nervously in front of the maternity ward. After many long hours of waiting and thinking about the worst possible things that could happen, the giant man was approached by a doctor dressed in a green surgical gown. Mr. Yagi, how is Inko? Is the baby okay? All Might quickly asked trying his best to not enter the full panic mode. The much smaller woman let out a squeak after being startled like that, but quickly composed herself when she saw just how scared the man known for his bravery and kindness looked. They are both fine. You have a healthy daughter, she said with a small kind smile on her face. After more than 10 years of this job she has seen every possible reaction to both bad and good news, but All Might still somehow managed to surprise her. Tashinori stood there frozen in place. After learning so much about diseases and complications associated with childbirth it never once occurred to him that there was even a possibility that everything could turn out perfectly fine. His face soon adopted a big dumb manic smile from ear to ear. Oh my goodness yes. Yes. Thank you so much. He yelled as he grabbed the small woman by her shoulders and gave her a hug which lifted the doctor off the ground like a ragdoll. Mr. Yagi. This is a hospital. She whispered angrily. So sorry. Can I see her? The doctor sighed and led the hero to his wife's room. When he entered the door, the beautiful scene he saw there was forever engraved into his very soul. 
he saw Enko there, tired, her hair wet and sweaty, holding a small pink bundle in her arms, smiling at it with affection. With a smile he carefully and breathlessly approached her bed to get a closer look at their little creation. When he first laid his eyes on the small defenseless being that was his daughter, his head had great trouble trying to distinguish the emotions he felt and the only word that appeared in his mind soon left his lips as a few tears of happiness escaped his eyes in this moment of absolute joy. Perfect. She's just so perfect. He uttered softly trying to avoid startling the little girl whose beautiful emerald eyes seemed so focused on him. He then focused his soft gaze back to the mother of his two children and tried to put into words just how grateful he was for her to be part of his life. And like that Mayumi was brought into this world. At that time, she weighed only a little over 3 kilograms and measured no more than 51 centimeters. The few hairs on her otherwise smooth head quickly multiplied and before she was 4 months old, her golden blonde locks needed a haircut. Once Hiro was allowed to smell the baby, the almost husky immediately felt affection for the little princess. He could be sometimes seen under her cradle ready to protect the baby against anyone even a bit suspicious. But if there was anyone who truly fell in love with Mayumi, it was her brother. He always made time to play with her and to keep her company whenever their parents weren't home. He even showed her pictures to anyone who was willing to look at them. Ever since Izuku's last year in elementary school his puberty began and with his extreme workout routine and healthy yet protein-oriented diet his body slowly began to gain weight which was quickly converted into muscle mass. At just 12 years of age he was already almost as tall as his mother. Though both Tenya and Momo had a few inches on him, he was slowly gaining on them. His strength also quickly increased, which is something All Might noticed, yet it was still unbelievable that the weak little boy, who started unable to do a single push-up, was now able to do ten pull-ups with one hand. He was obviously very proud of him, but there was a deep worry hidden under that pride. Was the boy really suited to become his successor? Questions like this one plagued his mind daily. There was no problem with Izuku's determination. Not after the grueling training he went through every day, nor was there a problem with bravery. The kid basically taught himself how to fly and there are not many things braver than to conquer the unknown by yourself. Though there was something much worse. The boy's nature. All Might soon noticed that Izuku was just too gentle for his own good, which was a massive red flag for the number one hero. Heroes and police officers die quite often during their service and mostly it's people who are just like his son. Cops who hesitate with their finger on the trigger when they see a crazed gunman. Heroes who risk their life trying to save just that one last person from a raging inferno. Gentle idealists who bite way too much to chew whilst trying to do good in the world. Toshinori knew that there was only one way to protect Izuku from the same thing. Training. But first he would need to do one thing. It was a cold late autumn afternoon. The sun was already beginning to set and both the number one hero and Izuku found themselves standing in front of a large cemetery. What did you want to show me, All Might? Izuku asked as they began walking through the big area covered by flowers and gravestones both new and old. All Might was acting very strange today. He even wore his yellow stripped business suit, which was saved only for special occasions and had an entire bouquet of flowers with him. There is someone I want you to meet. Izuku, Tashinori said calmly when they passed through a large gate. This er looked much more well kept than the rest of the cemetery. There were flowers and lit candles everywhere. Izuku stopped once he noticed a photo. Proudly displayed on one of the resting sites. Is that Vulcanus? He asked as he recognized the thin man's old smiling face in the picture. He remembered the hero from an old documentary. He looked at the next grave and sure enough there was another hero he could still faintly remember. Yes, there are many great heroes resting here. The number on hero announced and gestured towards the rows and rows of small stone monuments. They walked calmly in silence with the boy eyeing every photo and trying to recognize more famous heroes. It didn't take long for them to find what Tashinori was looking for. It was a small grave just on the edge of the cemetery littered by a few dried up leaves from a nearby maple tree which the big man gently brushed away and placed the flowers into a nearby vase. Izuku didn't recognize the woman depicted in the picture next to the grave and her name didn't ring any bells either. But before he had a chance to ask, All Might spoke. This is the person who taught me everything about being a hero. All Might's teacher. The boy said more to himself as he stared at the gravestone with a newfound respect. Indeed, she was a great hero. Tashinori sighed sadly as his mind served him a fresh serving of nostalgia. Somewhere deep inside he missed all those ass whoopings he received during his training. But much more so the kind words of his teacher. Even when he was bloody with cracked bones and exhausted to a point where he felt as if he was going to die, Nana was always there to motivate him with her kind words and in the end she even gave her own life just to give him a fighting chance. The number one hero saw her as one of the bravest people that ever lived. I am sorry. Izuku blurted out without a thought, leaving All Might a bit confused. What's wrong? The hero asked as he reassuringly put his hand on Izuku's shoulder. It's just sad that she's gone. I would have loved to meet her. Tashinori gave the boy a gentle pat on his back before stepping away. 
It's okay. But that's exactly why we are here today. Huh. What do you mean, All Might? The number one hero slowly motioned with his hands towards the rest of Cemetery. Take a look around. There are hundreds of heroes buried here and most of them are already forgotten. Soon there will be many more among them and one day, even I will end up here somewhere. And no that won't happen. You are the best hero ever. Izuku argued making Tashinori smile a bit at the boy's innocence. And how many of these best heroes have already come and gone? Did you ever think about that? The hero asked calmly and gestured to a large tomb in the distance. See that right there. That's the resting place of Silver Rush, a hero who used to be the number one when I was a kid and back then people thought that he was invulnerable. Oh and that right there, that's the card master, who was number two before Endeavor showed up. All Might said as he pointed at a much newer large grave maybe 25 yards away. But why are you showing me this? Why you aren't dying? Are you All Might? The green-haired boy asked afraid as tears welled up in his eyes. What? Oh no no no, Tashinori said as he waved his arms around nervously, trying to calm the boy down. I just wanted you to understand what you will risk if you become a hero. Many of the people who are buried here never had the chance to start their own families and some didn't even finish their training before they ended up here. All Might's face suddenly adopted a very serious expression. Being a hero means putting yourself in extremely dangerous situations and putting your life on the line for people you don't even know every single day while you also lose much of your own personal life. Are you sure that you want that? The number one hero asked his tone firm but without a hint of anger. He saw no hesitation on Izuku's face only a bit of contemplation. But before you tell me your answer, you also need to know that no matter how you decide, I will support your choice completely. But if you say yes I will not let you back down and from this day I will train you to the best of my abilities to help you achieve this goal. And to keep you safe. He added in his mind. Izuku stood there frozen with wide eyes as a gentle cool breeze softly ruffled his spiky green hair. His mind was a storm. After a few seconds of watching the boy contemplate his choices, the big man spoke again. You don't need to decide now you know, we can. But Izuku interrupted him before he had the chance to finish. I'll do it. He said before he took a deep breath only to continue a second later. I want to make the world a better place, where people can just forget about their fears and be happy and that's something only heroes can do. The boy said as he tightened his fists and rose them with determination. I will become a hero and save everyone with a smile on my face just like you, all might. He finished excitedly. H-A-H-A-H-A. Well then it is settled, we shall start tomorrow, but first let me tell you a little secret. And so, the number one hero finally revealed the secret of his power and the story of all for one. Izuku was gobsmacked once he knew what the power coursing through his veins really was and how many times it was passed just to reach him. He felt a great honor and also responsibility. True to his words Tashinori started training his son the next day. He bought a lot of books focusing on rescue tactics and started giving the boy homework. The day after that, he took the boy into his gym and taught him the bare basics of combat, and then how to dodge attacks by throwing weak slow punches so Izuku could grasp the technique better. After just two weeks the boy knew how to duck and sidestep. The number one hero was overjoyed. When he learned that the boy has started to keep a journal detailing the powers and possibilities of both heroes and villains whom he watched on the TV and sometimes All Might would also provide him with helpful tips to help his research. Then a month into their training he finally allowed the boy to use one for all in its purest form, but they ran into a problem. All Might was afraid that despite the training Izuku's body would end up damaged by the power of one for all, but instead it was his jumpsuit. The air friction from just three punches was enough to tear down the boy's sleeve clean off his arm. The number one hero immediately understood the danger of this happening in a fight. If his body copied enemies quirk during combat it could destroy both of them in mere seconds once it fused with one for all. And so, they improved the outfit by adding black heavy-duty welding gloves during their sessions. One day Tashinori took Izuku to a deserted beach full of junk and just gave him a few simple instructions to start cleaning the mess up without the use of his quirks. It was a grueling work, but after a few weeks, he could already feel the difference in his strength and see the difference he was making on the beach, which made him proud of his work. Whenever Izuku wasn't hanging around with his friends or studying, he was training. It was almost scary to see such incredible tenacity from someone so young. And all that tenacity paid off. Just a year later he quickly gained even more muscle weight but also incredible agility. Which brought some rather interesting problems for the boy. Love letters. After a few PE classes on middle school he was finding them everywhere. In his locker, under his plate at lunch, in his bag, on his desk and of course many have been handed to the boy personally. And the contents of these love letters were just disturbing. Dear Izuku, ever since I first laid my eyes on you, I knew that we were meant to be together. I love watching you work out and I just can't help myself. I can't sleep at night thinking about how good you look. I know that little bitch Mika has you wrapped around you little finger but don't worry I will save you from her. Love, your secret admirer. 
Wow, girls sure are scary. Shinso commented as he finished reading the piece of paper his friend handed him. Right, I don't even know a girl named Miko. He said in panic as he began rummaging through his pockets. This one thinks that the two of us are dating and this one even left her underwear with the letter. And that's just for today. Help me Hitoshi. He announced as he slammed two more letters on his desk. I don't know what to tell you Izuku. They won't quit until you choose one. Shinso said with a sigh. Sad that he was unable to help his friend. But then an idea struck him. Two days later. Let me get this straight. You want me to be your pretend girlfriend. So the girls leave you alone. Why don't you ask one of the girls from your school? Momo asked as she eyed both boys suspiciously. Well we wanted to. But that person would immediately become a target and we don't want that to happen. Izuku said and Shinso nodded in approval. We just need to make the girls believe that he already has a girlfriend. So the girls stop sending him those creepy letters. All you need to do is to go on a few fake dates with Izuku and once the girls see that he's off limits, they will stop fighting over him and leave him alone. The girl sighed and gave them a look of disapproval. This whole thing was just so weird. She always saw Izuku almost as her little brother, which made everything even worse. Please Momo, help me. I think they are stalking me. They even know where I do my training. It's like they are always there, just watching and scheming. Izuku begged after sensing her hesitation. Seeing the desperation on his face made her feel bad for her friend and so, she chose to ignore that weird feeling in the pit of her stomach. Fine, but when I get stabbed on the way home, I will come back just to haunt you all. Momo finally agreed and the group set their plan into motion the next Sunday. On Sunday, it was a nice day for winter. The sun was softly shining over the city and a few soft pure snowflakes drifted through the air only to softly land on the busy streets. Most people were out doing their Christmas shopping and Momo was sitting on a bench and searching the crowded street with her eyes for her shorter green-haired friend. She was waiting for maybe five minutes when rapid footsteps quickly approached her as Izuku burst from the crowd, wheezing a bit. She gave him a once-over and had to do a double-take, because she could hardly recognize him. Izuku's normally spiky unkept hair was now unnaturally slicked back revealing his forehead a bit. Izuku dot 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 what happened to you? She asked as the boy sat down next to her to catch his breath. Sorry for being late dot 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 but when mom found out that I was going on a date, she would not let me leave until she brushed my hair. He said in between gasps. Normally running this distance wouldn't be any problem. But the cold winter air really did a number on his lungs. The slightly taller lady soon noticed what that he was holding a small yellow paper bag. What's that anyway? She asked pointing at the little bag. Oh yeah, it's for you. He said as if he just remembered. What he was holding in his hand and offered it to her. For me. She said as she accepted the object. She opened it only to find four still warm homemade cinnamon rolls inside. She also said that I should bring a gift to a first date and she wouldn't let me leave unless I took something with me. I tried to tell her that it's a fake date, but she said that it didn't matter because I worry nice girl. He started to mutter in panic. It's okay Izuku, don't worry about it. She said waving her hand around dismissively as she tried to stop the boy's embarrassed mumbling. She always thought that this nervously flustered side of him was kind of cute especially since this flustered boy was physically strong enough to tear an adult person limb from limb. Not that he would ever attempt something like that, but it painted a funny contrast. After this small exchange both of them stayed silent looking at one another. It was a weird moment since neither knew what to do now. Then it turned even more awkward. So, nice weather, right? Momo deadpanned and mentally slapped herself for saying something like that, whilst it was literally snowing. Yeah, it's nice huh? Izuku mirrored looking around at the wind slowly picking up its speed. This exchange only led them both to look at their feet in embarrassment and to think the same thing. If this is what dating feels like, I will rather stay single for the rest of my life. However, as fate would have it a pigeon chose this time to seat itself on the branch directly over Izuku's head, which sent a small heap of snow tumbling down on his head and behind his neck under his jacket. A-A-G-H, so cold. He yelped, quickly taking off his jacket and shaking off the quickly melting mess. Seeing this made Momo giggle before she came closer to him and brushed off most of the white chunks out of his hair with her gloved hands. This action however also restored Izuku's hair to its original state. There, much better. Momo commented as she helped Izuku straighten his jacket. It was a weird feeling for the boy. For a while he felt frozen in place when he noticed just how close she was standing to him. Were her eyes always so pretty? This single thought brought a small wave of warmness to his cheeks, which then brought forth a different kind of awkwardness. It was not a bad feeling, however. It felt strangely right. So, what's the plan? Momo asked, bringing Izuku out of his little universe in the process. Why yeah, um, Shinzo will be watching from afar. He knows the girls from our school, and he'll tell us if anyone starts tailing us. He announced as he pulled out a small All Might-themed walkie-talkie out of his pocket nearly dropping it in the process. She looked around and quickly spotted their purple-haired friend at the other end of the street wearing a heavy jacket, scarf and a pair of sunglasses, which hid most of his face. The boy made a little wave as they made eye contact. 
This is control. Testing. Do you hear me, Romeo? Over. The device suddenly announced. Momo was taken aback a little by their collective goofiness. For God's sake, they are even using code names. Hearing you loud and clear, control. Over. Okay. There is a small cafe with large windows just two streets to the south. Your objective is to slowly make your way there whilst making playful banter with Julia. Over. Commencing mission. Over. He said as in turn to Momo, who was already giggling after she witnessed their little professional exchange. So, Romeo and Juliet. She asked good-humoredly and Izuku blushed harder. It was Hitoshi's idea. He said very quickly and looked away, making Momo laugh. The date went along perfectly. The pair almost forgot that they had a spectator by the time they reached the small family business. However, just as they made their order the walkie-talkie came back to life. Alert. Romeo. You have Yuki from class 2 degrees Celsius 3 booths behind you. Don't make eye contact. I repeat, don't make eye contact. Over. Shinzo announced and Izuku immediately felt immensely nervous. There was no way he could act natural in this sort of situation. Momo saw her friend's gloved hands tremble and she felt bad for him. The slightly taller girl knew Izuku well and it was clear that this whole thing took a big toll on his mind. And so, she reached over and gently grasped one of his hands in her own. Hey it's okay. I am here. She said with a slightly manlier voice and flexed her nearly non-existent bicep with a small smile, emulating his favorite hero. Izuku clearly didn't expect this but soon his eyes widened. And a smile returned to his face only to then adopt a face perfectly similar to his father. Thank you, he said, flawlessly imitating All Might's voice. Momo first let out a giggle which then evolved into a full laughter. That was so perfect, she said and then realized that she was still holding his hand. A slight barely noticeable blush appeared on her cheeks as she let go. As this all unfolded Shinzo secretly took a few photos of them and Yuki as evidence with his phone. They finished their drinks and left the establishment heading for their new location. An arcade. That's when the walkie-talkie turned on again. Hey Romeo, I see Sarah from our class tailing you. Over. What? The quiet girl. Are you sure? Hit I mean control. Over. Engaging hostile. Over. Itoshi quietly announced before he tapped her shoulder. What is it? Shinzo. Sarah asked confused as she turned around and saw the purple-haired boy standing behind her. Hey, you are Sarah, right? Shinzo asked with a friendly tone. Yeah, what do you want? She started but stopped as he activated his quirk. Leave my friend alone. Go home and think about your life. The boy commanded and the girl simply turned around and left. Target neutralized. Romeo, resuming surveillance. Over. Shinzo again whispered into the device and started following them again. Thanks, control. Over. Izuku sighed and resumed walking. Wow, he really gets into character. Momo commented, whilst looking at the girl leave in a hurry. Yeah, he's really. Izuku suddenly stopped talking and the black-haired girl glanced at him to see what happened, only to see her boyfriend transfixed by a large poster proudly displayed next to the arcade entrance. Special gaming tournament. Enter and gain a chance to win the one and only All Might Anniversary Independence Day Special Edition action figure in original American package. Will you be the one to leave the tournament with one of the rarest action figures in history? Come and find out. Only 15 o yen to enter. 15 today. Izuku was speechless. This was the most sought-after All Might action figure on the market. He only heard legends about this fan item. Only 50 of these were made and shipped out before the factory closed down due to health and safety regulation. The legendary figure of the number one hero pictured holding the flags of both Japan and the USA during the July 4th parade 10 years ago. His hands were sweating, and he felt a little lightheaded. I need to get it. When Momo saw the starry look in his eyes, she already knew that there was nothing to stop the shorter boy from entering this tournament. And so, they walked in and signed up. Shinzo meanwhile bought a can of hot tea out of a vending machine to keep himself warm as he waited and watched for who would show up. The boy nearly spilled his drink in shock, when he noticed who was standing just 20 feet from him whilst also keeping a watchful eye on the building. Is that really? Minus 20 minutes later, Izuku and Momo left the arcade defeated despite being extremely familiar with the game. They ended up as first opponents to the two people who absolutely dominated the tournament, both of which were adults. I can't believe that centipede guy used the Endeavor's invisible throw in the first round. That should be considered cheating. Izuku complained. Tell me about it. I didn't hit my opponent once. Pretty sure he was cheating. I just don't know how. Such treachery. Momo said tiredly. Unbeknownst to them there was a small celebration held later that day at the Night Eye Agency. Then out of nowhere a couple of small children quickly ran past the pair, which made Momo trip, slip and fall straight into a small puddle. Are you okay? Izuku asked quickly as he helped her to stand up and swiftly noticed that her jacket was now soaked. I'm fine, it was just a tumble, she said but the boy saw the way she started shaking and wordlessly took off his own jacket before offering it to her. It's fine, the jumpsuit is pretty well isolated, he added when he noticed her hesitation. 
Momo accepted the offered garment. But once she put it on, the small pang of guilt suddenly became accompanied by a strange sensation near her heart. It was as if the organ took a minuscule break between its beats. Just then this weirdly pleasant moment was interrupted by the walkie-talkie. Guys, we have a problem, Shinzo announced. What is it, control? Izuku inquired, but was met by silence before his friend spoke again. Just come meet me in that small convenient shop in the next block, I need to show you something. Over and out, the pair shared a puzzled look before heading towards their destination. The first five minutes after getting there were filled at first by confusion and then horrifying realization. Are you sure it was really Miss Akiyama? Izuku asked for what felt like the fifth time and Shinzo just resolutely nodded. But why would your English teacher stalk him? Momo asked a bit confused. Do you want to see the pictures again? It was definitely her. The purple-haired boy said and pointed at his phone which was currently resting between two sacks of potato chips and being used as an impromptu screen. Miss Akiyama was a pretty young and new teacher who started working as a faculty member just a year ago. She was quite strict and sometimes boring. Most of the students didn't like her and those who did like her only did so because she was somewhat nice to look at. Maybe she was just waiting for someone. Izuku offered only to be shot down by his friend immediately. No, she was standing in the same spot and watching the arcade until you two walked out. She was definitely following you. That's so disturbing, Momo commented. But what do we do? It's not like we can just show these pictures to the headmaster. He'll just think that we were following her on her off day. Izuku exclaimed in panic. You need to tell your parents. Momo informed much to the shorter teen's horror. This whole thing was weird enough on its own and bringing other people into this felt like an absolute nightmare. But but, he tried only to be interrupted by Shinzo yet again. No buts, Momo's right. This is really serious, especially if she's the one writing these letters. They argued for a while until they were banished from the store by the old clerk, who suspected that the trio was shoplifting but once outside Izuku surrendered and agreed under the condition that they would support him. All Might was luckily already home, playing pat a cake with his daughter within co-capturing the whole thing on camera. The explaining took some time, but by the end of it Izuku's parents were bewildered almost as the boy himself especially after the trio showed them the letters and pictures taken by Hitoshi. And Ko repeatedly reassured her son that he did the right thing and Tashinori vowed to fix the situation and the very next day he visited the school dressed in his favorite yellow suit which attracted many eyes. All Might was very surprised to learn that Miss Akiyama was in fact not a pervy stalker. But the whole situation took an even more surprising turn when he found out that she wasn't a certified teacher either. After a stern talk, Tashinori even managed to find out about her actual employer. The Hero Public Safety Commission. As it turns out, his son was being watched by the Japanese version of the FBI without his knowledge. This new information left him seething. And so that very same day he took his first official day off to sort this whole mess out. Minus four hours later. All might you need to understand. Calmly said the woman currently serving as the commission president only to be interrupted by the much taller and much more intimidating hero. No, there is nothing more to understand. You have gone behind my back and you have been spying on my son as if he was a high-level threat since he was just four years old, praying that I wouldn't find out about it. All Might angrily proclaimed. It was crystal clear to everyone present at the emergency meeting that the number one hero was absolutely furious and that alone was enough to terrify them. They all viewed All Might as the golden standard for heroes everywhere. The man was kind, calm and collected even when facing unspeakable danger. So, if you manage to make someone like that angry, you know that you messed up royally. We need to be rational. Your son represents a serious danger to every person around him. We cannot ignore that, exclaimed someone from the back row, which caused the hero to turn in that direction. You should be so kind and present evidence for your claim. It shouldn't be very hard after nine years of tight surveillance, right? Tashinori responded, feeling a bit cheeky, but he knew that he was right and so did everyone present in the room. In those nine years, not once did Izuku abuse his quirk nor did he gain any more powers. Silence filled the room. No one there wanted to argue with the pro. Seeing as no one was willing to speak All Might chose to continue. Every day since he was four years old, he wakes up, brushes his teeth and puts on his suit before stepping outside and not once did he argue against your countermeasure or complain about it. In fact, ever since his sister was born, he also started wearing that thing at home, scared that he would somehow harm her if he didn't. He spoke and looked at the crowd in front of him. Some of the representatives averted their sights from him. The hero talked to the board members like this for what felt like hours and whenever someone presented an argument, he swiftly disproved it and by the end of the meeting they had no choice but to surrender, especially after Tashinori threatened to bring the whole thing into public's eye. It turns out that a mental image of an article titled HPSC unlawfully spied on All Might's son was very convincing and terrifying. The number one hero wasn't angry about the surveillance, but he was extremely mad about what this meant. The surveillance of a minor was not unprecedented. 
but it was reserved only for children that were considered to be exceptionally dangerous for society. Minors that either suffered from a mental sickness and or were already criminally active. This meant that to even issue this order, they had to officially classify Izuku as a villain suspect and his father wouldn't stand for it. That day he returned home with an official surveillance order repeal and Izuku's teacher was soon after replaced by a normal one. Tashinori decided that it would be better to keep this whole thing secret from both his wife and son, since he didn't want to cause them any more stress. It's one thing, when you are being watched by some perv, but when you learn that the government was watching you for nine goddamn years it messes with you on an entirely different level. Izuku and his friends were very excited to learn that his teacher handed over her resignation and was soon replaced by a pretty nice guy named Adam Tanaka just a week later. However, that is not the only thing that changed after this whole fiasco. Momo and Izuku started spending more time together after they discovered just how much they liked each other's company. Though whenever someone around them mentioned the word date and their names in the same sentence their faces were swiftly replaced by something akin to a freshly picked tomatoes whilst they hastily explained that they are just good friends. It was an interesting year for the green-haired teen. His training and All Might's teaching methods have gotten even more intense. How is a hero supposed to act during a rescue operation? The number one hero asked as he threw a left hook at his son. Kind, calm and reassuring, Izuku shouted back as he ducked under the hero's wide swing. Even though this entire thing could be considered as child abuse, Izuku was extremely grateful for every minute of his training. Besides, thanks to many years of practice, All Might had incredible muscle control which made him able to stop anything he threw at Izuku mid-swing if he felt that it could actually cause any harm to the boy. Izuku tried to launch a counterattack to the midsection, but the tall man caught his arm in a crushing grip and lifted the teen up to eye level. What's the article that forbids excessive force during arrest? Tashinori asked with a big smile just 10 inches away from the teen's face. The green-haired boy knew that look. It meant you either answer this right, or you are going down. Um, 217. Izuku tried nervously. Wrong. All Might yelled and swinged his arm in an attempt to slam the boy into the mat they were standing on. Izuku felt the pang of panic in his mind and tried to soften his inevitable impact. However as he grasped the hero's arm with his free hand, this motion generated far more force than he expected, which somehow made his knee jerk upwards and hit Tashinori straight in the nose. All Might obviously didn't expect this to happen and the shock combined with the impact and the explosion of pain made him let go. The boy landed relatively softly and watched as the hero took a step back and clutched his nose, which was now bleeding a little. The feeling of panic immediately returned and this time it was combined with guilt. Oh geez, All Might, are you okay? I am so sorry Aidan T. Minto. The teen quickly started mumbling out an apology only to be stopped by the hero's thunderous laughter. H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-H-L-
which went about as good as you can imagine, and other boys simply started carefully avoiding the taller teen whenever he had the chance. Secondly, Ida attempted to follow him when Shinzo left school to see where the boy was heading, but he too failed and was soon discovered. Senya tried to apply a more direct approach after being found out and the purple-haired teen left after telling him to leave him alone. This little incident made Hitoshi cautious, rendering all other tailing attempts impossible. However, it also revealed something very important to them. That Shinso was ashamed or at least secretive about whatever was going on. Next, they tried to look in his favorite places. The bookshop he often visited, his favorite arcade and even the cafe he recommended for their earlier mission. But everywhere they were met with same answers. None of the employees saw him for the last couple of weeks. It was a weird situation and none of his friends knew what they should do. But Luck smiled on them one day. Izuku desperately needed a new pair of shoes because his old ones had cracks in their soles and so he took a break from his training regimen to do some shopping. It was hard to find some that would fit him just right. Thus he spent his entire afternoon walking around the many sportwear shops throughout the city. But as soon as he walked into the store number 6, he immediately hurried back out. He saw him, his purple-haired friend was already there, sitting on a stool and trying on new shoes. It was a very rare opportunity and Izuku would not let it slip. So, he abandoned his current quest and waited hidden behind a trash can nearby. Shinso walked out with a shoebox under his arm maybe five minutes later and headed to the closest train station. Izuku watched his friend get aboard, waited for a few seconds before getting on himself. Luckily there were a few hero cosplayers aboard but not too many to pose any risk to Izuku's quirk and so he slipped into the crowd and kept an eye on his friend. They traveled a few stations before Shinso got up and left the train. Izuku wanted to follow but a hand tapped his shoulder. He turned around only to see probably the greasiest guy he has ever met. This guy had to weigh 200 pounds at the very least, which combined that he was dressed as a smaller version of fat gum, made him look like a masked misshapen potato. And what are you supposed to be? Hey, wait, don't I know you from some convention? Boy, sorry, I am kinda in a hurry. What the? What's that insane quality costume under your jacket? It looks so real. Is that real polyester, carbon fiber mixture? That must have been hella expensive, said a busty girl next to him in a Maruko cosplay while pointing at his gloved hand. Haha, really? It's just glue but I really need to. Hey, can I take selfie? Asked someone dressed as Endeavor while already pulling out his phone. To his panic Izuku noticed that the doors to the train car were already beginning to close. He had to think fast. It was prohibited to use a quirk while inside public transport, so he needed to improvise. Wait, look it's ingenium. He exclaimed and pointed at the nearby window. The effect was immediate. The cosplayers quickly lost their interest and moved closer to the glass to catch a glimpse of the famous hero. Izuku saw his opportunity, rushed forward, and leapt through the door just before it slammed shut. He looked around but his purple-haired friend was nowhere to be seen. The taller boy left the station in search for Hitoshi, but he soon realized the hopelessness of his attempt. There were people in all directions, but none of them sported Shinzo's iconic hair color. After another 10 minutes Izuku gave up and returned to his previous objective, disappointed. He walked the busy streets looking for another clothing store, but a road repairs ahead forced him to change his course away from the main street. The boy wandered through the residential area. He ended up in, a bit confused by the unknown surroundings and that's when he heard it. Got him it. What the hell is wrong with me? Why won't it work? Izuku immediately recognized the distressed shouting filled with anger. It was definitely Shinso. He hurried in the general direction of the sound and there he saw him. His friend was sitting on a bench with his hands covering his eyes. His chest was heaving, and a few tears slipped through the slim gaps between his fingers only to fall on the pavement. Hitoshi, are you okay? Did something happen? Izuku asked worriedly as he made his way closer to his friend. Shinso reacted quickly and used his sleeves to wipe his eyes. When he heard the boy's voice, I'm fine, a branch just hit me in the face. He responded while avoiding eye contact with his green-haired friend. B but there are no trees around here. Come on, tell me what's wrong, we are all worried about. It was then that Izuku noticed that his friend was completely soaked in sweat. Just leave me alone. Shinzo said a bit more forcefully and stood only to keel over slightly, forcing Izuku to catch him before he hit the ground. You don't look okay, Hitoshi. Should I call you an ambulance? He asked as he helped his friend to sit down. No, it's fine, I just probably pulled something in my leg. The purple-haired boy said with a defeated tone and rubbed his thigh to relieve the pain he felt. Izuku took a step forward to check his friend for any more injuries, but he accidentally stepped on something. A notebook. He picked it up and out of curiosity checked the page that opened when the thing fell on the ground. 3.1, 8.30, 4.1, 8.26, 5.1, Hey, give that back. Shinzo said angrily, extended his arm and tore the notebook from Izuku's hands. This caught Izuku completely off guard. He couldn't even remember when he saw his friend act so aggressively. They shared a short look until the purple-haired boy averted his gaze. 
his facial features softening. Sorry, Izuku I didn't. No, it's fine, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. We are just so worried about you dot 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 but don't worry, I will tell the others to leave you alone, just please if you ever need anything, you can always tell us, okay. We'll be there for you, Izuku said with a small kind smile. He took a step back and got ready to leave sad and angry at himself, even though he knew that maybe his friend just needed a bit of space, and so, turned around and took a few steps away from the shorter teen. Wait Izuku, I. The other boy interrupted. Izuku stopped and turned back to face his friend hopefully curious. What is it Hitoshi? He asked calmly. Can you please take a seat? I want to tell you something. Sure, no problem. The muscular teen said and sat down next to his friend, almost three weeks earlier. I am such an idiot. Shinzo just opened his locker. The second period was just about to start, and he has forgotten his math textbook inside. He quickly grabbed it and hurried to his classroom. However, just as he made the corner and headed up the stairs, he passed by a group of three upperclassmen and overheard their conversation. That's great. Anyway, have you heard about Saburo? You mean that guy who tried for the UA this year? This piqued Shinzo's interest and so he stopped just out of sight to listen some more. Yep, I heard those robots really did a number on him. Good thing they have that recovery hero there as the school nurse. Wait, they still use robots? Guess UA really is all about raw power. When Shinzo heard those words, he felt very skeptical. They are wrong right. What could they know about the entrance exam? At that time, Shinzo just made his way back to the classroom and forgot all about it. But the memory surfaced again. When he was lying in bed, out of curiosity he took his phone and searched for the UA entrance exam. The school's website didn't provide much information. Only that the exam had two parts, one written and the other practical so he searched the web until he found a forum where someone gave an in-depth description of what their UA entrance exam was like and why they failed. As Shinzo read this, he felt as if the whole world was falling apart around him. There was no way his quirk would work on robots and any weapons that didn't have anything to do with the person's quirk were strictly forbidden. That night he didn't sleep at all nor did he sleep the night after. So, he started searching for a way to get there without the exam and after a while, he actually found it. The UA Recommendation Entrance Exam It consisted of three parts, a written test, a practical test and an interview. However after several hours of searching, he didn't find anything about robots being part of the equation. Though it was only for exceptional students and from the info he found online, he would need to be among the four best students just to be accepted. It was a long shot, but he was willing to take it if it meant a chance of getting into the hero course. And so, he started training. His first attempt at a 2km run ended with a time of 8 minutes and 23 seconds. It was not a bad start, but it was nowhere near perfect. So, he tried again the next day with the result of 8.20. Shinzo was feeling optimistic until his next attempt ended with 8.30 and then the next one with 8.36. He knew he had to do more, so he searched for hints and advice of how to improve his time. But all failed and he hasn't registered any positive change in three weeks even after dedicating all of his free time to training. Present time. But why didn't you tell us? It's nothing to be ashamed of. Izuku asked and put a reassuring hand on his shoulder. I don't know. You are all working so hard. I just didn't want to bother you. He said slowly and once again averted his gaze. They sat there in silence for few minutes after which Izuku helped his friend to stand up and they went to back to their train station together. The next day. Do you have any idea how worried we were, Hitoshi? How irresponsible can you be? Ida yelled when he finally understood the situation, as Shoto, Momo and Izuku held him back to protect their insomniac friend. Sorry guys, I don't know what came over me. The purple-haired boy apologized again and after a while of robotic hand chops and dangerously glinting glasses, Tenya calmed down sufficiently. But what do we do anyway? It's not like we can cheat. Momo noted. Well, don't you start, Shoto. Tenya reprimanded. I'm just saying that's it's a possibility. Not that we should do it. No, it's not. Shinso interrupted, bringing everyone's attention back on himself. If I can't get into the UA with my own skills, there's no point trying. Well, that just leaves us with one option. You will have to train like hell, said Izuku, meeting Shinso's gaze with his own. The purple-haired boy sighed and looked at his new shoes. I know, you all mean well, and I would do pretty much anything to get there. But there is no point, I tried, remember? For three weeks and on your own, we still have a year to get you in top shape. Izuku exclaimed and everyone except Shinzo nodded. The boy in question just stared at them surprised. Dot 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 you guys would really do that for me? Shinzo asked and looked at his friends, who only responded with another resolute nod. He could feel his eyes get most moist again, when he saw just how determined they were to help him achieve his dream. By the end of their short conversation only one question remained on Hitoshi's mind. How did I deserve such great friends? Though he would also soon learn just how ruthless they could be as trainers. Momo and Tenya took positions as his personal tutors. It was clear that to pass the exam, 
he would need to get as close to a perfect score as humanly possible, which also meant that they couldn't accept any mistakes. At the first week he saw his amount of homework double and then triple the next week, Shoto masterfully used his cold facade and shrewd nature to become the perfect interview instructor and he wielded these weapons perfectly to absolutely destroy any attempt Shinzo made every single week and deconstruct it to point out his mistake. Finally, Izuku was put in charge of Shinzo's physical training. And if the boy thought that the other parts of his training were torturous enough on their own, Izuku showed him something truly infernal. They would run each and every day until Hitoshi's knees started to shake like crazy. And the cardio sessions filled with a lot of jump rope and gymnastics made him feel as if he was dying. Yet after a month of this torture and improvement finally appeared, Shinzo's grade started greatly improving and soon he was at the top of his class sometimes even completely ahead of everyone else. His stamina and flexibility also changed for the better. His time slowly but surely reached the 8-minute mark only to beat it with a time of 7 minutes and 56 seconds a day later. Even though he felt tired as hell and his muscles screamed for him to stop, he was so happy he could cry. The last thing that remained was for them to find someone who would recommend the boy for the exam, a task that would prove to be rather easy to manage. Are you sure about this Izuku? I know you really like your friend, but I can't write more than one recommendation a year. If I write one for your friend, you will have to take the regular entrance exam like everyone else. The tall hero proclaimed, while slowly rocking his small daughter to sleep. The little girl couldn't help but coo and sometimes even giggle during the gentle ride. He was surprised when Izuku broached the topic, but he understood his son's sentiment. I know all might, but it's totally okay. I know that I can get in without it. Um, I will think about it. But first I would like to have a chat with your friend. Can you bring him here tomorrow? Of course, Izuku said, perfectly imitating the man in front of him and gave a thumbs up. S-H-H-H-H-H. I told you to stop doing that. You will wake her up again. Tashinori said in a lowered tone as he felt his daughter stir in his grasp. Oh no, sorry, old habits. Papa, Naomi chimed in reaching her tiny arms towards the hero's face once again fully awake and energetic. All Might smiled gently at his daughter. He was very familiar with this situation and so he lifted her up so she could play with his tufts of blonde hair, like she always loved to. Bring him around 5 in the afternoon. Okay I will try to get home a bit early, okay. The hero said seemingly unbothered by the fact that there were now two baby legs currently flopping around before his eyes. Sure thing. Izuku confirmed and left the room, leaving All Might to play with Mayumi some more. The next day, Shinso was feeling nervous like never before. He has met Izuku's dad a few times already but today was different. The man who could give him the chance that would determine the rest of his life was sighting just two meters from him with an iconic smile that would put a crocodile to shame. Not to mention being so close to someone larger than life just never got old. So tell me young Shinso, why do you want to become a hero? Tashinori finally asked the boy who was very close to freaking out. That's a really loaded question, Mr. Yagi. Nonsense, this is not a test. There are no right or wrong answers. I personally know a few heroes, who started only to make an impression on the opposite sex, can't be much worse than that, All Might said with a friendly tone. Well, if you insist, the purple-haired boy said, before taking a calming breath to sort out his thoughts a bit. I, I think it started before elementary. I just saw all those people in flashy suits doing good things and I thought I want to be a part of that, but everyone just always assumes that I will end up as a villain, he admitted with a small sigh. Doesn't seem that way to me. Besides Izuku is great when it comes to choosing his friends. Tashinori said as he tried to lift the teen's mood a bit. I know, but people like him are the exception. Everyone just thinks that I will become a villain with my quirk, but, he explained but then stopped himself. Hmm, you asked me why I want to become a pro and you probably think that it's just because I want to prove everyone wrong. But the truth is, I can't put the true reason into words, it's just, something in me that wants me to help people feel safe. I am sorry, but I can't really answer your question. Shinzo's expression saddened, as he thought that he messed up in some way. Haha, <laughs> don't worry about it, if anything it just shows that your heart is in the right place. The hero explained, his smile unwavering. Now for my second and last question, can you show me your quirk? Shinzo's face adopted an expression of complete shock and disbelief. B but I can't do that. I would have to brainwash you in it. Oh please, I'm pretty sure I've experienced worse. Come on, show me. The hero encouraged confidently. Oh okay, here goes, he said and extended his arm towards the blonde man. All Might waited patiently, unsure if anything was happening. Well, are you? He tried to speak only to stop a second later unable to move. His mind was feeling hazy as if a thick fog completely enveloped his thoughts and left him feeling helpless. I'm sorry, my quirk is voice activated and it only works if the other person responds to what I say. Shinzo explained before he stood up walked over to the hero and carefully pinched his arm. The reaction was imminent. All Might twitched and took a few deep breaths to force the grogginess out of his mind. 
The purple-haired teen thought that he was in trouble when he saw the hero's reaction. But Toshinori stood up a second later with a full smile back a clasp the teen's shoulder with his massive hand. I see that my son is right about you. That is one of the most powerful and useful quirks I have ever seen. I am glad you are on our side. I can't wait to watch you grow young man. Does that mean? Yes, I will recommend you. But remember, this is not even close to a victory. Your friends and I might pave the road for you, but you have to walk it yourself. Good luck. The hero exclaimed and watched as a tear escaped one of Shinzo's eyes. When the boy smiled, Hitoshi was so incredibly grateful for the chance he was given. And he doubled the efforts on his training with a singular thought in his mind. I will not let this chance go to waste, no matter what. All Might landed softly on the penthouse balcony in the middle of the night. Tired, sweaty and clutching a gift-wrapped box, he felt racked with guilt as if he had just committed a heinous crime. Today was his daughter's birthday and of course a group of villains had to pick this day to cause so much trouble to keep him occupied for 16 hours straight. The large man entered his home quietly only to be met with a now familiar sight of his wife sleeping on the couch. He knew that she must have been here waiting for him to come home for hours until exhaustion finally overtook her and brought her into the blissful embrace of sleep. He sighed, gently picked up Inko's limp body and carried her to bed to help her avoid neck pains from the uncomfortable position the piece of cushioned furniture provided. After making sure that she looked comfortable and warm enough, he left the room and went to check on his daughter. He passed by his son's room and walked to the end of the hallway where he opened the door decorated with many hand-drawn flowers. Mayumi's room was filled with all kinds of toys and pictures. There were plushies, dolls, race cars and even a large train track going around the room, which they built for her with his son. Despite the many obstacles he managed to quietly make his way to her small bed in absolute silence. Just as he was about to take a look at her, he was interrupted by a soft whine. He looked at his feet only to see Hiro rolled up next to the bed with one eye lazily opened and the other tightly shut. Big faithful protector, huh? Toshinori thought as he got down and gave the massive dog a good scratch, only for the creature to fall back asleep only a few seconds later. The husky was getting older, yet the years did little to quell his protective nature. He peered at his daughter sleeping peacefully next to her favorite purple stuffed fox doll. Toshinori smiled as he reached out his hand and gently brushed away a few strands of hair to get a better look at her face. It's been a few weeks since her quirk first manifested, which was quite a traumatic event for his wife. Minus 24 days ago. Ready or not, here I come. Inko announced as she turned around to look for her daughter. It was a beautiful day outside and so they went to a nearby playground. Mayumi loved the swings but even they got boring after a while and so the game of hide and seek began. The green-haired woman searched and searched, but her daughter was nowhere to be found. Luckily, she had a secret weapon exactly for this situation. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? She asked loudly in a sing-song voice. SpongeBob Squaw Pants. The little girl yelled as she jumped from a nearby bush with her hands aimed at the sky. Oh, there you are. Her mother said as she picked the little preschooler up and gave her an Eskimo kiss. Mommy, can we get ice Sivim? She asked, still unable to get rid of her little lisp, but she was getting there. Sure thing, sweetie, mommy just needs to take out her wallet she said, but then she noticed a bit of red on her daughter's sleeve. Inko immediately put her daughter down, checked her over and sure enough, there was a small bleeding scratch on the back of her hand. It was most likely caused by the bush. When Mayumi noticed, what caught her mother's attention it brought tears into her tiny eyes. Don't worry sweetie, it will be okay. I have a band-aid in here, you just need to be a brave girl before I find it. Okay. Inko reassured her and then turned around quickly through started rummaging through her back. Where is it? Where is it? Why do I carry so many tissues with me? Mo oh, mommy. She heard her daughter say nervously. Just, give me a second sweetheart. Inko said when her fingers finally grasped the pack of band-aids. She turned back to her daughter and froze when she saw her. Her skin, eyes, hair, lips, everything was green. She took an involuntary step back in shock only to then discover an even more shocking detail. Her shoes were torn apart and, in the area where there normally would be Mayumi's feet, were now thick roots embedded in the ground. Mommy dot 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 this feels wifed. The mother in question quickly recovered from her surprise and offered a kind smile to the little girl. It's normal sweetie, it's just you quirk, just like mommy's, see. Inko said in her best calming tone and for demonstration levitated a small stone from the ground into her hand. The look of fear on Mayumi's face was immediately replaced by one of wonder and excitement as she looked over her body. Wow, just as she uttered that one little word a bunch of tiny flowers of many colors bloomed in her hair almost as if the quirk itself attempted to further show her exhilaration. Let's take a look at that hand, okay sweetie? Mm him. Mayumi simply responded and lifted her hand to allow her mother better access. However, Inko quickly noticed that her hand had a completely different color when compared to the rest of her body. It was yellowish brown, and it looked as if it was made of an extremely old and dry paper. Maybe this means that she's already healing. The woman thought as she gently embraced her daughter's hand in her own. 
Then it happened. Both Mayumi and Enko screamed at the same time when the smaller hand suddenly came off and crumpled like an old dried up leaf. There was no pain involved but both were just so freaked out. That panic was unavoidable. Luckily, they both calmed down after the hand miraculously regrew a few seconds later, but it was still a scarring event for the two of them. Naturally they took the small girl to a quirk specialist. Even though her skin, hair and eye color all turned back to normal before they even arrived, the results came only a day later. Mayumi Yagi Quirk Flora This quirk allows its user complete control over the vegetation in a nearby area as well as granting the user's body the use of plant-based powers, such as photosynthesis. The full extent of her powers is currently unknown. It turns out that she inherited the power of her great-grandfather, a first-generation quirk user, whose powers allowed the man limited photosynthetic powers through his green hair, which then granted his descendants their distinctive green hair, although none of his abilities. And so armed with this knowledge, she began, like most other children her age, experimenting with her powers. Her first victim was a potted plant on the balcony. She played with that thing every day and once she even managed to make the ponytail palm bloom like a rose and then presented every person in her family with these mysterious flowers. Now, she was growing so fast right in front of his very eyes. Pretty soon she would start going to kindergarten, then elementary school and after that she would no longer be his little girl, she would turn into a little lady. Just how much more am I going to miss out on? He carefully put the box on her nightstand and left the room, heading for a shower. The thought remained on his mind as the warm water washed away the sweat and soreness from his body. The guilt only multiplied when he caught himself having a thought, which he never guessed he would experience. Am I really thinking about quitting? For the last year he felt as if he was standing on a rope bridge over a deep ravine. On one side there were dozens upon dozens of people relying on him to help them while on the other his family was waiting there for him. Each day he had to make the same exact choice and it was slowly becoming harder and harder for him as if the ropes on this metaphorical bridge were becoming looser and looser with every single use. Oh, how much he envied the common salaryman with his steady 9 to 5 job. If only heroing was that easy. But then an idea struck his mind and he realized that option like that still existed. Though it would be extremely hard in the short term, he could make it work. All he would need is to give a phone call to one extremely smart and mysterious scarred little chimera. Minus 11 months later, and its official tenya, Izuku is taller by half an inch, Shinzo announced as he handed his blue-haired friend back the tape measure. What are your parents feeding you? Asked the bespectacled teen, dumbfounded by the new information. It was weird since both Izuku and Ida were growing at the same rate for the last year, but then one day Ida's growth spurt suddenly stopped, whilst Izuku's just kept going. By now, Izuku was almost as tall as his brother which was becoming unnerving. I have a theory, Todoroki announced calmly, raising his hand, Shoto, for the last time. I am not All Might's love child. Izuku sighed and rubbed her forehead in exasperation. It was a nice change to experience the playful interactions between the members of their small group once again. After all, for the last month they had done nothing but train and study their hearts out to improve their chances of being accepted into the school of their dreams. Tomorrow was the day of the recommendations exam in Momo. Todoroki and Shinzo were all as ready as possible and so they decided to stop cramming and just enjoy this day together. And what a nice day it was. They played a few board games, a few video games, ate a lot of unhealthy stuff and watched some dumb movie, laughing like idiots. Except for Ada who just kept criticizing the plot points, which made the movie even funnier for the rest of them. Yet there was something bittersweet about this moment and everyone could feel it. It was this weird feeling deep inside, just behind their hearts, because they knew that there was a very real chance that they might not all get accepted. Yet not one of them said anything and they all just chose to treasure this day for as long as it would last. When the evening finally came, they all had only one thing on their mind. I will do this. The next day, the often feared written exam was for the lack of a better word a piece of cake. Thanks to his grueling torturous studying sessions with Momo and Ida, Shinzo was more than prepared for anything it could throw at him. He wasn't sure what to make out of the interview. The woman who quizzed him seemed extremely excited by the end of it dot 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 or maybe horny. It was hard to tell since Shoto didn't prepare him for something like that. But then came the dreaded physical exam. Todoroki left the dressing room in his black gym jacket and a number 23 attached to his gray t-shirt, only for someone to barrel into him in that very second. It was a big guy so Shoto nearly failed to catch his balance. This guy was seriously massive, even taller than Izuku. He had a buzzed haircut and an extremely dumb wide smile on his face. What's your prob? But before the shorter teen had a chance to finish, the guy slapped his hands on his thighs and spoke very loudly. I am. He straightened his back. So very. He bent backwards a little. Extremely. He bent back even further. Sorry. He yelled as he bounced so low and so fast that his head hit the ground with a loud slam making Shoto jump away in shock. 
Todoroki was even more taken aback when the man straightened once more, and a little bit of blood poured out of a small scratch on his forehead but with that dumb smile still fully visible. What the? Are you crazy? Todoroki said angrily, bit disturbed by what he just witnessed. No, I am an Asa and passion means everything to me. The guy exclaimed energetically. Dot 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 what? The shorter teen asked confused by what he just heard but was given no answer. Now if you excuse me, I need to get my number. And Asa said loudly as he made his way around Shoto and into the dressing room. What a weird guy. Shoto thought as he made his way to the start of the race only to see Shinzo already standing there and trying to warm up his muscles by stretching. It was then that Todoroki came to realize that he would be racing one of his best friends with an unfair advantage. It didn't sit well with him. They quickly caught up on recent events and moved into their starting positions on the track. Good luck, Shoto. You too, Hitoshi. Just when it seemed like the long-haired blonde announcer with extremely loud voice was about to start the countdown and Asa showed up on the track a little winded with his number attached to his tracksuit, apologizing profusely for being late. It's no problem listeners. Now let's go over the rules. This is a 3km obstacle course. You are permitted to use your powers as much as you like, but you mustn't leave the track or affect other runners. Now or you are R-E-A-D-Y-Y-Y-Y. Yes, we are, Anissa shouted in response startling the other contenders and bringing happiness to present Mike in the process. On your marks, everyone got ready to run. Shinzo and Todoroki glanced at one another one last time before setting their eyes on the prize. Get set. It's impossible to determine just how many different thoughts and emotions rushed through their heads in that very moment. It seemed as if would go on forever. G-O-O-O. Almost automatically. Everyone rushed forward, but soon it became very clear who would end up as a winner. After just 15 seconds Shoto, Inasa and Hitoshi put a wide gap between them and the rest of the competition. Hurdles were no challenge at all for the trio especially with two of them flying right over and Shinzo knew that this wasn't a hurdle race but an obstacle course, which meant that running around the hurdles instead of jumping over them was a viable option. Next obstacle in their path was a 30-meter long sandpit, which slowed in a sec considerably, since he couldn't risk breaking the second rule by flinging the fine sand everywhere and hitting other runners. Shoto was able to increase his lead and Hitoshi nearly caught up to the passionate Baldi. But alas once they left the sand he soared away just like before. Obstacle after obstacle. Every single one was conquered, and competitors slowly approached the finish line. Shinzo was very happy for his friend. It was clear that he and that tall guy would be the winners of this race since they had a gap of more than 600 meters between them and the other runners. And then, they reached the end. Ice under Todoroki suddenly shifted. His feet slipped and an attempt to correct this mistake sent him zigzagging across the track and then flung him over the finish line. This gave Inasa a great opportunity fly past him and secure the first place. The scarred boy hit the ground pretty hard and was sent rolling before anyone could react. Itoshi saw this and sped up to see what happened to his friend. It was as if the entire race had stopped and all he could see was his friend lying sprawled on the ground. He didn't even notice it when he crossed the finish line. He rushed over to Shoto, who was just trying to get up with some help from the much taller teen. Luckily it seemed that Todoroki received only some minor scrapes and bruises here and there. Shoto ha, what happened H ha, are you okay? Shinzo asked in between gasps for air. I'm fine. The teen answered calmly. Dot 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 how did we do? I don't ha no, I'll go check, announced in a sound loudly, which caught the two boys completely off guard. But just as he was about to go talk to the voice hero, they were all approached by two very official looking men. Young man, could you come with us for a moment? One of them asked whilst looking directly at Shoto. The teen shared a confused look with the two standing around him and then followed their lead as they led him away. Twenty minutes later the boy returned, this time alone with some bad news. He was disqualified. They explained to him that when he was drifting across the track, his foot left the borders by a couple of inches. There was no denying it. Son of the number two hero left the recommendations exam a loser. Later that night, Shoto was pretty tired from the loud dressing down he received from his father. But he didn't let it show on his face and so he laid tiredly in bed waiting for sleep to overtake him. Luckily, he was still able to register for the regular entrance exam. But what a pain it was to go through all that bureaucracy again. His friends were all saddened by the news. But there was nothing they could do except for Shinzo who seemed almost angry when he received the update. But just as he was about to fall asleep, his phone rang. He groggily picked the screaming device up only to realize it was Hitoshi calling him. Hi, do you know what time it is? He asked tiredly. However, the answer he received surprised him. Why did you do it? Shinzo asked angrily. What do you mean? Responded Shoto calmly which only seemed to anger the other boy more. I have known you for nine years and I have never seen you slip on ice. So why did you do it? He asked again, even though he probably already knew the answer. Hitoshi listen, 
It was an accident, and everyone makes mistakes, I'm going to sleep, good night. Shoto said as he ended the call and after a few moments slipped into a dreamless slumber with only one thought on his tired mind. It was that obvious, huh? The results were announced the next day and by afternoon both Hitoshi and Momo received an email, which informed them that they were accepted based on their results. While the black-haired lady was ready to celebrate, her insomniac friend felt conflicting emotions about the whole thing. Did he really deserve it? During the last two weeks none of the boys skipped a day in their training, but the time passed as wind through an open window and before they even knew it, the exam day came. Good luck, Big BVO. Mayumi shouted as she hugged his leg. Her fingers quickly extended and wrapped around his pants like a vine. Do you have everything? You packed your invite and other paperwork, right? Aren't you hungry? I can pack you a few snacks if you want. Inko asked worriedly, while she was futilely trying to fix his wild hair. Mom, it's fine don't worry. Izuku proclaimed with a smile as he gently pried her hands from his head before enveloping his mother in an embrace to calm her down. However, this only caused his mother to burst into tears and exclaim something about her baby being all grown up and of course when his sister noticed this, she also started crying. It was times like this, when he wished All Might was at home, but for the past nine months he saw the man rarely and when he did, the number one hero looked extremely tired and headed straight to bed. He wasn't the only one to notice this either. The media also began documenting weird changes in his behavior. Tashinori was seen on multiple times reading books while he was flying over the city, visiting public schools and once he was spotted on campus by some students of University of Tokyo. And every time he tried asking the tall man about this change of behavior, he was met with the same answer. It's a surprise. And so, he stopped caring about his father's antics and instead concentrated on his own and Hitoshi's training. After he finally successfully escaped his crying family members and said his goodbye, he got on the first bus heading for the station closest to UA. He was extremely jumpy when he finally made it close to the testing facility. And so, with an unsure smile and jittery legs he took first few steps to his destiny. The written exam was held in a series of small classrooms. Math, physics, law and English were the main subjects that appeared in the questions that arose from these subjects were often designed to challenge not only their knowledge but also their logical thinking. They were hard but the green-haired boy was prepared for them. Time passed quickly and after two hours the exams were finally over and everyone was either relaxed or freaking out and trying to check whether they answered correctly. This atmosphere didn't however last very long because the speakers mounted on the walls came to life and cheerful. Dear Hero Course Candidates, This is the principal speaking. I know that students are often demoralized by our exams, but this year I have good news for all of you. I am happy to announce that due to a new addition to our faculty, we will be able to accept two more students into the Hero Course. Let this news fuel your ambitions and go beyond plus ultra. Once they heard this news even the most nervous students were able to relax at least a little. Now please enter the auditorium, where you will be briefed about the second part of your exam. The principal finished and every student rushed to the large room filled with hundreds of chairs. Once everyone found their seats, the lights over them turned off and those over the podium in the front turned on, which revealed the voice hero standing there with a bright smile. What's up you a candidates? Thanks for tuning in to me, your school DJ. Come on and let me hear ya. Present Mike shouted and then shivered a bit when he received no answer from the crowd in front of him. Keeping it mellow? Huh. No problem. Now this is normally where I would explain how this part of the exam is gonna go, but this year you will get a different announcer. I hope you are as excited as I am. Now please help me to welcome our newest UF faculty member. And with that the room turned pitch black again, until one single spotlight lit up as the stage filled with fog. Ha ha, have no fear students, because I am here to instruct you about how to beat this treacherous exam. They couldn't believe their own eyes, when they saw the number one hero walk on the stage, dressed in his iconic costume. Cheers erupted wildly as every single candidate including Izuku thought the same thing. Is this real? Present Mike was meanwhile standing in the backstage pouting like a child and enviously questioning why this never happens to him. Tashinori spent the next 10 minutes explaining the rules of the practical test and what the students should expect. The students clung to his every word. Somehow, he was even able to motivate them through his demeanor and when by the end he yelled the school motto there was not a soul in the auditorium who didn't respond. Izuku knew that he needed to ask All Might about everything that happened today, but right now he had a more important thing to care about, because after a very short bus ride they arrived to the gate leading to a city replica. He didn't see Shoto or Tenya anywhere, but he quickly concluded that they probably just ended up in other groups. Suddenly the gate opened and when heard the word go. From the voice hero, his mind cleared and he rushed through the gate at superhuman speed. Izuku was moving quickly from street to street, but there weren't any robots to fight. He soon realized that he was running like a headless chicken. He needed a better plan and so he took a massive leap to a roof of one of the highest buildings nearby to get a better look at the battlefield. He saw it, 
Just three streets away from his position a large group of the artificial enemies was heading his way. The robots almost seemed surprised when he landed in front of them, just as they made a turn, but they attacked without hesitation. It was a massacre of oil and metal. Izuku pierced the hull of the closest three-pointer grabbed whatever it had inside its shell and pulled out a handful of wires and other circuitry. The effect was immediate the green monster keeled over, but before it could hit the ground, he picked the brute up by one of its legs and hurled it at a pair of one-pointers standing nearby. They didn't have a chance to dodge in time and all three metallic beasts were quickly enveloped in fire and smoke before his enemies could react. One of Izuku's arms transformed into a bone blade which he then used to cleave right through five other robots like a red-hot knife through butter. One of the bots tried to charge him but the green-haired boy simply jumped, did a straddle vault over the monster's head and stabbed the three-pointer standing behind it. Other students seemed to also have little trouble dispatching these artificial villains, mostly due to the fact that although they seemed extremely threatening at the first glance, they were also very easy to destroy. This fact didn't go unnoticed by the UA staff and so the phase 2 of the test was initiated 5 minutes after the test began. Elsewhere, Shoto just impaled four two-pointers with ice spikes in one move, when suddenly the ground began to shake violently before a loud crash could be heard. When he turned to look at the source of this sound, he was met with a colossal being. This thing had to be at least 50 meters tall but probably bigger and even Shoto felt a certain hesitation when face to face with such a giant. Yet the team was able to steal his nerves. He saw the other candidates running away from this mechanic monstrosity. He was pretty sure he even saw it a pass by. This thing's only purpose here is to slow us down. The boy was ready to do the same as the other students. After all there was no point to fighting this Goliath, but then he noticed it. Maybe 10 meters from the giant robot. There was a girl laying on the ground, her legs trapped under some heavy-looking debris from one of the buildings and the massive thing was moving towards her. No one else seemed to notice this, since everyone just ran past her without a second glance and Todoroki knew that he needed to do something. Normally this wouldn't be a problem. He would simply turn such beast into a glacier, but he couldn't do that, because that amount of ice would hit the girl too. I need to get closer. And so, he took a running start, created an ice path for himself which led to a ramp and sent himself flying right at the giant. The massive beast tried to swat the scarred boy like a fly, but it was way too slow which allowed Shoto to safely land on its shoulder and once there he slapped his right hand to the giant's head and watched as the ice quickly spread out and encompassed the robot. With the robot immobilized, he was able to create an ice slide down and got on to check whether that girl was okay. But the moment he got onto it, the metal body shifted ever so slightly. The ice under him cracked and before he could do anything, he was falling down with the entire ice structure. Elsewhere, Izuku was facing a similar opponent. Just after he dealt with the last robot from the group, he encountered the Leviathan which appeared out of nowhere and seemed dead set on squishing him. The boy however simply took a deep breath gathered the power from one for all and with a fierce war cry delivered a devastating flying uppercut to his opponent. The blow was so strong that it not only destroyed his automatic adversary, but it also tore the robot's head clean off from its body and sent it soaring. The observing judges and teachers watched in awe as the head quickly spun in the air, before landing with an earth-shattering crash outside the city replica. Well most of them, one very tall blonde one was probably beaming proudly. When it happened, this was probably the first time he tested the full extent of his quirk and it was exciting on so many levels to see that those nine years of increasingly difficult training were worth the effort. However, the teenager didn't have much time to celebrate his victory since the test wasn't over yet. He had only about 40 points under his belt and so he began searching for more targets. On the streets he encountered a few stranglers here and there and it wasn't enough, but then he struck gold. There was this weird sound somewhere in the distance ever since the battle started. These noises came irregularly, and they were always accompanied by a small change in air pressure, almost like an impossibly loud drum being hit over and over again. But as Izuku got closer to the source of the distracting noise, he realized what it truly was. A constant and never-ending chain of explosions which were being produced by one of the candidates, who was completely surrounded by robots from every direction and blasting them to kingdom come. He rust brains want more, then come and get more. The blonde teen with incredibly spiky hair shouted, while sending detonation after detonation around himself. Elsewhere, Shoto was heading down towards the sidewalk at a very uncomfortable pace. Funnily enough he had this weird mental image of his father attending his funeral and crying because he would need to find another woman with an ice quirk, since there was no way Shoto's mom would let him even remotely near herself. He would normally use his ice to redirect the force from his fall, but there was no surface on which he could generate it and his own fire lacked the same propulsion as his father's. So, there was basically only one way to survive something like this. The boy extended his legs as much as possible, aimed his feet at the fast approaching ground and readied himself to relax his joints at the right moment to disperse as much of the impact as possible. 
He was prepared for the pain, possible spine injury, wheelchair and disappointment from his father. All these thoughts crossed his mind as the ground got ever so closer. But instead, he was hit by something completely unexpected. A slap on the cheek. His descent slowed to a crawl. He lost contact with gravity until it suddenly returned when he was about a meter above the ground. Shoto landed on his chest and belly, which knocked the breath out of his lungs, but he was otherwise unhurt. The boy was able to get up after a couple of seconds, soon enough to see that girl he just attempted to save on a broken piece of a robot, vomiting. Still a bit shaken from the experience, Todoroki walked closer to check up on her. Hey, are you okay? He asked calmly when she finally stopped trying to cough up her stomach. Yeah, just a little motion sickness from all that flying. She said when her breathing returned to normal. Only two minutes left. The two of them quickly shared a look of shock, before each hurried in a different direction, trying to get as many last-minute points as possible. Meanwhile elsewhere, his assumption was correct. There was more than enough robots for the two of them. Izuku grabbed a lamp post, tore it out of the ground before using it like an oversized golf club. Broken metal bodies were sent flying in every direction. Hey watch where you're aiming, idiot. The blonde teen shouted as a piece of steel missed his head by a few inches. Sorry, Izuku answered before he picked up a robot and slammed it down on its beeping friend like it was nothing. Dumb extra, Bakugo thought as he grabbed two of the fake villains and blasted them into oblivion. He already had at least 60 points when this green-haired idiot showed up and started stealing his kills. To say that he was mad would be an understatement, but he couldn't do anything about it. Revenge would have to wait, since he didn't want to end up getting expelled for attacking another student. But something about this extra also seemed incredibly familiar, he just couldn't put his finger on it. His train of thoughts was however soon derailed as he heard a metallic clang behind him. Anger gripped his heart when he realized what that sound was. Oh shit, not now. But it was already too late. The teen fell on his side as he lost his balance. His hands quickly clutched his leg and his finger swiftly focused on making the limb work properly again. You piece of crap. I oiled you this morning. Izuku saw him lying there on the ground and quickly forced his way past a three-pointer to see what just happened. And what he saw, shocked him. The blonde-haired teen had his pant leg rolled up dot 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 but his left ankle and foot were gone, replaced by a complex mechanical prosthetic. Hey, stop staring you scum or I'll, I'll kill you. The blonde teen yelled furiously as he snapped the prosthetic back into place, which brought the taller boy out of his shock, soon enough to notice that at least six of those heavy hulking hazards were headed their way. Izuku protectively stepped in front of Bakugu as he was getting up from the ground and smashed the first robot's head off before kicking the second one through a nearby brick wall. He soon understood his mistake however, there were not six of them but seven, and the seventh artificial adversary managed to get into his blind spot. Before he could react, there was a huge hard green arm on a collision course with his face. This is gonna hurt tomorrow, he thought and mentally prepared himself for the painful sensation which awaited him. But it never came. Instead there was a blinding light and a loud sound as another gigantic explosion sent all the robots straight to hell. Izuku then noticed the other teen back on his feet with his twitching arm outstretched and smoking. Time's up. Present Mike yelled and the sirens in the town turned on, giving everyone a signal that the exam was officially over. Thank you. Izuku tried to say but the shorter teen grabbed his jumpsuit and pulled him closer. You didn't see anything. Got that. Katsuki said angrily as his other hand created a few ominous sparks. And then it clicked. That angry look. That wild spiky hair. Those miniature explosions. Is that really you, Kaken? Izuku asked with wide eyes. As he heard his childhood nickname, Katsuki's face also adopted the look of recognition. Deku, 